Chapter 11 Drua, Moon of Almania In the silvery light of dawn, Ben stood under a sidewalk cafe awning beside a nearly deserted city street and stared up at the soaring crossroots business habitat. It was unlovely in the extreme, a greenish column extending 800 meters up into the sky, with decorative yellow-white structures like planetary rings situated every five floors. At least Ben hoped they were decorative. What their function might be otherwise was beyond him. Could they slide up and down the building exterior like massive open-air turbolifts? The data card Siha had given him included a data file on Drua including a mention that the Crossroots building was one of the system's few acknowledgments that there was life outside Almania. Trang Robotics, one of the system's largest industries, traded a tremendous number of computer systems and droids to the Alliance, the CHIS, and other large collectives of planets and cultures. But the locals by and large ignored the fact that anything existed beyond their star system. The occasional firm like Crossroots seemed to exist principally to rub such unwelcome news into the faces of the Almanians. The building housed the local offices of hundreds of off-world firms as they tried, usually successfully, to arrange for advantageous purchase deals from local technological firms or attempted, usually unsuccessfully, to market their own goods in this system. At this early hour, there was already a stream of workers entering the ground-level doors of the Crossroots building. Most looked to Ben as though they were off-worlders like himself. At some point he would have to join them, go up to the 215th floor, find and break into the display case, replace the real amulet there with the fake he carried in his pocket, and get out undetected. No, that was too much, he decided. For once it was his mother's voice, and not Jason's, that whispered in his ear. The first step in any intelligence operation, she had told him more than once, is gathering information. You gather enough information to make your plan. If you're planning without information, you're planning for failure. But that's not how the Jedi do things, Bennett protested. They just go there and solve the problem. She'd given him a crafty smile. Which is why they're famous, right? Right! Well, when intelligence operatives do their jobs correctly, they never become famous, because no one ever learns they've been there. And sometimes, that's what solving the problem means. Ben hadn't liked the answer then, because it seemed to preclude igniting lightsabers, bouncing off walls, and stuffing the smiles of bad people straight down their mouths. But now he could see that the intelligence way had merit from time to time. Jason did things that couldn't always appear on news holocausts. Jason's duties seemed to be about half intelligence these days. Suddenly, in Ben's estimation, Mara got a lot smarter. So he'd do an information-gathering run, and then decide when he knew more whether to continue straight into the actual mission, or back off and return at a later time. The wall behind him slid up, revealing the café's interior. Warm air smelling of fresh-baked goods rolled across Ben, and he abruptly realized that he was hungry. The proprietor, a tall man with the build and gut of a Gamorrean, stepped out among his tables looked up and down at the sidewalk foot traffic, and glanced at Ben. "'Here to eat, son?' To Ben's ears his quaint accent made it sound like, "'Here to eat, son?' Ben nodded. The man tapped a tabletop, motioning for Ben to sit there. The tabletop lit up, four points on it revealing themselves to be displays showing the establishment's morning menu. Ben sat and looked it over while also watching the front of his target building, noticing the way many people heading toward the building instead veered toward the café. Calf, please, Ben said, and cruffy pot pie. Tap it out, son, and put in your cred card. No mistakes that way. The proprietor tapped his ear, as if suggesting he were hard of hearing. You sound Coruscanti. 
Ben entered his order and slid his credit card into the slot at the table center. I am. Mostly. Two kinds of Coruscanti there are. Those that are happy for big open spaces, and those who can't stand not being surrounded by close walls and tight streets. I suppose so. The table surface went ding, and the word declined in red was superimposed over the menu. Below it, more text read, Account not found. Please insert another credit card. Hey, Ben said, your table is broken. The proprietor moved over to look. He pointed at a symbol at the menu's lower left corner, an animation of tiny blaster bolts crisscrossing, right to left and left to right. No, Holocom Data Link's live. That means it's checking all the way back to wherever your account's supposed to be. And there's no account to find. Got another credit card? Or coin? Ben felt in his pocket. There was one cred coin there. His last. He'd planned to get local coins through his cred card. He shook his head. The proprietor gave him a sympathetic look. Well, go ask your mother or father for more. The hunger Ben was feeling was graduating from mild to sharp and painful. Maybe, he said, you could let me have my breakfast, and I'd get Dad to pay you back later today. To his suggestion, he added a sizable push through the force. The proprietor laughed. I could, but after a year of doing that, I'd be out of business. Off with you, son. Ben sighed and left the table. He really was hungry now, and perhaps, he reflected, the hunger had kept him from concentrating and being able to affect the man. Or maybe Ben was just too weak because, like his father said, he hadn't had sufficient Jedi training. Or maybe the proprietor was too strong-willed. It didn't matter. Ben resisted the urge to stomp his frustrations away as he left the café. And now his plans needed further revision. Before reconnaissance, he needed food. And he needed to find out what had become of the special account that was supposed to be available to him for this mission. Banking kiosks turned out to be no help. Twice he inserted his credit card in their slots and tried to access his account. But all he received was a cryptic, Account Not Found screen. He tried to send a message to the establishment, but even a tiny data query would cost money if sent over a holocom connection and he had no money to draw on. Well, that had to change. He had to, as his mother had put it so many times, acquire resources. And in this situation, that meant... stealing. He hesitated over that. Stealing was wrong. Sure, everybody in his family had hijacked ships at one time or another, but those were always emergencies. Nobody stole for breakfast credits... But this wasn't just breakfast credits. He was on a mission, one he was proud to have been assigned, one that was important and might save the lives of Jedi and guards. Didn't that make it an emergency? He decided it did. He drifted across the street to stand near the doors into the Crossroots building. Perhaps someone would flash a cred card. Ben would see where he pocketed it, and he could follow the owner. And what? He didn't have his mother's skills. He couldn't pick someone's pocket clean without that person feeling it. He could follow his target into a lonely corridor or alley, hit him over the head. But Ben's already upset stomach rebelled at that notion. Suddenly he was a mugger, injuring or possibly killing someone in an effort to obtain pocket credits. He shook his head. Hitting someone over the head for breakfast credits would be a mistake— and he couldn't afford to make a mistake right now. The answer came to him a moment later. A public conveyance airspeeder, striped red and yellow to make it even more conspicuous than the glow-dot marquee reading for hire on the hood, pulled to a landing in front of the building, and its driver hopped out to open a front-end cargo compartment and offload luggage. The passenger exited and waited on the walkway a small portfolio of black simulated Nerf leather open in his hand. 
and tucked into many of the numerous little pockets of that portfolio, Ben saw, were cred cards. Some were banking institution cred cards, the sort that required validation from the institution to access funds, but others were stamped to indicate that they carried their own value in their memory. Ben knew what he could do. He drifted closer. When the driver was finished and three pieces of luggage rested on the walkway, the passenger handed him one of the institutional cards. At that moment, Ben flicked a finger and exerted himself through the force. One of the other cards, the lesser ones, leapt free of the portfolio and fluttered to the street. Ben edged closer and pinned the card to the ground with his mental exertion. A moment later, the driver handed the other card back to the passenger, entered the driver's compartment, and accelerated away. The passenger pocketed his portfolio, clumsily picked up the luggage, and moved on into the crossroots building. Ben moved over beside the street knelt as if to fiddle with his boot, and picked up the card. And that was it. He was a thief, but he'd only taken a little bit of what the man possessed, and had hurt no one. He'd made the wrong as small as he possibly could. Half an hour later, well fed on calf and cruffy pot pie, which turned out to be savory fowl meat, vegetables, and gravy in a thick pastry shell, he felt ready to put his troubles behind him, and get the mission underway. A few minutes with his data pad, communicating with a public data terminal, gave him some of the information he needed. Tendrondo Arms leased the 212th through 215th floors. That suggested to Ben that the floor he wanted, 215, was where the most important employees had their offices. His mother had told him on numerous occasions that one way people liked to feel important was by sitting on top of their subordinates, and the practical way to do this was to have their offices on upper floors. Since the building had its decorative planetary rings every five stories, starting with the sixth story, then 215 had to be just beneath one of those rings. Ben searched the building directory and found that Lister Innovations leased the next three floors, 216 through 218. Lister Innovation's public records indicated that the firm employed quality specialists and idea generators who would visit other companies and tell them how to do their jobs better. Ben frowned over that, dubious, but decided that descending from 216 might be the easiest way to get on to 215 unobserved. He occupied himself for another hour researching Tendrondo Arms' local office and Lister Innovation's, then spent the rest of the morning and some of the afternoon buying things. Food and bottled liquids that would not rapidly deteriorate, twenty meters of thin, pliant, strong cable, basic mechanical tools, a box of sweets, a length of red ribbon, and a large backpack. The last of the credits on the card he'd stolen went to buying himself a hot midday meal. As the workday grew late, and workers began streaming out of the Crossroots building in anticipation of shift change, Ben entered the building, backpack on his shoulders, and ribbon-wrapped box of sweets in his hands, and took the turbo lift up to 216. The doors opened into a jungle. Ben stared at healthy trees growing up out of dark, moist-looking soil, smelled the warm, heavy air of a tropical rainforest, saw a distant solar light through the trees that was a whiter hue than Almania's sun. Somewhere in the distance, water splashed. There was no sound of industry, of harassed workers, of overtaxed terminals. He stepped out onto the jungle floor, and the turbolift doors closed behind him. He turned to look at them and saw only a sheer rock face. It was a perfect illusion. When he tried to examine it through the force, he could sense very little. The trees did not resonate with life. He could detect no movement of insects through the air or underneath the soil. He grinned toward the trees. It's all mechanical, he told himself. So it is. The voice, male, came from only a few meters ahead. Follow the path, please. The path, 
the ground and leaves underfoot convincingly soft and resilient, led forward, then curved right, revealing a clearing that should have been visible from the turbo lift, but was not. The right half of the clearing was dominated by a stone-lined pool, seemingly natural, into which water from an adjacent waterfall splashed. Next to it was a desk apparently made of black stone. As it came into view, the man who sat behind it, young and pale-skinned, lowered his lizard-skin boots from the desktop and sat forward in a more normal pose. His jumpsuit, though apparently cloth, had the same color and texture as his boots. "'Welcome to Lister Innovations,' he said. "'Can I help you?' "'What is all this?' Ben asked, gesturing around. "'Corporate culture.' The man offered Ben a big, practiced smile to go with his big, practiced words. "'One of the things we do is show companies how to establish and maintain their own cultural identities,' through environmental design. Here in our receiving area, the floor, walls, and decorative pillars are made of or coated with our patented chameleon cover material, which allows the ultimate in decorative versatility. With just a few words, I can establish a new tone, a new work environment. For instance, decor, purity. He'd hardly finished the second word when a change rippled through the chamber. Trees straightened, becoming vertical, absolutely symmetrical, their branches folding up into their sides. The floor flattened into a perfect plane, and Ben, balancing, could feel it harden under his feet. Most objects faded to white smoothness, the trees becoming featureless and gleaming. Even the man's clothes transformed from their green scale texture to pure white. His desk became silver and the rim of stones around the pool became a silvery seating bench. Now Ben could see the true dimensions of the room. For a reception area, it was large, about twenty meters by twenty, but it no longer seemed to stretch forever in every direction. Silvery panels on the walls, doors, he supposed, showed him where the boundaries were. The man was watching him closely, and Ben did not need to tap into the force— to feel that he wanted Ben to be impressed. He lives for praise, Ben thought, and Jason says that when you give people what they want, they can be more cooperative. Wow, Ben said. I mean, wow. Wow, indeed. The man smiled, apparently satisfied. So, are you looking for someone in particular? Oh, yeah, Ben pretended to consult his datapad. I have something for, um, Gilthor Breen. I'm Gilthor Breen. I know that, Ben thought. Your face and your name are on the company's public page, and a whole long list of your likes and dislikes. Then this is for you. He put the beribboned box on the desktop. Gilthor looked closely at Ben then subjected the box to the same scrutiny. He pulled the ribbon end to untie the bow, then opened the box and gave a brief, uncertain smile when he saw the variety of sweets within. Ah, uh, is there a note? Ben checked his datapad again. No note. She just left a short message. Two days. Two days? She? Who's she? What's her name? Ben shrugged. She didn't leave one, but she was very short, with long black hair and black eyes. And cute, really cute. This was a description of Alinea Caver, a young holodrama actress currently in vogue. She was from the world of Balmora, like Gilthor himself, and she was his favorite actress. Three facts that Ben had found on Gilthor's personal page. Ben wasn't going to try to persuade Gilthor that his admirer was Vare herself. It just seemed reasonable that if Gilthor admired Vare, he'd also be interested in a woman who looked like her. Apparently, he'd guessed correctly. Gilthor practically began to vibrate in his chair. Two days, he said. Until what? Maybe she'll be in touch again. That's it. 
abruptly realizing that Ben was still present, he dug into a pocket and drew out a cred coin. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, can I use your refresher? Of course, of course. Decor, refresher. A melodious droid voice to Ben's left said, Here I am. And when Ben glanced toward it, he saw that one of the silver panels was now cycling between silver and black. Ben smiled and trotted that way. He spent little time in the refresher, just long enough to determine that its jet-black tiled floor and blue-tiled walls seemed content to stay in their respective colors, and that there were exterior windows on one wall. That's what he needed to know. Moments later, he trotted out to the silvery turbolift access and waved goodbye to Gilthor. The man gave him a distracted nod and spoke a couple of words Ben couldn't hear. The lift doors opened. Now was the moment of truth. Ben took half a step forward, but did not quite enter the turbo lift. He concentrated on Gilthor and imagined, in some detail and with great conviction, himself getting aboard. As the doors closed, he tried to project the image of the doors closing with him on the other side. I got on the turbo lift, he thought. Think about the girl. Gilthor leaned back in his chair and put his feet up again. He seemed to be whistling. Slowly, quietly, Ben moved at a crouch back toward the refresher. I got on. I went away. I'm gone. By the time he reached the refresher door again, he was sweating through his garments. But Gilthor never looked his way. Ben set himself up in one of the stalls, hand-lettering a sign that read, In need of repair. Maintenance has been summoned. Repairs scheduled for tomorrow. This he placed on the front of the stall, and he kept his force senses and more ordinary senses sharp, straining to hear or feel anyone who might approach this refresher chamber. But no one did, and he could feel Gilthor outside, seated at his desk. He could also feel a steady stream of life moving up and down the turbo lift, mostly down as the offices were depopulated by the late hour. But no one came to this refresher before Ben was done. With his tools, Ben unscrewed one viewport panel from the wall and carried all his equipment through it to rest on the planetary ring structure beyond. Twilight was gathering outside, and from here Ben could see all the lights of the city the majority of them pale blue, pale green, or white, a striking difference from the nighttime skies of Coruscant in all their spectral beauty. The decorative ring turned out to be made of plasteel, mounted sturdily to the building exterior. It shifted not at all under the occasional breeze. A gap of about ten centimeters separated it from the building edge, and through the gap Ben could see the regularly spaced mounting struts that held the ring to the building exterior. Though in the growing darkness Ben didn't think he could be seen, he kept his movements to a minimum as he repositioned the transparasteel panel he'd removed and carefully dogged it back into place. Then he knotted the cable he'd brought at one-meter intervals. He tied it at about the middle around one of the support struts visible through the gap. He threaded one half down through the gap tossing the other over the edge. Carefully, he lowered himself over the edge and climbed down the cable. This put him directly opposite one of the viewports of the Tendrondo Arms offices. It was only dimly lit, and hanging there, Ben could see it was furnished mostly with sturdy-looking stand-up lockers as tall as a human man. Weapons lockers, he guessed, given that Tendrondo was an arms manufacturing firm, and wondered if he should help himself to a weapon or two. But he shook his head. Jedi weren't supposed to need anything but their lightsabers. Except when they piloted Warcraft, of course. He descended a few more meters on his cable, bringing him down opposite the 214th floor, and began shifting his weight, causing him to swing toward the building wall and the other half of the cable dangling there. After a few moments... His swings brought him close enough to that cable to grab it. 
he let go of the first one, leaving him dangling next to the building wall, and climbed back up to 215. Leaning in close to the viewport, he could see the mechanical control that opened the viewport from within. It seemed from this angle to be a simple hand crank, but its handle was now folded against its shaft, and the control itself was snugly fitted within a small transparisteel cylinder, with a mechanical lock holding the cylinder to the apparatus. Ben studied it for a few moments and decided he understood its workings. With the handle up against the shaft and the smooth transparisteel cylinder in the way, an ordinary person's grip strength could probably not develop the torque necessary to open the window. He half closed his eyes and concentrated on the apparatus. He reached out to it through the force, gripping it as he'd grip his lightsaber hilt to yank it to him, and twisted. It didn't budge. He tried the other direction. Now it did move, a few degrees of arc. He frowned, concentrating harder, and the crank began to rotate very slowly. It was hard work. As it moved, a tiny gap appeared at the top of the viewport, and it widened. One centimeter, two. Ben's grip slipped, and he fell. Ben grabbed frantically, wrapped one arm around the cable, felt its knots bumping their way past his elbow hard enough to leave bruises. He tightened his grip, grabbed with his free hand and the force, and arrested his fall, the impact of his stop yanking both arms to full, painful extension. He gulped for a few moments, then looked down. He'd fallen only two stories. There was still more cable beneath him. He hadn't grabbed the very end. And two stories down was the next decorative ring. Had he missed the cable altogether, he would have hit that. Possibly not even with enough force and noise to alert every security officer within a kilometer. Possibly. Half dreading what he might see, he looked into the viewport where he now found himself, expecting to peer into the alarmed faces of office workers. But instead, he saw an unoccupied chamber, a combination lounge and kitchen. He gulped in a few breaths, then climbed back up, furious at himself. His concentration on the force had been so great that he'd lost focus on his hands. He couldn't afford to do that. He'd get himself killed. When he reached the viewport again, he spent a few moments tying the cable around his waist, with a knot he could undo with just a pull, then got back to work. In a couple of minutes, the viewport was open enough to admit him. He scrambled through, pulled the release length of cable, and dropped to the floor. He was happy. He could relax for a moment, and all he had to do at this point was make a covert search of the offices, find the display case, swap the amulet, and make his way to the ground again. Easy. Ben looked at the display case, and his heart sank. It hadn't taken long to find. The Tendrondo offices all seemed to have been emptied by the hour, so there were no people to dodge. The display case was not in any of the individual executives' offices, but in the central chamber, dominated by a big desk and a receptionist protocol droid whose optics were unlit, indicating that it was in sleep mode. The chamber itself contained a dozen or so displays, chiefly statuettes and plaques commemorating unusually advantageous business deals made on Drua. Some of the items were unusual presents given to the local office, such as a set of tiny acrobat droids, each no taller than Ben's hand was wide, even now doing tumbling routines on their shelf of the display case. But the transparisteel top had been carefully removed from the display case, and the amulet of Kalara was gone. The red velvet pillow it had rested on was still there, as was the silver-on-black sign next to it. Amulet of Kalara, presented to Stonius Leem by the grateful victors of the insurrection of Iliabath but there was no amulet on the pillow itself. Instead, there was a hand-lettered piece of flimsy. It read, I will return the amulet to where it belongs. Be grateful that I spared your lives. It was signed, 
Fascus of Zeost. There was something else in the case, too. It was a trace of emotion Ben could detect through the force, a sensation of happiness, glee. The gloating of a Sith lifetime had to have infused the amulet, and a little of that emotion had been left behind in the case. Ben sat on the carpet and tried to sort out what it all meant. Someone else had stolen the amulet he meant to steal. That wasn't fair. And it had to have been done recently, within the last couple of hours. If it had been done yesterday or earlier, the local authorities would have been here to investigate already, and the case wouldn't have looked like this. It would be closed up, the piece of flimsy removed. Ben closed his eyes and tried to feel something, anything, about the theft. But he couldn't. There was no tragedy here to detect, no vast outpouring of emotion concerning the amulet. He could not see the perpetrator's face or get a sense of his spirit. And he could detect no one in these offices, meaning that the thief had already made good his escape. With only a few minutes' head start, he could be anywhere in the city, and he could have had much more than a few minutes. Ben opened his eyes and sighed. He'd failed. He'd failed Jason. And now all the Jedi were at risk. No, wait a minute. Maybe he hadn't. Not yet. Perhaps, instead of slinking home and admitting to failure, he could continue the mission, improvising. He might be able to follow this Fascus and take the amulet back from him. But where would Fascus take it? Ben took out his datapad and accessed files that he hadn't read before, those pertaining to the amulet's origin and history. The main file on the subject said that it had been fabricated on Zeost some two thousand standard years ago, and that the dark side energies invested in it kept it from corroding or showing wear. Ben frowned. Jason didn't believe in dark side energies, or the dark side of the Force per se, and so Ben didn't either. But so many of the Jedi they dealt with were so old-fashioned on that point that Jason did grudgingly employ terms like light side and dark side to communicate with them effectively. Stolen by a man from Zeost. Crafted on Zeost. Fascus was obviously going to take the amulet back to Zeost. Ben recognized the name of that planet, and it gave him a little shiver. Zeost was the homeworld of the Sith, the species that had given their name to the later order. In subsequent centuries, Sith referred to Force users of any species who followed the Order's traditions. His datapad yielded a little information on Zeost, and Ben was surprised to discover that, as galactic distances went, Zeost was not far from Almania, a few hours' ride away by shuttle. But no shuttles would be going there. Worlds noted for their inhospitable weather and ancient horrors just were not common tourist destinations. He'd have to acquire transport some other way. But what to do now? Leave the display case as he'd found it? Jason had said that his core mission was to put the amulet in his, Jason's, hands. If it were reported stolen, it might be harder to acquire. If the authorities picked up this Fascus of Zeost, it might be very hard indeed. Ben pulled his copy of the amulet from an inner pocket and laid it on the velvet pillow. He took several looks at the hollow of the real amulet on his datapad and was careful to arrange the fake and its chain on the pillow just as they appeared on the image. Then he took Fascus's note and remounted the display case top. There. Now no one would know that the real amulet had been stolen, unless they took out the fake and studied it. Maybe not even then. It was clear the local Tendrondo office had no idea what they'd had, and perhaps they'd never recorded enough information about it to tell the real one from a fake. Ben spent extra minutes covering his tracks. At the viewport by which he'd entered the offices, he used the force to untie the cable and drag it into him. 
then closed the viewport again. Now there would be no sign that any unauthorized personnel had been there. He left the offices by the front way, summoned the turbo lift, and descended to street level. Two minutes after Ben's departure, the protocol droid in the reception area came alive. Its optics lit up, and its head swiveled to look at the display case. The image its visual sensors picked up was compressed and transmitted over a specific comm frequency. Kilometers away, at the Drua spaceport, a hundred-meter-long bulk freighter rested in one of the outlying hangars. In the days it had been in port, the inoffensive-looking vessel had attracted little attention, her minimal crew carrying on a small-scale disinterested trade in droids from discontinued lines. But the squat, inelegant vessel would have attracted more interest had anyone gone aboard to examine her. Inspectors would have found that half the cargo bays had been converted to starfighter bays, and that the black and bronze starfighters were well known on the space lanes as pirate vehicles. The freighter's name of record was false. Her transponder indicated that she was the high tide, while her crew and victims knew her as the Boneyard Rendezvous. The Comboard's computer received the distant droid's message, interpreted it, and popped a text message onto the display of its captain, whose name was Bialfin Dürer. Dürer, an underfed-looking boffin with lovely bronze-colored fur, looked away from his holodrama and read aloud to the other crew members on the bridge. Red Braid in motion. Tracker activated. Confirm handoff. He sat back and sighed glad that the stopover on this overly law-abiding moon would not be protracted. Here, too, his comm officer, tail gunner, and cook, a Rhodian who spent every spare credit having every fifth scale on his body dyed from a light green to a dark blue, giving him a curiously dotted appearance, jabbered a question. Yes, answer, Dürer said. The captain and crew of the Boneyard Rendezvous acknowledge that your safe, undemanding part in this escapade is at an end, and accept handover of responsibility. Sleep untroubled, and know that parties far more interesting than you shall carry this torch evermore. Got it? Here too stared at him for a few moments. Then he typed Handover Acknowledged on his comm board and sent the message. Dürer sighed and returned his attention to the holodrama. There is no immortal spark within you. Here too nodded, admission that the captain was correct. Track the boy. I want to know where he is every minute of the day. Chapter 12 Bathawi System, Galactic Alliance Frigate, Shamanar The door into the command center slid open, and the admiral, a paunchy, middle-aged man, who nonetheless looked commanding in his white uniform, entered, flanked by two junior officer escorts. One of them called out, Admiral on the bridge! Shamanar's commander, a stocky Deveronian, leapt up from his chair and saluted. Admiral Klauskin, happy to have you aboard. Klauskin returned the salute, his gesture as crisp as his uniform. Captain Bjork, good to meet you. He shook the captain's hand and glanced around the bridge. We need to speak in private. At once. Bjork led the admiral through another door into his private office, which was decorated in shades of deep brown and tan. Rather than take his customary chair behind the desk, he stood by one of the two doors in front of it and gestured for the admiral to take the other. Klauskin sat, and, as Björk seated himself, handed the captain a data card. These aren't exactly orders, he said, but authorization for you to take my verbal orders. Shamanar has been detached from ordinary fleet activities— and assigned to the Galactic Alliance Guard on a special assignment. 
Sir, I don't understand. Shamanar's current assignment is anything but ordinary. We're coordinating all the Alliance's reconnaissance and fighting forces in the Bathawi system, and we're charged with preventing the Bothan fleets from secretly leaving the system. Our assignment is strategic. And important. It would have been if you hadn't been betrayed. That caused Bjork's spine to stiffen. Betrayed how? The G.A.G. has been assigned this mission because certain portions of the military have been compromised, Klauskin said. Not too surprising in a time of war, of course. I've spent the last several weeks on special assignment, ferreting out traitors and planning a response. Birk had heard that Klauskin had been hastily removed from his command of the task force at Corellia a while back. There had been rumors that he had experienced some sort of breakdown, but any sudden reassignment of a commander was likely to spawn such rumors. Here's the situation, Klauskin continued. Several of the officers under your command are actually in Bothan employ. On the day the Bothans decide to send their fleet into action, they're going to do whatever it takes to keep Alliance forces from discovering that fact. Until too late. But we're not going to let that happen. You'll supply me with a list of all officers under your command, and I'll indicate which ones are the traitors— We'll reorganize their duty shifts to leave each of them unobserved and unprotected at specific times, at which point we'll capture or eliminate them. Then we, by which I mean Shamanar, will take the observation zone they would have been covering. We'll plug the hole their absence leaves. Understood. But, sir, I know many of these officers very well. They're not traitors. I'm sure the ones you personally vouch for are completely loyal. When you give me the list of officers, be sure to indicate which ones you're certain of. Klauskin leaned forward to give Björk a sympathetic clap on the shoulder. I know this comes as a shock, son, but we'll get it straightened out very quietly, and it won't reflect on your service record. Thank you, sir. Drua, Moon of Almania Ben spent the better part of two days planning his trip to Zeost. In that time he performed his cred card stealing technique twice more, and was pleased to discover that it became easier, smoother, and less detectable each time. He did do some planetary database research to find out whether any shuttle carrier or excursion service made trips to Zeost. The answer was a definite, unequivocal no since Zeost did not appear in any public database. Still, its coordinates were in the files Jason had given him. Nor was there, as far as he could determine, much smuggling activity here. There was nothing to suggest that desperate ship owners, as his uncle Han had been so many years ago, lurked in every tavern, willing to take aspiring young Jedi wherever they needed to go. Well then, he'd just have to steal a vehicle. He knew that wouldn't be as simple as sneaking onto some flight line, jumping into a B-wing, and taking off. Vehicles had security codes that made stealing them difficult. Security around the spaceport was not exactly lax, but neither was it set up to deter a Jedi. The chief danger of detection he faced lay with the small security droids used all across the base. Half the height of a human, spindly, with conical head sensor packages atop a humanoid arms and legs arrangement. Scores of these droids wandered individually across the spaceport environs, sometimes hiding in the thrusters of hangared vehicles, sometimes riding on the backs of luggage delivery vehicles. Ben watched them for an hour or so through the viewport in the waiting lounge outside the secure areas, and noticed that they did not react to people wearing the bright yellow jumpsuits of spaceport personnel. That knowledge made it easier. A touch of Jedi telekinesis kept doors from closing and latching firmly behind port personnel entering secure areas. Ben wandered through, eventually finding a locker room 
and helping himself to a jumpsuit and the corresponding transponder that kept security droids from paying attention to its wearer. That gave him the freedom to walk around the port for a day. He still kept well away from most human personnel. They might ask questions about an obviously off-world teenage boy doing what looked like a thorough inventory of all craft on the base. But droids were no longer an issue. It didn't take him too long to find the craft he thought best suited to carry him to Zeost. It was an old Y-wing starfighter, carefully maintained, its hull paint unscarred. It rested beneath an environment blanket covered by a thick layer of dust. The hangar's door computer listed the owner as Hamalian Barkid of Drua, and indicated that his last flight with the Y-wing had been a half-standard year earlier. A little time on the planetary net tracked down personal data for Hamalian Barkid. He was an employee of Trang Robotics, and messages to him were now being forwarded to Kuat. Clearly, he had been assigned off-world and left his personal vehicle behind. The Y-Wing's astromech was nowhere to be seen, and its weapon systems were dismantled and missing, probably due to local ordinances about private citizens having lasers, ion cannons, and proton torpedoes. But its hyperdrive was intact, and the little glow on the control board Ben could see through the cockpit canopy made it clear that the computers were charged probably diagnostics running on a battery. And this, at last, told Ben what he needed to do to get the Y-Wing operational. In the field, when you can't do something yourself, his mother had told him once, your obvious solution is to find someone who can do it for you. He downloaded contact information for Hamalian Barkid into his datapad, then spent several more hours searching on the planetary database for more information he needed, and letters like the one he had to write. Carefully, doggedly, he extracted a fact here, a sentence there, and ended up with something that, to his eye, seemed authentic. From Hamalian Barkid, account 7543-BH, Hangar 113, to Hangar Manager, Drew a spaceport. I will be returning home tomorrow. I'd really like my Y-Wing to be ready when I get there. Please do a power-up, standard maintenance check, and astromech analysis of the computer, particularly the nav computer, and bill at your standard rate to my account. It was that last part that Ben thought would sell the spaceport managers on this task. Everyone said that people loved doing last-minute tasks at their standard rates, because last-minute standard rates were always three or four times what standard rates would be if arranged in plenty of time. Ben sent the message from the hangar door computer, which could plausibly have received and relayed the message from the real Barkit. He took his pocket holocam, the one he'd been carrying ever since his mission with Jason to Adumar, and affixed it to the rafters pointed down at the Y-Wing's security access panel, then made sure it would accept commands transmitted from his datapad. Finally, he restored the environment blanket to the top of the Y-Wing, smoothed out the dust as much as he could, and made himself a hiding hole behind some discarded plasteel crates to wait. It didn't take too long. Three hours later, the hangar door rolled open and two shapes entered, a female human mechanic in the standard yellow jumpsuit, and an R2 astromech. Ben's heart sank. He'd assumed, based on how automated things were around here, that an operation as simple as a routine vehicle check would be handled by a mechanic droid. He'd planned to wait until the droid was finished with its task and then cut its head off, preventing it from leaving with the R2. But he couldn't cut the woman's head off. Well, technically he could, he just shouldn't. Though if it came down to a question of doing that or failing in this mission, an important mission, what would he do? He frowned, struggling with the answer. The woman, thirty-ish, muscular, dark hair up under a yellow cap, swept the environment blanket off the Y-wing, sending a tremendous amount of dust into the air. She immediately began sneezing her R2 unit tweedled at her. As the airborne dust reached Ben, he felt like sneezing too. 
he held a finger under his nose and scowled at the woman. As the woman moved up to the cockpit, Ben activated the holocam. The R2 unit tweedled again, spinning the dome-like top portion of its body around, its sensors obviously searching for something. Ben crouched further, as if it would make him even more invisible. Don't be silly, Shaker, the woman said. What do you bet the owner has anti-theft sensors set up? We probably set one off. Mollified, the R2 unit tweedled again and returned its attention to its companion. In a matter of a few minutes, the woman punched her security code into the cockpit side panel, raising the canopy, and then used the hangar's magnetic winch to lift up the astromech and lower it into its berth behind the cockpit. Ben watched as she undogged side panels along the Y-Wing's fuselage and plugged her own oversized data pad into them, one by one, checking readings as she went. As the R-2 went through its own series of checks and analyses, the woman left the hangar for a few minutes. She returned behind the controls of a small fuel tanker and proceeded to refuel the starfighter. Anxiety began to grow within Ben. The woman and the astromech had to be reaching the end of their duty. Soon she would be removing the R-2 from its housing behind the cockpit. Ben needed to decide right away what he was going to do about the woman. Well, he certainly wouldn't cut off her head. But he would have to incapacitate her. When both she and the R-2 unit were looking away, Ben leapt up into the rafters, made his way to where his holocam was strapped, and retrieved it then worked his way over to a spot directly above the hangar door, and waited. When it seemed that both woman and droid had their attention fixed elsewhere, he dropped silently to the permacrete and used that momentum to roll outside the hangar. Then he walked right back in again, data pad in hand. The astromech was still behind the cockpit. The woman was now readying the refueling vehicle to be driven away. Hello. Ben said. The woman looked him over. Hello. Aren't you a little young for a port worker? Trainee. Ben made his voice sound sullen. All I'm good for is delivering messages, I guess. And I have one for you. Go ahead. The owner of the Y-Wing says his astromech went through a messy programming breakdown and is having its memory wiped, so he needs another one temporarily. He'd like to rent whichever one was used for the vehicle's computer calibration. She wiped her hands on a rag and shrugged. So why are you telling me? So you can leave the droid here. Oh, he's getting here that soon? Ben nodded. She looked back over her shoulder at the droid. Looks like you get to go tootling around the solar system for the rest of the day, Shaker. Lucky rotter. She tossed the rag aside and returned her attention to Ben. Got the authorization code for that? She retrieved her data pad from the refueling tanker's front seat and held it toward him. Right here. Prepare to receive. Then Ben scowled at his data pad. Stang! My screen light's gone out. We have to do it in the sunlight. With a sigh, whether for the reliance of others on inferior devices, or for the inconvenience of having to walk ten paces Ben didn't know, the woman headed toward Ben and the door out. He led the way and turned left past the door, stopping when they were just out of sight of the R2 unit. In the second he had available before the woman reached him, he took a look around. The closest person he could see, a jumpsuited worker, was at another hangar more than fifty meters away. That was good. All right, the woman said. Transmit. Ben pressed a button on his data pad, though he'd switched the device off. Transmitted. Anything I need to do to prep the droid? Just take the restraining bolt off, and I'll do that. Hey, I didn't get the code. Scowling with pretended annoyance, Ben pressed the button again. How about now? No. He stepped closer and was now within arm's reach of her. One more time, he said, 
and drove his fist into her solar plexus. Her eyes got big. All the air went out of her in a painful-sounding, Oosh! and she involuntarily bent forward. This time he struck upward, an open palm blow that caught her on the chin. He felt her jaw break under the impact. She went down as limp as a cloth bag full of bantha fodder, her data pad clattering against the duracrete beside her. He felt bad, even nauseated, for a brief moment. Then elation replaced that feeling. There, he told himself. Not too much damage. Jason would have forgiven me if I'd killed you, and I didn't even do that. Moving quickly, he hoisted her up to a sitting position, then drew her up and onto his shoulders, a basic rescuer's carry that all Jedi apprentices were taught. He carried her around to the side of the building, into the narrow alley between two hangars, and laid her down there. Then he went back to the front of the hangar, retrieved the woman's data pad, and got behind the controls of the refueling tanker. In the few moments it took him to familiarize himself with the controls, the droid tweedled at him. Everything's set up, Ben assured the R2 unit. She's doing the last details and asked me to move this. He powered up the vehicle, then carefully backed out of the hangar and immediately parked the tanker where it would block any line of sight on the unconscious woman. He had a stroke of luck then. The woman had apparently opened her data pad to the job file for the task of maintaining the Y-Wing. All the data he needed, including full maintenance specifications for the Y-Wing and data on the R2 unit, was there. So he was whistling when he returned to the hangar. He used the woman's own tools to remove the restraining bolt from the droid. I'm supposed to take the Y-Wing out on a test flight, he told the R2. That way, if it blows up, the owner isn't inconvenienced. The droid whistled and chirped at him, its musical tones suggesting that it was indifferent to the change in plans, but more than happy to go. Good. Let me get my backpack, and we can start the pre-flight checklist. Corellian System Exclusion Zone Errant Venture In the first few days after Errant Venture was authorized to ply its trade for Alliance military personnel in the Corellian system, its casinos and other entertainments did great business. Booster Tarek, the grand old man of the operation, though he was theoretically retired from day-to-day -day duties, was often seen in the casinos, flitting around in his hover chair, greeting patrons and encouraging workers, his eyes alight in the way that only commerce could make them. His new unpaid workers didn't hurt things either. Iella and Miri worked as dealers. Iella wore enough makeup to disguise her true identity. Miri did not need that precaution, but did change her hair color with spray-on hues and combinations each day, just because it was her custom. Two attractive women a generation apart skillful conversationalists and card handlers, they drew good-sized crowds at their tables each day, and their tips were grand enough to make Miri wonder whether intelligence was the career she wanted for herself after all. Lando and Han worked the casinos too, but not as dealers. Each day they set up in different casinos at sabac tables. Lando maintained his Beskat Ofterman identity, and Han continued to put on his yellow-skinned, thin mustache makeup each morning. At the end of each day, they compared their winnings. After the first week, Lando was slightly ahead. Mirax spent most of her time with her father. During years of retirement on Corellia, she had cheerfully ignored her father's efforts to bring her to the errant venture to learn and perhaps take over its operations. Now her homeworld was for the time hostile to her and she had nothing to do more suited to her talents, so she threw herself into these new studies with typical Mirax obsessiveness, delighting her father. Leia, Wedge, and Corin concentrated on the data interpretation side of things, seldom venturing into the ship's public areas. Each such trip, however short, would cause them to have to don disguises. They confined themselves to an auxiliary computer cabin provided by Booster, and began meticulously assembling and analyzing the data the others provided them. Data came from the drunk patrons and the sober ones, 
from the happy ones and bitter ones, from the officers with marital problems and straying eyes, from the personnel with accumulated resentments and inadequate filters between their brains and their mouths. The most valuable data often came from patrons who, at the end of their rest and recreation leaves, were dead broke and too drunk to stand. The special circle of errant venture employees took care of them, letting them sober up in quiet little lounges, giving them enough credits for a return shuttle flight to their military units, assuming they hadn't bought round-trip fare in the first place, which often they hadn't, and even half carrying them to the shuttle docks for their outbound flights. Han, Lando, and the other data-gatherers became new best friends to an immense number of young soldiers, pilots, and technical personnel. But the information they farmed was frustratingly tenuous. One week into their operation, the data-gatherers assembled to see if there were any informational gemstones to be found. "'I say we start with you,' Lando said, pointing to Wedge. "'You look unhappiest.' and that means results. Wedge did look surly, and the look he shot at Lando did nothing to diminish that impression. Unhappy, yes, he said. Results, not really. See all is here today, gambling in the Maw Casino. See all, Wedge's eldest daughter, was a pilot with the Alliance forces, and Lando felt a rush of sympathy for Wedge. To be so close to her, yet unable to approach her, all for the silly little reason that he was technically regarded as enemy personnel. Then Wedge added, With a boy. Lando snorted. A boy? What, twelve, thirteen years old? Wedge's glare did not waver. About her age, and a pilot. There are two types of male pilots— Good men, such as the ones I never tried to break or run out of my squadrons, whom I would shoot before I ever trusted them with my daughter, and worse men, whom I would shoot if I caught them looking at my daughter. Thirty seconds in, Corin said, and we've already strayed from our topic. War, right? People are still interested in war and puppet masters? Wedge sighed and turned his glare onto the tabletop. I know this is going to sound strange, Leia said, but I haven't found any indication that this war was precipitated by outside forces. I've been reviewing news reports, historical analysis, all the data we have on hand, and it looks like the central conflict between Corellia and the G.A. was the inevitable conclusion of their respective political directions. Fewer syllables, please, Lando said. Remember, your husband is at the table. Han gave him a faintly amused, your next look, then turned his attention back to his wife. So that means no puppet master? She shook her head. It means that war itself is not the puppet master's original plan, or at least not his fault. But the manipulations we think we've detected do add up to something. We can see a cause-and-effect relationship. We just have to figure out the motive. Iella opened her data pad. Events like the Corellian ambush of the GA fleet that came in to intimidate it. The outcome? Corellia remained independent a while longer. If it hadn't, another world would probably have become the focal point of the independence movement. Bathawi or Kaminor would be likely candidates, but Corellia had something they didn't. Wedge nodded. Center Point Station, and a secret assault fleet. Correct, Iella said. Then we have Admiral Klauskin, who pretty clearly was meddled with, if we're right that these force ghost manifestations are evidence of our puppet master. The result of that interference? The situation here was worsened. The alliance was cast in a bad light. Corellia received a lot of sympathy. Speeding up the process by which other worlds considered coming in on Corellia's side, Leia said. Then, the whole thing at Toriaz Station, the death of Prime Minister Saxon, 
it caused a change in Corellian leadership, permitting Thracken Sal Solo to boost himself from Minister of War to President. And with war preparations accelerating, he had to put his secret fleet on the resources list. Her voice quiet, as though she was hesitant to speak up in this exalted company, Miri said, It also scattered the Jedi. Leia frowned. What? Miri looked uncomfortable. Well, it didn't scatter the Jedi, really. I mean, the Jedi Council on Coruscant wasn't affected. But if you look at family ties, which have made so much of a difference over the years with the Solo Skywalker extended family, one minute you were all together, and then, boom, you were scattered across the galaxy, some of you at odds. It was like a secret grenade. Leia and Han exchanged a suspicious look, and Iella regarded her daughter with interest. That's an interesting interpretation, Leia said. Her tone suggested caution, reserve. I hadn't considered that as a factor. Mary, her idea not having been shot down by the accumulated aces, began to look more comfortable. At school, we were taught the follow the principle. Follow the money, follow the lover, follow the resources. The trick is sometimes in identifying the resources. Corin had been nodding ever since the first follow the left Miri's lips. You're saying the Solo Skywalker clan is a significant resource, and that it has been eliminated. Yes. Leia wasn't able to keep a little anger out of her voice. We have not been eliminated. Not as individuals, no. Corin gave her a sympathetic look, but didn't yield. But as a family, tell me that you can send out a call, as you could have done six months ago, and focus the attention and skills of your entire family on a single problem or enemy. Tell me that. Leia thought about it, then seemed to wilt just a little. I can't. You've been taken out of the picture, as a united force. Corin gave Miri a little nod of respect. Good work, girl. Thanks. Miri seemed both pleased and uncomfortable with the praise. So maybe we assume that breaking your family into pieces that don't fit together anymore was one of the Puppet Master's major goals. Because in the long run, if recent galactic history is any evidence, that will make a big, big difference. And you've got to put that clan back together again, Lando said. Han couldn't keep the pain from his face or his voice when he said, I'm not sure it's possible. I'm not sure some of the pieces will ever fit together again. Lando's right, though. Leia's expression became set, determined. Han, we've been concentrating on the wrong things, proving our innocence, figuring out which of Durgedjan's cronies need to go down when he does. None of that is really important. Not compared with fixing things. I think we need to give up on the Corellian conspirators. At least, Wedge interrupted, until the war trials. Right. Give up on the conspirators. Relegate the puppet master to secondary importance and concentrate on solving the real problems putting the Skywalkers and Solos back into play as a united front. Sure. Why not? Han offered a crooked smile. All Luke and Mara have to do is get themselves exiled, too. And then we can cruise the spaceways as one big, happy family. But something in his eyes suggested he had left something unsaid and Lando was pretty sure he knew what it was. Except for Jason. Dozens of decks below, a small cargo craft rose into the main hangar bay of the errant venture. It wasn't a pretty vehicle. About forty meters in length from bow to stern, it had a front end, its main cargo hull, 
that was as elegant and aerodynamic as a thick nerf stake cut into a rectangle and stood up on its edge. Behind that, constituting about a third of the length of the craft, was the maneuvering shaft, a low cylinder housing the main thrusters and the servos that positioned the maneuvering fins, long wing-like surfaces that stretched laterally from the shaft. In short, it looked like the mutant offspring of a bird and a brick, re-engineered by verpines to fly backward. This example of the YV-666 line had dents, blast scars, and rust patches all over its hull, making it especially unlovely. At the forward portion of the top deck, Captain Urin Levint carefully maneuvered the awkward craft up into the hangar, then followed the glowing spherical droid above a trail of blinking lights on the hangar floor to her assigned berth. Soon as we land, she said, You'll want to get into the smuggling compartment. They'll do a basic scan from outside. We understand. Alima's voice came from a patch of shadow, impenetrable by ordinary sight, at the back of the bridge. Why do they care if there are undeclared passengers? It's all money. Levent set the craft down with only the faintest of thumps though that noise was joined by the squeal and creak of durasteel components settling. She grimaced at the noise. If they don't know about you, they can't charge you for, well, anything. Soon as I get my cabin assignment, I'll calm you where it is. Good. Why this ship, Captain? What is so special about a gigantic casino and shopping complex? It'll take too long to explain now, but remind me sometime to give you my speech about Corellian smugglers. We will. Levent didn't see the shadow fade, but the bridge seemed to brighten, and she knew Alima was gone. Three stories below, hangar workers came forward. In a moment, they'd be plugging into an exterior hull port and asking which of their many overpriced services she wished to avail herself of. Refueling, de-rusting, painting, transmission of the latest holodramas. She waved and smiled down at them, as if she didn't mind their presence. And she wished that the errant venture would be where they found the solos, so she could leave Alima Rar and her craziness behind forever. Chapter 13 Coruscant, Jedi Temple Mara leaned forward, elbows on the table on either side of the data pad retrieved from Lumia's quarters, and rested her chin in her hands. From the other side of the table, Luke looked at her. You cracked the encryption on the data card? Finally. But you don't look happy. You don't need a force bond to tell that, farm boy. Tell me. Some of it's an invoice. The sender seems to have been a bounty hunter working for Lumia, and the invoice is an itemized list of expenses. Hours worked, fuel expended, blaster shots taken. The main part, though, is a mission status and event report. Even decrypted, it's hard to puzzle out. Everything is referred to by code words, but assuming I'm putting the right names to some of these code words, the information is... interesting... Such as, confirmed that the lady's daughter succumbed to injuries inflicted by grandson 32707, Mara recited. Please inform if lady's mission changed from insertion observation to revenge. Luke frowned over that one. Lady has to be Lumia. She used to style herself the Dark Lady of the Sith after Emperor Palpatine and my father were no longer around to slap her down for presumption. I agree. And if that same time context is the basis for more than one of these code names, grandson would therefore have to be one of Darth Vader's grandsons, right? Jason or Ben? 32707, Luke said. Just a second. He pulled out his data pad, connected it remotely to the temple's computer, and went searching for a report Ben had filed weeks earlier. Here it is. 
BMX32707, an uninhabited star system near Bimiel. That's where the woman Xiao led Jason and Ben, where Jason defeated some sort of dark side force user within the asteroid under her habitat. Where Nalani Din died. Mara looked confused. Nalani was Lumia's daughter? No, Nalani's parents have files in the order database, and Nalani looks, looked, a lot like her mother. Besides, Nalani died the same day Jason and Ben arrived at the habitat. Your file there suggests that the lady's daughter lingered for a while. Luke frowned. The other woman who was there, Brisha Sio. Brisha could be an anagram for Shira B. Shira Bree? Lumia's real name. Luke nodded. I didn't make the connection at the time, because then it had been years since we'd heard anything about Lumia. A thought was growing within him, and alongside it, a worry. A big one. Let's say Lumia has a daughter. She names her Brisha, a self-tribute, and Brisha works with her. Brisha lures Jason and Ben to an ambush. She and the mysterious Sith she claims is living in her basement. Maybe he's just a dark Jedi she's hired. Maybe he's Lumia's Sith apprentice. Are going to kill Ben. An act of revenge for everything I've done to Lumia. Or maybe to capture him, train him to be a Sith. Which is just as much revenge. And twice the evil. I did a thing or two to her as well. Right. Revenge against both of us. But Nelani is there, too, and throws the odds off. The Darksider and Nelani are killed. Brisha is badly wounded. Ben gets a knock in the head and forgets what happened. And Jason presumably never figures out that Brisha was one of the bad guys. Jason and Ben leave. And weeks later, Brisha succumbs to injuries. And her mother... Mara winced. Her mother would want revenge. Against Jason. He's racking up quite a body count against daughters of dangerous opponents of ours. Luke shook his head. We don't know that Jason wounded Brisha. How could he have done so and then left the habitat without thinking of her as an enemy? Ben must have done it during one of the periods of time his memory doesn't cover, which would make Ben the target. His stomach began doing flip-flops. In addition to being a cocky teenager alone in a galaxy at war, Ben might now be the target of one of the galaxy's deadliest killers, a woman who had fought Luke to a standstill mere weeks before. Your theory spooks me, farm boy because it answers a lot of the questions we've been asking. Why Lumia would have infiltrated the Galactic Alliance Guard, to gather information about Jason or Ben and prepare for revenge if she needed to take it. Why she would have been around for as long as we've known she has been, but didn't attack you until a few weeks ago. Because that's when she received the word about her daughter dying. Her frown deepened. And what if this is the reason for all Jason's bad decisions? What if Brisha, or the Sith apprentice on that planetoid, got to him, affected him, infected him in some way? Then whatever's afflicting him might be easily curable. Mara slammed her fists down on the tabletop and turned away from Luke. Far from being pleased by that possibility, she'd been angered by it and even without the benefit of their force bond, Luke thought he knew why. Because if Jason were the victim of some Sith brainwashing technique, he wasn't responsible for his recent actions, in which case Mara couldn't forge and sharpen her emotions, her dedication to oppose and eliminate him as a former Emperor's hand should be able to.
We have to find out what happened on that asteroid, Luke said. And we have to confront Jason face to face to do that. We can't be in a position where all he has to do is press an off switch to shut us out. I agree. Mara's voice was strained. I'll make the arrangements. Before you go, a little pain crept into Mara's voice. Luke, who was Brisha's father? Luke shrugged as he rose. How would I know? Then he caught the look on her face, a combination of suspicion and an eagerness to let any answer wipe that suspicion away, and he said, No. You're sure? He offered her a reassuring grin. Mara, we were involved emotionally, but not physically. All right. The suspicion eased from her expression but through their force bond, Luke could still feel a touch of disquiet from her. As Luke hurried off to make flight arrangements to Corellia, he cursed Lumia for managing to introduce strife, however fleeting, into his life, this time without even trying. Corellian Exclusion Zone, Errant Venture the universe was not cooperating, and Alima Rar was becoming impatient with it. There was a Jedi other than herself aboard Errant Venture. She was sure of it. As she stalked the darkened passageways and shadow-filled casinos, as she wandered wrapped in robes that concealed her disfigurement enough to allow her to mingle with drunken gamblers and revelers, she would occasionally feel little pulses and eddies in the Force that were characteristic of Jedi presence. But she never spotted the Jedi. To the logic she employed in her calculations, that meant one thing. The Jedi was hiding. Hiding from her. And therefore, it was Leia. That evening, in the cabin she surreptitiously shared with Captain Levint, she spoke of these matters. You are almost free of your debt to us, she said. You have brought us to where the Solos, at least Leia, conceal themselves. But we cannot find her. Them. When we see them, then you are free. I'm in no hurry, Levint said. She sat cross-legged on the bed a small bottle of expensive pre-war Corellian whiskey trapped between her ankles. We, you and I, that is, not just me, are making a killing at the gambling tables. Did you ever think about giving up your quest, whatever it is, and turning pro? No. All right. Here's a hint, then. You're using only Jedi magic— and your royal we, instead of your brain. Ordinarily, Alima would have been offended by such a declaration. She would not necessarily have demonstrated it, except to exact a little revenge. But Levint was not trying to insult. She simply had no filter between her brain and her mouth. Whatever she thought came tumbling out, particularly when she had some alcohol in her. Tell us, then, what we are doing wrong, what we are not thinking. Levint raised a forefinger. One. What is Han Solo? Adventurer, friend to Jedi, husband, father, smuggler, general, ship captain. Those are all the branches, except smuggler. That's the trunk. Corellian smuggler. She raised two more fingers. Two. Wedge Antilles, who just vanished from Corellia. What's he? That's three. Eh? That's three fingers, not two. Levint glared down at her hand and folded one of her fingers down. Antilles. 
General, Admiral, Pilot, Husband, Father, Friend to Jedi, and when he was just starting, a Corellian smuggler. Alima looked at her suspiciously. Is this the speech about Corellian smugglers? Yes. Levent raised the third finger into place again. Three. What's Booster Tarek? Businessman, ship owner, and, we must guess, Corellian smuggler? Retired. Levent smiled. You're catching on. Also father of a daughter named Mirax Tarek. What's she? Corellian smuggler. Good. We've got the trunks all laid out. They grow from the same ground. Corellian smugglerhood. Now, where do the branches come together? Han Solo is married to Leia Organa. So there's a Jedi connection. And not just any Jedi connection, because Leia's the sister of the Grand Master. And Tilly's is married to an ex-New Republic intelligence agent, so he's got branches into Galactic Alliance intelligence. Booster's daughter is married to Corrin Horn, another Jedi, with branches into Corsac. Horn and Antilles flew together. I've been doing more research on them. And Tilly's has a daughter named for Tarek's daughter. You see how tight the branches are? Alima added it up. So the Solos are here because of all their friends, the security they represent, and money, and resources. And you're not going to find them in the Deep Core Lounge because they don't have to mingle. They're all in it together with the owner of the entire establishment. You've been wandering the public areas, while they're probably all on the bridge, drinking and laughing together. Alima felt a sudden flush of gratitude that she had not killed this woman. It was a rare emotion for her. We must begin to search other places. Yes, and right away so I can get some sleep. Bathawi System Shamanar On the records and assignment sheets, a thin screen of starfighters and armored shuttles equipped with long-range sensors guarded the rimward edge of the star system. If the fleets that were assembling, performing maneuvers and war games, and otherwise rattling their lasers deep within the system, were to head out in the direction of the outer rim, Toward, say, Camino, directly opposite the direction a fleet would most logically take if headed toward Corellia, this screen would detect it and transmit that information to Shamanar for retransmission to the second fleet. The Bothans would not be able to take the task force at Corellia by surprise. In theory. In fact, Admiral Klauskin had identified a number of this task force's pilots and officers as traitors. He'd been very careful to flag the ones whom Captain Bjork had already written up for various disciplinary reasons, and to avoid those Bjork indicated he trusted implicitly. Then Klauskin had assigned each of them to the outer rim screen. He and Bjork had positioned Shamanar at the heart of that coverage area, and had called in each of those on-duty pilots in turn, arresting them and seizing their vehicles. Now, though they were still officially on station, each of the alleged traitors was in the brig, and Shamanar floated alone, doing the work of the entire screen by herself. She was more than fit for the job, of course. She had been fitted with the best long-range sensor suites a frigate could boast. It was unfortunate that she couldn't remain at her usual station, well outside the Bathawi system on the Bathawi Corellia approach corridor. But there she was merely redundant. Here she was doing critical work. Don't worry, Klauskin told Björk. I've transmitted news of our success to Admiral Neafel. She'll be sending replacement vehicles immediately. Good to know. 
Bjork stood in the middle of the bridge and turned to look at each officer's display in turn. He was restless and would continue to be until all those replacement forces were in place. Your officers look bored. Bjork gave the admiral a surprised look. I don't think so, sir. Still, let's shake them up a bit. I spent part of yesterday putting together a simulation. In the sim, the three Bothan fleets stage a simultaneous breakout, and one heads straight for Shamanar. There's opportunity for a stand-up fight, or for picking off their weaker units. Bjork smiled at the Admiral's mistake. Just telling me that affects my tactics, Admiral. So it does. Well, put your second-in-command in charge. You and I will run things from the Auxiliary Bridge. Right. Bjork turned toward his second, a tall Gotal. Lieutenant Ciro! You have the bridge for a sim. The Admiral and I will be running it from the Auxiliary Bridge. Moments later, Klauskin and Björk walked into the Auxiliary Bridge, a small, seldom-used chamber, its walls more thickly lined with displays than any other compartment on the frigate. These displays were just now flickering into life, as were the overhead lights. The bridge doors slid shut behind the two men. All overrides default here, correct? Klauskin asked. It wouldn't be much use as an emergency bridge if they didn't, Bjork said. Oh, sorry, Admiral. I didn't mean to sound sarcastic. You really ought to watch your mouth, son, Klauskin said. From his pocket... He pulled a holdout blaster. Bjork's eyes widened, as if he thought the Admiral's gesture were a not-too-funny joke about disciplinary measures. Klauskin shot him in the chest. Bjork went down on his back, the impact making the floor panels ring. Smoke curled up from the scorched patch over his breastbone, and a little blood oozed from the burned flesh. He tried to speak, to reach for his comlink, but Klauskin sadly shook his head and fired two more times. There, one grim task out of the way. Using the codes he'd just heard Björk use to open and activate the auxiliary bridge, Klauskin ensured that the doors could not be opened again. Then he moved to the communications board. He activated a line to the main bridge and said, Lieutenant Ciro, I'm cutting all external communications. From this point on, any communications you make will actually be going to the SIM program. If you get an override message from the fleet, it will be accompanied by a red blink that indicates I'm the real thing. Understood. Yes, sir. Klauskin punched in controls that would disable all communications antennas aboard the frigate. All but one, which he reserved for use of his own comm board. He moved to the main computer and inserted a data card into its slot. The computer accepted the program and activated it. All over the ship, Every internal door or hatch controlled by a servo slid and locked open. Klauskin imagined the officers on the bridge staring in puzzlement at the doors as intership communications began buzzing with questions. The door into this bridge remained resolutely shut, of course. It wouldn't do for Klauskin to die with the others, though even if he did... His primary mission would still be successful. The main computer display came up with a text message indicating that all safety protocols concerning exterior hatches had been overridden. Klauskin nodded. 
All he had to do now was stand by. Though he did have ten seconds in which he could abort this sequence, he didn't. And when the tenth second counted down, warning lights and chime alarms began to fill the air. Klauskin switched the main display from view to view. First was the interior of the frigate's small starfighter bay, where the force field holding the atmosphere had just dissipated. Atmosphere rushed out through the great gaping hole through which starfighters normally launched or landed, and some of the starfighters in the bay rocked slightly. A lone mechanic standing too close to the main opening stumbled, forced along by the air currents fleeing into space, and was swept into the void. Her arms flailed as she drifted out toward explosive decompression and death. The next view showed personnel in the ship's mess. They stood looking around, their eyes wild as they began gulping for air. Some began running for emergency control panels and wall com boards. Others turned around and around, looking for the source of their trouble. All over the frigate it was the same. Every exterior hatch or portal was open and was pouring precious atmosphere into a vacuum that would drink until it was all gone. Only the auxiliary bridge was safe, and Klauskin could feel cool air blowing onto his neck from an overhead vent. He switched the display to look at the bridge. The holocam view from the bridge was dominated by the face of the human communications officer, he was so close to the holocam that his features were distorted. To either side of him, other bridge officers stood, shouting, clutching their throats. This wouldn't take long. And when it was done, he would be a hero of Commonor. Somehow the thought, so reassuring across the last several days, failed to lighten the heaviness he felt in his chest. He returned to the comm board and punched in a frequency, then activated it. Klauskin to Croylin. Please respond. A moment later the face of a black and tan Bothan appeared on the display. Croylin here. The eye is closed, and Shamanar is ready for a prize crew. She'll be repressurized by the time you get here. Croylin smiled. And exactly on time, Admiral. I admire your punctuality. Then his expression became one of concern. Are you all right? Yes, of course. Why? You seem to be... Crying. Klauskin reached up. His fingers found tears on his cheeks. That startled him. But it would not do for this Bothan to see him discomfited. Ah, yes. A result of the atmospheric pressure changes aboard. Of course. The smile returned. My crew will be there soon. Croylin out. Corellian Exclusion Zone Errant Venture Leia and Luke embraced for a long moment, uncaring that they were surrounded by observers. Those observers were family and friends, and though the private conference room Booster had set aside for his secret guests wasn't exactly as cozy as the vessel's more sumptuous suites, its shortcomings of comfort did not matter. Luke drew away from his sister and followed Mara's lead in shaking hands or offering embraces all around. Han, Lando, Wedge, Corin, Mirax. It's good to see you, he said. The words were simple, but they came from his heart. It startled him to feel this level of relief at seeing people in person when he already knew they were alive and well. But he supposed the heart did not always believe what the mind knew to be true. Us too, Han said, 
and it was apparent that the distance that had developed between the two men, back when it became clear that Han supported Corellian independence while Luke remained loyal to the Alliance, had finally closed. Though we're kind of surprised to see you here. We were in the neighborhood, Mara said. Not a joke. We're in the Corellian system, to see if we can pin Jason down, get a few answers from him. Ben is missing. Leia did not miss the little flash of pain visible in Mara's face, detectable through the Force. We don't think Jason knows where he is, but he has some information that might lead us to Ben. You've chosen a good time to visit, then, Wedge said. Jason is here, aboard Air Adventure. Luke gave him a dubious look. Jason? Gambling? No. Corin shook his head, clearly annoyed. He's wandering around looking things over. Maybe he's come to the same conclusion we did. But Errant Venture is a very useful tool for gathering data. Seems a very G.A.G. -G thing for him to think of. Or maybe he wants to make sure that the ship doesn't constitute a security leak that would help the Corellians. Either way, he's here. So those of us he knows are having to keep even more out of sight. No more gambling, even in disguise, until he goes away, Han added. There's something else, Leia said. Something I've been sensing through the Force for the last few days. There's a presence aboard ship. Someone or something I can't identify. But it's here. Watchful. I'll keep that in mind, Luke said. You won't be offended if Mara and I go to pin Jason with some questions in a few minutes. Leia shook her head. Just be careful. Count on it. Luke seemed to hesitate before continuing. In the meantime, there are some things we need to bring you up to date on. Such as Alima Ra and Lumia, Dark Lady of the Sith, Mara said. And we now have a little force technique developed by Master Silgal that will help us counter the way Alima meddles with memory. We'll teach you. Jason stopped a few meters from one of the tables in the Maw Casino. Like so many of the individual dens on this ship, this one was named for a particular planet or region of space and decorated accordingly. As the mall was an area where clustered black holes surrounded a hidden region, swallowing all light, the Maw Casino was dark, its walls black. Its silvery tables were edged with dim glow rods, and there was no overhead lighting. The servers and other casino personnel wore piping, jewelry, and accoutrements that glowed. The decor made the casino an intimate one a place where conversations could be nearly private, where twists could be arranged or conducted with little fear of discovery. The table Jason stopped to watch was a micro-droid wrestling betting table. Inset into the glowing tabletop were numerous displays. Several showed combat taking place in another chamber aboard ship, combat between droids no longer than ten centimeters, Droids designed and programmed by hobbyists whose chief occupation was pitting their designs against one another. Other displays showed the odds of bets being laid on the combatants. In the duel currently taking place, a droid shaped like a piranha beetle on treads exchanged fire with one shaped like a Tatooine sandcrawler. They were separated by a few meters of artificial terrain resembling the towering forests of Kashyyyk. But it wasn't the droid fight that drew Jason's attention. It was the woman facing him from the center of the long edge of the table. He knew her face, and he'd never expected to see it again. He circled the table so that it would not be between them, and stepped up next to her. Captain Urin Levint looked up from her bedding and her drink to nod at him. 
Colonel Solo. Captain Levint, how did you get here? That's a silly question, isn't it? I got here on the cargo vehicle you gave me. She lifted her drink, tilted the container toward him in salute, and took a sip. Please forgive me for not thanking you before now. The Duracrud has become a good luck charm for me. My fortunes have been improving ever since I took command of her. I've run three cargo routes, all at a tremendous profit. You haven't had any difficulty with her? Well, she's old. I spent part of your payment to me, giving her an overhaul. But nothing catastrophic. Jason stared down at her, baffled. Jedi could often tell when someone was lying, and Levint was clearly withholding information, but she didn't manifest any of the emotion that should accompany the lies he expected. If her hyperdrive had failed, she should be angry with him. She was not. If she were covering up the fact that he had ruined her financial fortunes with his actions, she should radiate resentment. She did not. Something had gone wrong with his final instructions concerning her. But he'd sort that out with his next few questions. Then he felt a slight flicker within the Force. He looked up to see Luke and Mara standing just inside the casino entrance, staring at him. He gave the captain a purely artificial smile. We'll get caught up later. Looking forward to it. You can buy me a drink. Pushing Levint from his mind, he approached Luke and Mara, offering each a civil handshake. Master Skywalker, you should have told me you were coming to Corellia. Where would you have been if we had? Mara asked. Jason blinked at the question. Aboard the Anakin Solo, probably. He did not add, and able to limit the time I would have to spend with you. Luke gave him a cheerful smile. Well, it's nice that we could find you when you have more time for socializing. Let's get a table. Order drinks. Not waiting for a reply, he turned and led the way into the ranks of small tables closer to the bar. He chose an empty one that appeared to have been recently cleaned, its glowing, glossy surface was still damp, and sat. Mara and Jason joined him. Jason had to struggle just a bit to keep annoyance from his face. This encounter was inconvenient. The server, a Bothan female with silver-gray fur, not much of it covered by her abbreviated black dress, materialized to take their drinks. Once she was gone, Luke leaned in close. Jason, this is important. We need to know exactly what happened on the asteroid near Bimiel. Jason kept his emotions under tight control and attempted to project nothing more than additional annoyance. But inwardly he felt relief, a return of confidence. Luke and Mara had obviously already found the leads Lumia's people had planted. All he had to do was keep straight the details she had sent him. It's true, I haven't had time to write a report. My guard commission came in too soon after our return to Coruscant. Was there something wrong with Ben's report? Well, it's incomplete, Mara said. It doesn't cover what happened while he was unconscious, or what happened to you while you were separated from him. Oh, of course. Jason frowned as if trying to dig up memories buried beneath tons of more recent events. Well, let's just concentrate on those two periods, then. Brescia Sio, Nalani, Ben, and I boarded a sort of rail car that took us into the asteroid's interior. A pulse of force energy yanked Ben and Nalani out of the car. After a moment, Brescia was yanked free. The car stopped in a deep cavern, and there I was attacked by a force user 
who radiated dark side orientation and wore your face, Luke. Luke nodded. At the same time, I was fighting a force projection with your appearance, an altered appearance, and Mara and Ben were fighting distorted versions of each other. That's right. Jason's mind clicked its way through the details Lumia had so recently provided as he tried to figure out the best order in which to present the information. My duel ended when the false Luke hurled some boulders at me, and I inverted into a spin with my lightsaber. We both connected. I took a rock to the head and was out for a while. But when I woke up, my opponent was in two pieces, and once I found his head several meters away, I could see his true features. A Deveronian. He had no identicard on him. His lightsaber was gone. Gone? Mara frowned. So someone came while you were unconscious and took it. Jason shrugged as if the detail was of no importance. Probably it just went flying into a cranny somewhere and I couldn't find it. It was a very low-gravity environment. You could throw a lightsaber hilt a kilometer if you tried. And Ben? Luke asked. I found him in an upper cavern, Jason said, unconscious. Brisha Sio was nearby. She'd lost an arm and had sustained a head injury and sucking chest wound, all of them lightsaber inflicted. I stabilized her. She seemed pretty sure her habitat's medical droids would be able to fix her up. She said she found a wicked-looking redhead. Her description matched Ben's evil Mara, preparing to behead Ben, and that she interfered. She was badly wounded, but drove the false Mara into retreat. Luke and Mara exchanged a glance. So, Luke said, if she was telling the truth, the timing can only work out one way. The Dark Jedi, or whatever he was, impersonated Mara and attacked Ben. He won that fight. Brisha stopped him from killing Ben, and he ran off. Then he took my face and attacked Jason, and Jason killed him. Mara shook her head. That doesn't work, though, if we assume there was some link between the two Jason-Luke fights and the two Ben-Mara fights. Because my fight with the false Ben and your fight with the false Jason were simultaneous. Suggesting that my fight with the false Luke and Ben's with the false Mara were too. Jason pretended to puzzle that one over. The only logical conclusion is that there were two enemies in those caverns, not just one. That's right. Luke returned his attention to Jason. He hesitated a moment before continuing. Jason, we have evidence that Brisha Sio was Lumia's daughter. Jason sat back and allowed a look of startlement to cross his features. I don't believe it. I'm not that easy to deceive. She'd be very good at deception, Mara said if she were trained by her mother. So, Jason pretended to think it through. So Brisha probably killed Nelani, and Brisha dueled Ben. And Ben cut her to ribbons. A little pride crept into Mara's voice with that remark. But she defeated him with some ploy and she probably did something to him, altering his memories, maybe making him vulnerable to other techniques just before you came across them. And now, Jason told himself, the test of courage. Do you propose to me that my memories were meddled with, too? 
that my thinking has been altered. Luke did seem to be on the verge of saying something else when he looked up and around. A moment later, Jason and Mara felt it too. A massive surge of surprise, consternation, other emotions from another direction joined the mix. Fear, exultation, anger. Those emotions had to be projected by hundreds, even thousands of people simultaneously to manifest like this through the Force. Jason grabbed his comlink and spoke into it. Colonel Solo to the Anakin Solo. Status check. Sir, Jason recognized the voice. It belonged to one of the Anakin Solo's communications officers. It's, uh... There was silence for a few moments. Fleet action, sir. There's a fleet. Incoming. They're everywhere. They're already hitting the task force around Corellia proper. Jason stood and ran toward the door leading from the Maw Casino. He grazed the returning Bothan server, spinning her, sending three full drinks to the carpet. Chapter 14 Across the darkened casino chamber, in a shadow caused by the room arrangement, but deepened by her own abilities, Alima Rar hesitated as Jason Solo bolted for the exit. She had noticed Jason enter, and had followed his movements with mild disinterest. After hours of prowling secure hangar bays with no sign of the Millennium Falcon to show for it, she had sought out Captain Levint in order to help the woman's gambling success. She had seen Jason talk to Levint, then move toward the door to approach two people silhouetted there. A minute later, a little twitch in the force convinced her to move closer and get a good look at Jason's conversation partners, which was when she had recognized Luke and Mara. That recognition sent such a jolt of adrenaline through her that she had to spend several moments calming herself. She brought out her blowgun as she savored the opportunity fate had presented her. Luke Skywalker was here, and if he was here, the odds improved that Han and Leia Solo were here too, or would be soon. It was possible that Alima could finish her mission, could strike down Han and Mara before the disbelieving eyes of their loved ones, causing Luke and Leia the anguish that would return balance to the universe, to her soul. She tucked her blowgun under her bad arm and fumbled for her darts. Just a few more seconds, and she would spit poison toward Mara. But the disturbance she'd sensed had obviously upset Jason, and it had to have made Luke and Mara alert. Mara was pulling out a comlink, but Luke was vigilant, looking after Jason and then around the casino. An assassination attempt now was likely to be detected. But when would she have a better chance? She got her dart in hand, placed it into the mouthpiece of her blowgun, and was just raising the weapon to her lips when Luke stood and looked straight at her. She froze. He couldn't possibly see her, not in these conditions, but if she attacked now when his senses were obviously at their keenest, he couldn't possibly fail to detect the attack. Comlinks all over the casino began to beep and chime. Military personnel stood up from their tables, from their drinks, many of them now in the direct line of fire between Alima and Mara. She hissed, vexed. She needed to be closer. She moved forward, still cloaked by the chamber's natural shadows. Then Mara rose, saying something, and she and Luke ran toward the exit. Uniformed personnel also began crowding that way, most of them listening to or speaking into their comlinks. Alima picked up the pace, but she was slowed by the crowd by the fact that one of her feet, little more than a stump, caused her to limp. She shoved gamblers out of her way, using the force to add a little strength to her efforts, 
but still it was long, frustrating seconds before she got through the exit, in the middle of a pack of military men and women. Not a tall person, she hopped up and down, looking along the access corridor in both directions for her target. There she was, Luke beside her, at a full run in the direction of the bow, almost at the limits of the blowgun's range. Alima put the weapon to her lips, paused half a second to calm herself, elevated the weapon's tip to give her dart a trajectory that would carry it near the corridor ceiling, and blew. The dart was lost to her sight the moment it left the blowgun. She hopped up twice more to maintain a line of sight on Mara's retreating back. The dart should hit just about... Luke and Mara passed the entrance to a cross corridor and turned left into it. An Ortolan, blue-furred, big-boned, and squat, with drooping oversized ears and a nasal trunk that reached to mid-chest, came trotting out of that corridor, turning toward the Maw Casino. Then the Ortolan stumbled and fell face-first onto the corridor floor. Alima snarled. Her dart had found the wrong target. The moving crowd had grown so thick that without exerting herself fully, and very obviously through the force, she could make little headway through the mass of military personnel heading toward the Errant Ventures vehicle bays. By the time she got to the cross corridor, there was no sign of the Jedi. A human male emerging from the side corridor bumped into her. He was dark-skinned good-looking, with thick white hair and a trim white beard and mustache. He carried a silver-tipped cane, and his flaring silken coat slid across the bodies of everyone he passed, Alima included. Alima was twenty meters down the side corridor before she realized who he was. Lando Calrissian. She all but screamed where she stood. If Lando was here— there could be no question about Han and Leia. She turned back and forth, trying to decide whether to follow Lando or the Skywalkers, and finally turned back to pursue Lando. Bridge of the Dodana Recall all scouts, shouted Admiral Tarla Limpin. The gray-green skin and red eyes of her Duros ancestry made her a striking figure on the Star Destroyer's bridge, a benefit to her now in the thick of battle. Launch squadrons as they come ready. Threat assessment. What are we looking at? Finally, a hologramic schematic of space directly around the planet Corellia sprang into existence above the bridge walkway. Admiral Limpen was actually within the hologram. She took two steps backward to be clear of it. On the schematic, the sphere of Corellia was a blue wire grid. Alliance ships were small green symbols, Corellian craft on the planet's surface or within her atmosphere were yellow, and unknowns were red. There were lots of unknowns, some of them already streaking down into the atmosphere on the far side of the planet from the Dodona. Far too many were approaching Dodona along orbital vectors, Though Colonel Moyen, her starfighter coordinator, was not on the bridge, he remained in the starfighter control salon, a nearby compartment, his growling voice echoed over the bridge's speaker system. We have two cruisers, a frigate, and a minimum of twelve starfighter squadrons headed our way. That's only the newcomers. There are at least as many starfighter units rising up from Corellia's surface. This is an all-out push. Our deployments around Centerpoint Station and the other four worlds are reporting similar mismatches. Limpen looked up, toward the high speakers, as though Moyen were up there. Who are they? They're both an assault cruisers, Admiral. No expression crossed her face, but Limpen felt a twinge of sympathy for Moyen. He was Bothan. All right, she called. Navigation. Plot a course for Center Point Station. Order our forces already there to hit the station as hard as they can. 
Denying it to the Corellians is our top priority. Dodonna will join in that action. If we are still functional when we get there, she added silently, and assuming we are, we can get a sense of whether we need to stay there and keep pounding or run with our tails between our legs. Where's the Anakin Solo? That Star Destroyer, assigned to Jason Solo and the Galactic Alliance Guard, didn't answer to her, and she didn't always know its location or current task. Her sensor operator called out, It was at its usual station, just outside the Seronia orbit, on the direct approach from Coruscant. Now it's coming in. Ask it to join us at center point. Limpin could feel the subtle changes in the ship's artificial gravity, and see through the viewports at the bow as Dodonna slowly wheeled away from her orbit and oriented herself away from the planet's surface. How many starfighter squadrons do we have on station? Three, Admiral. Limpin shook her head. Rueful. They were going to take a pounding. In fact, a mere pounding was the best they could hope for. As if reading her thoughts, one of the junior officers said, her tone just loud enough to reach Limpin's ears, We're barked. Enemy starfighters now reaching our maximum firing range, Moyen said. Open fire, Limpin said. The order is fire at will. Errant Venture Wedge and Corin angled into the flag hangar, each skidding as he made the hard turn from the corridor. Their astromechs had done a preliminary power-up, and the canopies of both snub fighters were already open. Wedge was first to his vehicle, but Corin, rather than climbing the ladder hanging from his cockpit, leapt lightly into his pilot's couch. Wedge swore at the Jedi under his breath and climbed his ladder. What have we got, sweetie? Iella's voice crackled back across his comlink. Unknown forces hitting every major position held by the Second Fleet in the system. Wait, not unknown. The Centerpoint Station Task Force is reporting Kaminorian markings on the assault forces. The Trellis and Corellian Blockade Forces are reporting Bothan markings. We have a small force, one frigate and one squadron of starfighters, headed our way— and the Dodonna has ordered Errant Venture not to enter hyperspace until every spaceworthy fighting vehicle aboard has launched. Wedge swung nimbly into his cockpit. Dodonna's order meant Booster would have to play a game of careful calculations. If he did jump before the military personnel aboard had all launched, he risked certain punishment from the Galactic Alliance, crushing financial penalties that could bankrupt him. If he didn't, and the forces headed this way were too strong, he risked losing the venture, and his own life, and the lives of thousands of employees and guests, as the underarmed Star Destroyer was vaped. Wedge yanked the ladder free of his fuselage and dropped it to the hangar floor. He slid down into the couch, clamped his helmet on, closed the canopy. Corin's voice came across his helmet speakers. Silly operational question. What's our squadron designation? Wedge snorted. They ought to have one for purposes of coordination and efficiency, but the question seemed just slightly ridiculous under the circumstances. Ganner. I'm Ganner 1, you're Ganner 2. He checked his status display. Four lit, four green. Open hangar doors. Say please, Iella said. Just kidding. The flag hanger's lights dimmed, and the outer doors slid aside. Wedge activated his repulsors, sending his X-wing into a wobbly two-meter climb, then hit his thrusters and punched out through the opening before the doors were completely withdrawn. It was an awkward launch, and thrust wash would have scorched the hangar bulkhead behind the X-wing. Such a launch would have earned him a reprimand back when he was still flying for the Rebel Alliance or the New Republic. Here he didn't care. He needed to be outside where the action was. 
He and Cora encircled to run the length of errant venture, heading toward the stern. They could see starfighters and other vehicles dropping out of the ship's belly bays like explosives dropping from a bomber. The starfighters ignited thrusters, turned toward the world of Corellia, and blasted in that direction. The more distant ones were already leaping forward and vanishing, the visual effect to outsiders of their entering hyperspace. Two X-wings from the main hangars came alongside, matching speed and vector. Wedge was startled. They hadn't appeared on his sensor screen until they were a few hundred meters away. But as they drifted into visual range, he saw why. They were stealth X-craft, their surfaces looking dark and oddly mottled because of the sensor-defeating coatings they wore. Wedge changed his comm frequency to a general military hailing range. He thought he knew the answer, but asked anyway, Who've we got there? Hello, Wedge. Luke, I take it your talk with the colonel was cut short. Mar is your wing, correct? Yes. Going to deal with Errant Venture's pursuit? Just until the Venture can jump to a safe zone. Makes sense. You do realize that you're attacking your own allies, don't you? No one trying to blow up the old man who became my benefactor when I was orphaned is my ally, Luke. By the way, you're now Ganner 3 and Mara's Ganner 4. There was a short pause. For Ganner Rysode? Luke asked. Rysode, a Jedi Knight, had died on Coruscant during the Yuzhan Vong War, fighting and killing more enemy warriors in personal combat than perhaps any other combatant in the war. Can you think of a better name for someone fighting a delaying action? No. Who's Ganner too, Corin? Corin's voice was crisp across the comm channel. Hello, boss. Corellian Space Jason's shuttle was on the verge of entering hyperspace and jumping toward the Anakin Solo's position, just outside the star system on the most direct trajectory toward Coruscant, when he received a new message from the Star Destroyer, relaying Admiral Limpin's request for assistance at Centerpoint Station. Jason authorized the change in plans, quickly plotted a new jump for Centerpoint, and launched into hyperspace shortly afterward. When he dropped from hyperspace, the Centerpoint engagement was spread out before him. In the background was the station itself, the ugly, cylindrical, kilometers-long mass of it. Nearer were the Galactic Alliance Moan Calamari heavy carrier Blue Diver and two sturdy-looking Carrot-class gunships, Compared with the curved, organic-looking Moan Cal vessel, the Carracks looked antiquated and impossibly primitive, like thick guard batons slightly larger at either end than in the middle. Blue Diver was exchanging turbolaser and ion cannon fire with the newcomers, and curiously, it looked as though any of its turbolasers that could not be brought to bear on the gunships were being used to strafe center point. Surrounding the three capital ships, were tiny glimmers and streaks of light, evidence of starfighter action taking place all around them. Jason stayed well back. The light laser cannon on his shuttle would not add much firepower to the Alliance forces, and he might not be able to detach himself from a skirmish when he needed to. His sensor screen blipped with the arrival of a new force, and showed him the blue triangle of the Anakin Solo just arrived from hyperspace, racing toward the engagement. He heeled over, taking an intercept course that should bring him alongside the Anakin before it reached the engagement and allow him to get aboard before the Anakin had to open up with its weapons batteries, assuming that enemy starfighters didn't rush to engage. He was in luck, though. None of the enemy forces at the station disengaged to meet the Anakin, and Jason reached the command salon within minutes. There, Commander Twizzle, commanding officer of the Anakin Solo, greeted him with a simple nod. A big, silver-haired man, who looked as though he should be appearing on holocausts advertising exercise equipment and protein-boosted foods, 
He spoke with a Khorasanti accent that had been diminished by decades of service spent among many species and social classes. We're preparing to bring the long-range lasers to bear against the gunships. Belay that, Jason said. Use them to reinforce Blue Diver's fire against the station. Twizzle scowled. Kill more enemy troops rather than preserve the lives of our own? Colonel, that's a bad choice under these circumstances. It's our only choice. Can't you see what's going on? Admiral Limpen wouldn't have ordered the attack on the station if she weren't sure that the enemy forces could drive us out of the system. And if we are driven out and leave an intact center point station behind... Yes, Colonel. Twizzle didn't sound convinced, but turned to the weapons officer. Take a new target. Center point station. Continue his fire. Inflict as much damage as possible. His voice was grudging. Errant Venture Well away from the public areas frequented by Errant Venture's clientele and guests, Lando stepped from a shadowy passageway into a small turbolift. Its doors closed behind him, and its service program spoke. Deck, please. Subcommand 3 Please press a fingerprint, eyeball, or other individual identifier to the sensor. Lando raised his hand to do so, but the doors hissed open again, and a woman in a dark hooded cloak limped in to stand on the far side of the lift. Lando gave her a polite nod. It would be both suspicious and rude to order her out of the turbo lift, so he'd let the lift take her to her destination then lock it down against further entry and get back to his group's operations center at the conference room. Deck, please. The newcomer ignored the service program. She pulled the hood from her face, revealing the features and leku, one of them a stump, of a limarar. Hello, Lando. Lando rocked back against the turbolift wall and drew his holdout blaster. But before he had even cleared it from its hidden pocket, she reached for it. The weapon flew from his hand into hers. Alima looked at the blaster before dropping it to the floor behind her. We are disappointed. This is not an appropriate greeting for an old friend. Lando cleared his throat. You're right, of course. Sorry. A bad reflex. Looking at her now, he had to force himself not to wince. He'd met her for the first time years ago, at the height of the Yuzhan Vong War, when she was still a teenager, still mourning the death of her sister Numa, still physically perfect, still sane. Now she stood before him, a weird gleam in her eyes, her shoulders at different angles. He'd heard the list of mutilations she had sustained and knew them to be matched by the savage injuries her mind had endured. Her tone remained curiously friendly, non-threatening. Where are the solos? Oh, um, Corellia? No, here. Aboard. Where? If I tell you, you won't kill me? We would never kill you. We have always admired you. There was almost a purr to her voice. That's comforting. He pointed his cane at her. It, too, was yanked from his grip by invisible forces and flew into her hand. Now Alima really did look hurt. You were going to shoot us with a concealed blaster? Not exactly. Zap, zap. At Lando's command word, electrical arcs, tiny and blue, curled from the ends of the cane and flowed across Alima's skin. Her eyes widening, she convulsed, 
her muscles locking in a tetany caused by the charge flowing through her. But she didn't fall unconscious. Lando cursed under his breath. The weapon maker who'd built the cane to Lando's specifications had assured him that the charge would take down a good-sized Wookiee. But the weapon maker had never dealt with Jedi. Alima fell, landing atop Lando's blaster, but clearly was still struggling against the shocks paralyzing her even as wisps of smoke began to rise from her body. And the electrical arcs seemed to be getting weaker. The turbo lift doors whooshed open, and Lando ran back down the passageway, toward cross corridors filled with people, filled with light. He wouldn't waste breath on a comlink call until he was surrounded by people. He put every effort toward running. Something seemed to move within his head, as though there were a greased worm writhing in his brain matter, heading toward the exit of one of his ears. He ignored the sensation. He ran. The first cross corridor was ahead, lightly trafficked. He turned rightward into it, toward heavier concentrations of people. His rapid movement didn't attract much attention. A lot of people were running. A few moments later he was in the midst of a thick crowd of errant venture personnel streaming out of a casino now being evacuated. He pulled out his comlink. Now he could... He could what? Call someone, he supposed. But who? And why did he need to call anyone? What had he been running from? And where had he lost his blasted cane? Shaking his head, and wondering whether age really was beginning to affect his faculties, he put his comlink away and looked around for the nearest turbo lift. Corelli in space. Luke had to agree that Wedge's improvised plan was a good one, or would be if it worked. But then he decided that was true of all plans. In retrospect, they were only as good as they were successful, regardless of how brilliant they might have appeared before execution. He and Mara were many kilometers out ahead of Wedge and Corrin and a few kilometers to one side of the straight-line approach the enemy force was taking. As soon as their sensors detected the incoming frigate, he and Mara shut down all active systems and went dead in space, merely drifting. From this point, until they rejoined Wedge and Corrin, they would not use their comm systems. Their force bond, undetectable by sensors, would be their only means of communication. Passive sensors showed Wedge and Corrin approaching the enemy force, showed the enemy's starfighters arraying themselves out in front of the frigate as a defensive screen. Luke nodded. These were wise, basic tactics. The frigate and starfighter screen passed Luke's and Mara's position, and Luke's sensors showed the frigate to be an axe-shaped Nebulon B. The Jedi waited there and watched the battle begin. Wedge and Corrin, staying so close to each other that they were sometimes one blip on the sensors, darted to one edge of the starfighter screen. There was a swirl of activity there, and suddenly Wedge and Corrin were in retreat. Eleven enemy starfighters remained, and one was dead in space, its pilot requesting shuttle pickup over open comm frequencies. Luke gave Mara a simple prod through the force then lit his thrusters and began to maneuver in behind the frigate. She tucked in beside him, and he could feel a cool readiness flow from her, a dispassionate willingness to inflict damage, kill, even die, as necessary. Their approach was smooth and slow, designed to benefit from these X-Wings' comparative invisibility to sensors. They needed to come as close as possible and launched their proton torpedoes before the frigate's crew realized they were there. At the moment, the frigate was running with its shields more powerful at the bow, weaker at the stern. A sensible measure, as Wedge and Corrin were keeping the starfighter skirmish out ahead of the frigate. Closer they came, now one hundred kilometers behind the frigate. 
now ninety, when they were so close that their attacks would take less than a second to reach the frigate, but not so close that retaliatory laser fire would be at point-blank range, Luke fired a torpedo. A split second later, Mara fired hers. Luke activated his X-Wing's shields, and, through their force bond, felt Mara do the same. The torpedo thrusters drew a near-instantaneous straight line to the frigate's stern. Luke's torpedo detonated against its rear shields. Then Mara's disappeared into the blast zone and detonated as well. It took a few moments for the superheated gases of the explosions to dissipate. As they cleared, they revealed a frigate stern that was badly damaged, deeply cratered. Luke couldn't see a single functioning thruster. He gave a little whoop. One enemy was out of commission, and the loss of life had to have been low. If luck was with the frigate, it might have lost no personnel at all. Luke and Mara accelerated in an arc toward the starfighter engagement. Sensors now showed eight actives in the engagement zone, Wedge, Corin, and six hostiles. On Luke's sensor screen, the computer finally identified the hostiles, I-7 Howl Runners. Luke was familiar with the starfighters, sleek rectangular hulls with stubby maneuvering wings at one end and two forward-projecting laser cannons at the other. Luke knew them to be shielded and tough, but they also lacked much firepower. Still, the original escort of twelve starfighters would ordinarily have been more than sufficient to destroy two X-Wings, just not X-Wings flown by pilots of the caliber of Wedge and Corin, And now they were to be joined by pilots of the caliber of Luke and Mara. The Stealth X fighters were only a few kilometers from the engagement zone when the five still functional Howl Runners broke away, roaring back toward the frigate. Luke and Mara let them go. The Howl Runners took up positions circling the crippled frigate, a far more pathetic defensive screen than they had been mere minutes before. Luke reactivated his comm transmitter. What now? Back to the air adventure for me, Wedge said. To give protection until it makes the jump into hyperspace. I'm not going to get involved in the main battle. Honestly, I wouldn't know whose side to be on. Mara asked, How about you, Corin? Corin sounded just a little uncertain. It's kind of up to you, Luke. I've tended to all my personal business on Corellia. I don't need to go back. Where do you need me? Coruscant, Luke answered instantly. We need all the good sense and sharp thinking we can get at the temple. But for now, Mara and I will be heading to the main engagement to see what good we can do for the Alliance forces. You want to come along or head back to the temple? I'll fight. Wedge said, Luke, you're Ganner One now. Best of luck. Likewise. As Wedge peeled off from their formation and set a course for the errant venture, Luke opened his comm board to listen across military frequencies to find out what was happening and where. Dodana Admiral Limpen retreated to the command salon which was smaller, quieter, and less frantic than the bridge. Now she could hear herself think again, and could more easily track the battle's progress. And Dodana's probable death. The Galactic-class battle carrier, commissioned less than a year before, was being chewed to pieces by the Bothan forces pursuing her. She might not last long enough to flee the solar system, the constant pounding by the laser batteries of enemy cruisers, and just as damaging the missiles and torpedoes of enemy starfighters, was taking a terrible toll on Limpen's flagship. Ready to enter hyperspace, Admiral, her navigator announced. Launch, she said. The exterior view, brought in by the salon's displays, showed the stars twist, become streaks of light and then instantly revert to stars again, because this hyperspace jump was very short, not even leaving the system. Centerpoint Station and the furious fight being waged around it appeared on the main display. 
Navigation, Limpin said. Plot a course to send us on an approach close to the station, at optimal range for our batteries. We'll make one pass and pour as much damage as we can into her. Then we're outbound. Our next jump will take us to... Fen, what's the designation for the muster point you used for your initial assault on the system? Colonel Fiav Fen, a female Sulliston, turned from her station computer. Point bleak, she said. Fen had been the aide to Limpin's predecessor, Admiral Klauskin. Limpin had her own aide, but had transferred Fen to starfighter coordination duty and was pleased with her work in that role. Once we're past center point, if we survive, Limpin thought, our next jump will take us to Point Bleak. Communicate with all other Alliance forces. Tell them to break off the engagement and join us there. Tell Air Adventure they have the option of joining us there. Recommend against that course of action, Admiral, Fenn said. Limpin fixed her with a harsh look. Explain that, Colonel. If every Alliance force at the center point engagement zone jumps to the same spot in space, fine. The enemy can plot our direction, but not the distance of our jump, so following us would be pointless. But if Alliance ships from six different engagement zones jump to the same location, all the enemy needs to do is triangulate, and they can find us within minutes. Limpin seethed quietly for a moment. She'd been promoted to admiral from captain during the peacetime after the Yuzhan Vong War. During that war, she'd had to lead New Republic forces in retreat on more than one occasion. But she'd only commanded one ship at a time then. She knew the tactics of a full task force retreat in theory, intellectually, but they weren't second nature to her. Into the silence that had fallen in the command salon, Limpin said, You're right, Fen. Good call. Navigation, relay the point bleak order to all our forces in this engagement zone. Communications, tell the coordinator of each separate engagement zone to find its own arrival spot just outside the system and communicate with us from there. Tell the same thing to the blasted gambling ship. Yes, ma'am. Limpin settled into her command chair and scowled at the main display. Scowled at Fenn's back. The chair vibrated beneath her as Dodonna sustained another torpedo hit. More red lights flashed on the diagnostic displays. Whole banks of turbo lasers were failing. Shields were down to 68% efficiency and weakening. Life support was out on a dozen decks, the personnel there scrambling to get to safer areas. Several thruster banks had been destroyed, and more were being stressed past their operational limits. Persistent vibrations shook the Dodana, a sign that accumulated damage was twisting her very framework. Dodana might survive this engagement, but she would do so in such bad shape that she would have to return to the shipyards immediately for repairs. She would be out of commission for months. More quietly, Limpin added, Communications, let Blue Diver know that as soon as we reach Point Bleak, she's to come alongside. I'll be transferring the flag to Blue Diver. Yes, ma'am. Limpin saw several spines stiffen at the announcement. Good, she thought. They still have their pride. It was one thing they hadn't completely lost. Dodana poured damage down onto Center Point Station, digging a latitudinal trench of melted metal and scoring to match the longitudinal one Blue Diver had gouged. But the pursuing Bothan and Corellian starfighters, unchecked by a sufficient starfighter screen, continued to hammer away at the battle carrier. Blue Diver broke away from the station to follow the flagship, using her batteries to eliminate as much of the starfighter pursuit as she could. 
but it was like a novice Jedi trying to protect a haunch of blood-warm meat from the swarm of piranha beetles. Finally, Dodana jumped, joined shortly thereafter by Blue Diver and the hyperdrive-equipped starfighters supporting them. Anakin Solo was the last to enter hyperspace. Arriving at Point Bleak, the three capital ships maneuvered close to one another the better to exchange aid and support with overlapping fields of heavy weapons fire. But no enemy vessels followed them out of hyperspace. They had time to assess damage, to communicate with Coruscant, to gather data. It wasn't long before the Holonet churned with news reports from Corellia. Prime Minister Dur Gedjin almost glowed with the victory of casting free the yoke of galactic alliance oppression, and offered praise to the forces of Bethawi and Kaminor, and to his own battle coordinator, Admiral Delpin, who was conspicuously commended for doing what Admiral Antilles could not, as if she'd had any role in bringing the Bothans and Kaminorians to the table. Admiral Neothel ordered Dodana back to Coruscant, she ordered Limpin's task force to effect repairs, stand by, and use its resources to monitor activity within the Corellian system. She also warned Limpin of possible treachery or sabotage. It was clear that the Bothan fleet's departure from the Bathawi system had been kept secret owing to some catastrophic failure of the Alliance forces monitoring that system. Within a day, the Galactic Alliance declared that the state of war previously enacted against Corellia now extended to Bathawi and Kaminor as well. Holonu's political analysts, sober or gleeful depending on the political and exploitative leanings of their own news services, speculated on which systems would be next to join what they now referred to as the Corellian Confederation. Commendations were offered on both sides— Memorial services for the dead took place. And with the political climate changed, with a negotiated peace between an isolated Corellia and the Alliance no longer possible, Jason Solo and the Anakin Solo were ordered back to Coruscant. Chapter 15 Zeost From high orbit, the world of Zeost didn't look like a place of evil. It was a typical blue-green world, a good mix of land mass and open water, ice at the poles, white cloud formations everywhere, including the characteristic spiral of a hurricane over one of the oceans. The land masses at the equator seemed to be almost entirely green, graduating to green-white up through the temperate zones and turning to pure white soon after, giving the world large polar ice caps. There was no hint of desert, or any terrain other than forest and tundra. It was, in fact, a beautiful place, if one looked only with one's eyes. But Ben had other senses, and through the force he could feel something else, something malevolent about the planet. It seemed to be staring at him, as if it were a mottled eye belonging to a hideous, hate-filled face he couldn't quite make out. Ben stared at Zeost, and Zeost stared at Ben. Ben gulped. Shaker, do you pick up any thruster trails? Ben asked. He didn't really expect much help there. Thruster emission trails dissipated rapidly, and since a planet's vehicle and vessel traffic was heavy, all the trails tended to blur into one another. The astromech tweedled an affirmative noise, and lines of text popped up on one of the Y-Wing's cockpit displays. Heavy orbital trail indicates one or more vehicles in specific orbit for considerable time. Vehicle vehicles left orbit approximately eight standard hours ago and made planetary descent. The cockpit sensor display switched from a live sensor feed to a diagram of the planet's surface, with dotted lines showing the abandoned orbit and the descent path. Ben felt a wash of relief. Of course, Zeost was a dead world, 
in terms of planetary civilization. Few vehicles ever arrived here, and thruster trails would be distinct for a longer time. That changed the prospect of finding a single vehicle in an area the size of a planetary surface from crazy to possible. He switched the R2 unit's data over to his navigation computer and plotted his own descent. From an altitude of a few kilometers, traveling slowly enough that the Y-wing would neither cause sonic booms nor pull contrails visible from the ground, Ben studied the vehicle that must have brought Fascus back to Zeost. It was a Corellian YT-2400 light transport, disc-shaped, like Uncle Han's venerable Millennium Falcon, but with its cockpit at the end of a starboard-side outrigger-style projection. At least it had once been a YT-2400. Now it was a scorched heap of buckled durasteel, blackened in numerous places by fire. Smoke still curled up into the sky from spots where the hull had ruptured. The cockpit and its access tube had separated from the transport's main body and had rolled, or been hurled, down a gentle incline, putting them twenty meters from the main hull. A light snowfall drifted down across the two main portions of the destroyed craft. Had it crash-landed? Ben increased the magnification on his visual display and shook his head. No. The scorch patterns on portions of the hull showed clear sign of turbolaser strafing. The transport had been fired upon multiple times and then had burned. Ben quickly switched back to primary sensors, but there was no sign of other air traffic in this area. The attacker was long gone. Ben spiraled down to a landing in the same clearing Fascus had chosen. He set the Y-wing down well clear of the burned wreckage, then investigated on foot. Portions of the transport were cool enough to approach, and he was even able to enter one or two places where hatches had been blown off or the hull had gapped open wide enough to admit him. There was nothing within but lingering smoke and the smell of burned plastics and pseudo-leathers. Seeking more clues, he opened himself up to the force. And shivered. The sensation of being stared at was stronger here than it had been in orbit. He tried to set that sensation aside, to feel around and beyond it, and he could detect no hint of death. He didn't think the pilot had died in the transport. Where was he, then? Ben wasn't an accomplished tracker. He didn't think he could follow a target, particularly one who had recently been fired upon and was probably cautious and deceptive, through heavy forest. And then he felt it, just at the periphery of his force senses, a little hint of wicked glee, just as he'd felt it at the display case on Drua. That glee remained steady, if distant, as he returned to his Y-wing. Shaker, I'm going extravehicular for a while. Maybe days, he told the astromech. Shaker offered him a musical interrogative. Ben didn't need to pull out his data pad and read the transmitted text to understand. What do you want me to do? He thought about it. On this hostile world, an R2 unit's sensors, tools, and other capabilities could be very useful, assuming the little droid didn't become stuck in a bog or something. But Ben didn't have the winch needed to remove Shaker from his housing on the Y-wing. Some astromechs had modifications that would let them climb free and make a safe descent, but Shaker seemed to be a stock model, with no mods of any consequence. Still, Ben did have the force available to him. He just wasn't sure he could manage a precise feat of telekinesis with something as heavy as an R2 unit. Hold on a moment, little guy. Ben closed his eyes and concentrated. Through the Force, he could feel the looming mass of the Y-Wing, even trace its contours. And there was Shaker, too. But he couldn't separate the droid in his mind from the Starfighter. 
He didn't want to pick up the whole starfighter. Didn't even want to try. Then Shaker made a noise of curiosity, and suddenly the droid was distinct from the starfighter, its own lines clearly defined. Ben grinned and focused on the astromech. He gently pulled upward, as if trying to extract a plug from an engine. The plug proved to be stubborn, so he pulled harder. Shaker's sudden squawk of alarm almost broke Ben's concentration, but he frowned and kept at it, and could sense the astromech rising into the air and floating free of the Y-wing. Ben gestured laterally, and Shaker drifted to one side. Carefully, Ben brought the droid down to the ground and opened his eyes. Swaying a little, tired from his effort, he said, I guess you're coming with me. The droid chirped, its tones suggesting relief. Heading westward, the direction in which Ben felt the distant glee, they plunged into the forest of Zeost. It was a cold day. Though Ben had felt comfortable out in the clearing in the cloud-muted sunlight, here the forest canopy cut off most of the sunlight, and Ben felt a chill. The massive, dark, twisting tree trunks, looking like pain-racked bodies flash-frozen and preserved in their agonies, added to his unease. He pulled his Jedi cloak from his backpack and donned it, grateful for both its warmth and the symbolic protection it offered. There were no trails through this forest, just dense undergrowth. Shaker's limitations in the environment the droid could move briskly on its wheels on flat, hard surfaces, but had to waddle slowly on legs on uneven terrain, kept their progress slow. But in the first hour of travel, Ben did not feel the glee he was pursuing become more distant. If anything, he and Shaker seemed to be closing very slowly on his quarry. Then he heard sounds from the direction they'd come. The sounds were far away, muffled by distance and the oppressive forest, but Ben thought he recognized the scream of ion engines, the thoom of laser fire. Shaker began tweedling a complicated message. With a sinking feeling, Ben pulled out his data pad and opened it. A series of diagnostic reports scrolled by on the screen too fast to read, but then the message scrolled to a stop. The last line read, Y-Wing Diagnostic Summary Assessed damage precludes functioning. Communications ended. Probability 84% that Y-Wing has been totally destroyed. Ben sank down to sit on the powdery snow cover on the forest floor. Fascus's enemies had come back and destroyed his transportation. The only way he knew to get back off-world. The files had suggested that no one was sure of any sentient beings still left on Zeost. There might not be anyone to help him get off-world. Ever. And no one who cared about him knew he was here. He was going to die alone on Zeost. He forced himself to stiffen up. Whether he died or not, he had a mission to finish. And once it was done, he had a second mission. A personal one. To punish the people who had tried to exile him on this lonely world. Coruscant, Jedi Temple Council Chamber. They met in their circle of chairs, elegant stone seats, far short of thrones in lavishness, and not comfortable enough to encourage meetings that lasted for hours. The others, Mara, Corin, Kyle Katarn, Silgal, Kipduron, waited for Luke to sit, a tradition they'd informally adopted, and which he wished, just a bit, that they'd abandon. When all were seated, Luke said, Silgal, I'd appreciate it if you'd take the role of Terrace Chi for this gathering. The Moan Cal Jedi Master blinked at him, 
Her protruding eyes made the action more impressive than it would be from a human. I'm sorry, Grandmaster. Take the role of what? Kip made a tiny noise. It could have been a noncommittal grunt. Luke glanced over to see that Kip's face was locked up with the effort not to laugh. Luke continued. Terrace Chi, a tradition we haven't observed recently. You find a challenge for any idea or proposition you think isn't being adequately tested. Ah, Silgal said. Yes, of course. Kip twitched just once, a final suppression of laughter, and then relaxed. We have several items to consider, Luke said, in no particular order. Though we have no restrictions on how many Jedi Masters there should be, the war has clearly taken up additional time from each Master, and the worsening of the war will probably take still more. This means the teaching will suffer. I propose, then, that we consider whether any senior Jedi Knights are suitable for advancement. We don't need to debate candidates today, but you should all prepare lists of those you think are suitable. Most of the masters present nodded. All but Silgal, who considered the question, her bulbous eyes elevated to different levels, but offered no objection. Second, Luke continued, as many of you know, Ben is missing. He may have run away to reach Jason. He may have left on some personal mission to prove himself. He may... It took him a moment to force the words out. He may have been taken. Evidence Mara and I have uncovered suggests that he may have injured a woman who later died from her injuries, and that the woman's mother was Lumia. That drew some murmurs from Kyle, Corin, and Kip. Silgal was quick to ask, was this reason for Lumia's attack on Master Lobi? Luke nodded. Presumably. Lobi was shadowing Ben. If Lumia did something related to Ben, spoke with him, planted a tracer on him, and so forth, she would want to eliminate witnesses. So, Silgal said, this isn't just a case of two masters— demonstrating excessive attachment to an apprentice. The situation could result in the deaths of more Jedi. Well done, Luke thought. Already a salvo launched at an accurately identified problem. Correct. But I must ask, she continued, whether you and the other Master Skywalker are dispassionate enough about Ben to make good decisions on this issue? Mara leaned forward as if to offer an angry reply. Luke glanced at her, and through their force bond, reached out with a touch of caution. Mara retained her pose, but did not speak. Luke answered, I think so. In any case, Mara and I have very little to go on in terms of Ben's disappearance. As of this morning, I have been unable to find Ben in the Force, which could mean that he has learned to conceal himself, that he's in a place like Dagobah where the Force characteristics of his surroundings mask his presence, or he didn't finish that painful thought. But to be sure, I call upon the Masters to speak up, if ever you think we're behaving inappropriately. I'll be the first to admit that we need to rely on your more objective judgment on this matter. And other matters of attachment, if I may, Silgal continued. Master Horn, the issues with your family are resolved? Corin nodded. All Jedi except those helping the Alliance Armed Forces in intelligence gathering are off Corellia, as is my wife, though she may divorce me, since I left without kissing her goodbye. 
Silgal did not offer the statement that had predicated her questions. Jedi should abandon attachment. It had been a basic tenet of Jedi philosophy in the Old Republic era and earlier times. Luke had, as an experiment across the years, relaxed it, describing to his students its role in Jedi history, but not insisting that it be observed by the modern Jedi generations. Having himself chosen a life with a wife and child, he could hardly rule that out for others, and these days many were formally married and often raised their own children, with varying degrees of proper Jedi detachment. He had to admit that in such cases, even in his own, true detachment could at times be nearly impossible. Silgal was unlikely to offer that criticism, because she had never indicated that she believed in the absolute merit of the old tradition. But she was obviously taking her role as Teres Chi very seriously. Also on my agenda, Luke said, an update on Leia. You've all been patient and forward-looking in allowing her to remain with Han and I continue to think this serves both the interests of the Jedi Order and the Galactic Alliance in allowing us to keep an eye on other perspectives and on facts not otherwise available to us. Mara and I did see her during our visit to Corellian space. I wanted to put forth the idea that we continue to do so and offer her no censure for apparently being opposed to Alliance goals even when the Alliance continues to insist on punitive measures. This time it was Kyle Katarn who brought up the likelihood of argument. Lightly bearded, a few years older than Luke, he actually looked a touch younger because he had not picked up as impressive a collection of facial scars. You're certain that your attachment to your sister doesn't influence the way you're handling the issue? Luke nodded. Unlike the situation with my son, I'm at ease with this issue, comfortable with all my decisions. The Galactic Alliance has valid points on this matter, Katarn said. Not necessarily a Durasteel-clad case, but valid points. They're not asking us to bring her to justice in chains. But if the Jedi Order supports the Alliance— and a Jedi Knight is actively supporting the enemy. Their contention is that the Jedi Knight in question should be expelled from the Order. Maybe we should, Mara said, once a fair trial has proven that she has aided the enemy. It hasn't been proven yet. Her presence with Han at several events has been noted, yes, but not even Tenel Ka, the intended victim of their alleged assassination attempt, believes them to be guilty of it. And, Kip added, there's the question of whether they can get a fair trial in the current environment. Katarn waved their comments away. Considering it dispassionately, he said, what would it change if Leia Solo were expelled from the Order? She'd continue to stay with Han, continue to provide you with crucial information. She wouldn't stop being your sister, after all, and we could readmit her once the trial ruled for her innocence. Thereby making the Alliance government happy, Luke said. But would it be right, Master Katarn, expelling her for taking the initiative and investigating things she sees that no one else does? Which one of us hasn't done that? No one raised a hand, and he continued, Are you really advocating that? Or are you assuming Silgal's role as honored debate opponent for a moment? Katarn smiled, flashing white teeth. Does it matter? The proposal has merit, or lacks merit, on its own, regardless of whether I believe in it. He's right, Silgal said. We need to analyze the proposal on its own merit. 
and the Grand Master's response to it likewise. Well, here's my response, Luke said. If we strip Leia of her Jedi knighthood because of allegations, and in so doing prevent the Alliance from visiting penalties on us, penalties that could reduce our effectiveness, then we'd be doing a small wrong to prevent a potential larger wrong. But it's not the mission of the Jedi Order to do evil. Our job is to identify things that are wrong and get in their way, even when it costs us our resources, our happiness, and our lives. That's what I propose we do here. Katar nodded as if pleased with the answer. He turned to Corin. Master Horn, I notice you haven't been saying much. Corin had been sitting with his brow furrowed for most of the discussion. Now he nodded. I was under the impression that the terrorist Chi was some sort of bug on Kessel. Booster said they tasted like muck dripping from a badly maintained engine. Mara gave Corin a scowl that all but said, Not now, you idiot. Kip lowered his face into his palm. Talk about straying from the topic, he said. Corin relaxed, his expression becoming more neutral. All right, back on topic. We've all been talking about dispassionate analysis in this argument. Now, I approve of dispassionate analysis. That's how criminals get caught and convicted. But we're also Jedi, and encouraged to trust our feelings. I just spent several days in Leia's company, and friend or not, I came away convinced that she wasn't supporting Corellia, any more than she's supporting the Alliance. She wants to find out the truth. The truth behind the war the truth behind her son's questionable decisions, which also reflect badly on the Order, despite the fact they're government-approved, I might add. She's trying to identify the wrong and to maneuver herself in front of it. I don't think that we should discourage her from that, even by a reprimand some of us consider irrelevant. I think we should trust our feelings. They were all silent for a moment and Luke wanted to cheer. Finally, Katarn said, I'm probably the master present, who has the fewest connections of family or long-term friendship with Leia Solo, and I formally recommend that we take no action against her for the time being. The others agreed. That's my agenda, Luke said, Anyone else? I have something, Silgal said. The war, limited as it has been so far, has increased the rate of Jedi injury, and sadly death. We have had no trouble dealing with the increase with our available resources. But now the war is spreading. Zeost. Ben spent a cold night. In the first part of the night, he found a low hollow spot where the wind couldn't reach him. He rolled up tight in his Jedi robe and fell almost instantly asleep. Then, two hours later, he woke up, so cold that it was his own body shaking that had jarred him from sleep. He was also blind, or so he thought, unable to see Shaker less than a meter away. But when his cold, stiffened hand was able to extract a glow rod from his pocket and ignite it, he realized that he was surrounded by fog. Together, he and Shaker clambered their way out of the hollow, and he found that the temperature rose by several degrees as they ascended the slope. Toward the top, he used his lightsaber to cut dead branches from some of the trees. With them and leaves, he built a fire, igniting it with his lightsaber. After a few minutes of warming himself, he made a sort of nest out of snow and more leaves. Only then 
did he allow himself to fall asleep again. The cold awoke him several times during the night, and once distant screams, like a primate being tortured, jarred him from his rest. Each time he was able to doze off again, though it was to formless dreams in which dark shapes crawled close to his sleeping body and whispered into his ear in a language he did not know. By morning he was slightly more rested, but he would have traded a month's service to a hut refresher-cleaning firm in exchange for a tent and a portable heater. Once the sun was up high enough to provide some sparse heat to his surroundings, he and Shaker set out again. He could still feel the distant glee. At mid-morning he ran out of the food he had brought himself on Drua. I don't suppose you have anything stored in an inner compartment, he asked Shaker. The droid responded with a low, negative trill. Know anything about hunting? Shaker gave him the same answer. I mean, I'm not asking you to hunt. I was just wondering if you had any texts on hunting, something I could read, to learn how. Shaker's answer this time was a more excited series of beeps but the R2 unit lurched forward, waddling faster. They were now at the edge of a large, snow-filled clearing, and Shaker moved into that open space. Following, Ben saw the reason for the astromech's agitation. In the distance, beyond the next verge of trees, a plume of smoke rose into the sky. Someone had built a fire, and that beacon was in exactly the same direction as the sense of glee Ben sought. An hour later, they were at the edge of another clearing, looking at a camp. There was a tent, improvised from several bright red emergency blankets and yellow cord. There was a fire, as paltry as Ben's own from the previous night. There was an enormous backpack, rigged from an oversized carry sack, a few durasteel spars, doubtless salvaged from the downed YT-2400, and more yellow cord. And there was a man. Leaving Shaker behind, Ben crept forward, keeping low behind snow mounds. When he was close enough to get a good look at the man, he felt a sense of disappointment. Fascus of Zeost didn't look much like a protector of Sith artifacts, he was a pale-skinned human, with a chin that was just two steps short of being adequate, and a thick, curling black mustache that only emphasized his chin's inadequacy. He wore gray garments that were the height of anonymity. He moved slowly, adding branches to his fire, and talked to himself, words that Ben could not hear. And the first time he turned in Ben's direction— to add another handful of sticks to the fire, Ben could see that he wore the amulet of Kalara on its chain around his neck. Ben froze. If Fascus knew he was here, the man could vanish from his perceptions, could track him down and kill him with little effort. Ben had to obtain the amulet without alerting Fascus and that meant waiting for an opportunity. No, Ben was hungry now, and would only get hungrier, and colder, exercise being counterproductive when an agent was trying to remain undetected. If he waited, he would either become so weak and stiff that he could not complete his mission, or he would freeze to death. So the situation meant that he would have to attack, and attack soon, and attack without mercy. Anyone who could steal the amulet and wield its power had to be formidable. When Fascus turned his back again, still mumbling to himself, Ben crept closer. A depression in the terrain allowed him to approach within ten meters of the tent. He could hear some of Fascus's words. Worry at all. Got to be shelter. Not as bad as it looks. Ben rose up to peek over the edge of the depression. Fascus had his back to him again. 
then sprang forward, shoving himself through the force, giving his leap extra distance, extra altitude. In the middle of his arc, he brought up his lightsaber. As he began his descent, he ignited it. The sound alerted Fascus, who began to turn. And in the final quarter second before impact, Ben saw beyond Fascus, sitting on blankets at the front of the tent, staring up at him with wondering eyes, a little girl. He was going to cut off the man's head in front of this little girl. Ben landed foot first, kicking Fascus back across the girl. Landing astride the man, he heard Fascus's grunt of pain, heard the girl's muffled shriek. Ben's lightsaber cut into the tent's top blanket, setting the edges afire. He shut the weapon off. Then he got his free hand on the amulet and yanked. The chain didn't give way, and neither did Fascus's neck. Ben swore and yanked up, drawing the chain free of its wearer. Only then did he retreat, scrambling backward from the tent mouth, and dropped the amulet into his pouch. The little girl squeezed herself out from beneath Fascus's legs and looked around wild-eyed. She had dark hair, cut short, and blue eyes. She might have been six standard years old, and she wore a garment that was a child's copy of an orange X-wing jumpsuit. When she caught sight of Ben, she shrieked again. She reached down, and her hand came up with a few twigs and leaves, which she hurled at Ben. One stick flew as far as his foot. The rest of the debris fell well short. "'Shut up!' Ben said. The girl hurled herself on Fascus. Daddy, wake up! Daddy! Daddy? Ben rose and moved forward again. The girl turned and grabbed more debris from the tent interior to hurl at Ben. This time it was a Duralumin cooking pan. He batted it to one side, not breaking stride, and entered the tent. Stop that! Don't hurt Daddy! She grabbed for something else. A blaster. Ben, suddenly alarmed again, tugged at it through the force, and it flew to its hand. It was light. Too light. He looked it over. It was a child's toy. A miniature copy of the classic DL-44 blaster pistol, like the one his Uncle Han usually carried. Ben tossed it out through the opening. Stop throwing things. I mean it. The girl froze, her hand up with a fork in it. Keeping an eye on her when he could, Ben looked at Fascus. The man was unconscious. Odd, since Ben didn't think he'd hit him that hard. But that would help. Ben returned his lightsaber to his belt, then patted Fascus down. The blaster in Fascus's belt holster was real. So were the smaller ones in his boot and in the small holster under his right sleeve. So was the vibro blade in the sheath in his left sleeve. Ben appropriated all the weapons, then looked around. There was a coil of yellow cord in one corner of the tent. Ben snatched it up. Then he rolled Fascus over discovering and appropriating another blaster in a holster at the base of his spine, and got to work tying his hands. The fork hit him in the cheek, stuck for a moment, then fell free. You're hurting him! Ben rubbed his cheek. His fingers came away with a smear of blood on them. No, I'm not. I'm just tying him up. He's already hurt. You're making it worse. Ben finished with Fascus's hands and got to work on the man's feet. Where? His stomach. Ben rolled Fascus over again and pulled up the man's gray tunic. He whistled. An improvised bandage, thick layers of shirt cloth held on by bindings made from torn cloth strips, covered the lower left portion of Fascus's stomach. It was soaked with blood. Carefully, Ben untied the strips, 
and lifted the bandage free. A look at the blood-washed skin beneath showed him that Fascus had suffered a penetrating wound at least seven centimeters long. More blood welled from it as the bandage came away. Fascus groaned, but did not wake up. Ben replaced and retied the cloth. He'd received training in first aid from both his Jedi teachers and the guard, but more than first aid was called for here. He put his hands on Fascus's chest and brow, and sought what knowledge and feelings he could through the Force. He didn't know much about Force healing, but Master Selgal and his father had taught him a few things. Bare necessities. Fascus was not strong in the Force. Not strongly here. He was like a flickering candle compared with his daughter. There was turbulence from the wound. As Ben peered deeper, he sensed blood flowing where it should not. He sensed life ebbing. He didn't know much about stomach wounds. Other Jedi had told him they sometimes didn't bleed much, but that they usually hurt a lot. Fascus should be dead now, and it was clear that only willpower and a desire to protect his daughter were keeping him alive, and even they wouldn't be enough for long. Ben hesitated, wondering how to tell the girl. What's your name? he asked. Kiara. Are you going to make him better? I can't. Fascus's eyes opened. They were glassy. He tried to roll to one side and failed. His vision cleared a bit, and he looked at Ben. Who are you? he asked. Ben Skywalker, Galactic Alliance Guard. Any relation to Luke Skywalker? I'm his son. Good. Fascus lay back and closed his eyes for a moment. Ben thought the man might die then and there, but this was only a gesture of relief, and Fascus opened his eyes to look at his daughter. Guardsman Skywalker, we'll take care of you from now on. No, Daddy! Kiara hurled herself onto her father's chest. He hurt you! He just knocked me down. I was already hurt. The starfighter hurt me. Uncomfortable with the exchange, with what was coming, Ben interrupted. Why did you steal the amulet of Kalara? Fascus looked at him, confused. I didn't. Yes, you did. From an office building on Drua. Drua is where they gave it to me, yes. That's where I live and work. I thought you were from Zeost. Fascus shook his head. Not an energetic move. I'm from Almania. I'm a courier. Who gave the amulet to you? A Bothan. Named Dürr. He told me to bring it here. To land at specific coordinates and carry the amulet to a nearby cave. To come alone. He laughed. One short bark that ended in a gasp of pain. I'm sorry, Kiara. I wish I had. I'm so sorry. And you were strafed? Ben asked. Fascus nodded. I was part way to the cave when I heard the engine roar. I ran back to the Blacktooth. They were firing on it. A TIE fighter. Kiara was still inside. I had to reach her. Ben didn't need to ask anything more. The rest of the story was clear to him. Fascus had gotten his daughter clear of the transport, but some calamity, an explosion perhaps, had sent a shard of durasteel into his guts and killed him. Slowly. Please, his voice was weak, wavering. Untie my hands so I can hold her. Ben thought it over 
then nodded. Using Faskus's own vibroblade, he cut the bonds on the man's hands. Then, while Kiara sobbed, and Faskus spoke soothingly to her in ever quieter tones, Ben began to break down the man's camp and inventory his goods. And to think. I have the amulet, and it can't be used against me. This stage of his mission was accomplished. Ben could check it off his list. Now he needed to find a way to get off planet, or at least to send a signal to Jason. If Fascus, or whatever his real name might be, didn't steal the amulet, who did? Dürer, whoever he was. And Dürer had framed Fascus by leaving the note behind. But why would Dürer give Fascus the real amulet to bury in a cave? This had to be the real thing. Up close it reeked of dark side energy and the creepy happiness that had allowed Ben to follow it. Something did not add up. Ben counted six oversized blankets, one of them slightly damaged by his lightsaber, several wooden poles being used as tent poles, four durasteel spikes anchoring the tent to the ground, three blasters, and a vibroblade, each one with extra power packs, food rations, possibly as much as a week's worth, a quantity of cord, the backpack, the contents of Fascus's pouch, including a data pad, numerous cred coins, cred cards, data cards, and identity cards, and the man's clothes, if he wanted them. But he didn't. He carefully broke down the tent, exposing the girl and her father to the first snowfall of the day, and folded all the blankets except the ones constituting the floor, on which Fascus and Kiara still lay. Fascus's eyes were still open, but he no longer spoke, and Ben could not feel him through the force. The astromech came waddling down from its position of concealment, as Ben began dividing all his new goods between his own pack and the larger backpack Fascus had made. Good news, Shaker, Ben said. Several power packs. If you have adapters, we can keep you going for a long time. But Shaker's response didn't sound happy. The droid kept its optics trained on Kiara and Fascus, trilling a discordant note. Yeah. Ben said. It's sad. Even sadder was what he'd have to do in a minute. But his duty was clear. He had to get the amulet to Jason, and that meant not taking chances with his resources. He thought about asking Kiara to move so he could claim the final two blankets, but decided that such a request was unnecessary. Four blankets would be enough for just him. He spent a few minutes using more cord to tie the big backpack to Shaker's dome, and then he began walking. He didn't hear Shaker following. He turned to see the R2 still in place. Its optic sensor glided back and forth, staring first at him, then at Kiara. Come on, Shaker! The astromech began waddling in his direction. Ben imagined that he could sense reluctance in its pace, but he pushed the thought away. Shaker had never met these people before, and therefore it could not care about them. Hey! Kiara sat up. Snow was accumulating in her hair, and tears were freezing to her cheeks. You can't go. Daddy said you were going to take care of us. I'm sorry, Ben said. But I didn't say I would. You can't leave him. The animals will eat him. I'm sorry. Turning his back on the girl a second time took an act of will, but recognition of his duty gave him the strength to do it. He began walking again, slowly, and Shaker followed. The droid trilled a long and complicated communication. 
then opened his datapad, and it had received Shaker's message. What is our destination? I had a look at Fascus's datapad, then tapped his pouch to reassure himself that the pad was still there. There's information on Zeost that I don't have, like the coordinates where he was supposed to set down, the cave where he was supposed to leave the amulet. I guess he abandoned that part of the plan after he got hurt. And a lot of locations marked ruins. I bet that wherever there are ruins, there's stuff to find. Maybe even people. Maybe even the base that TIE Fighter is from. We're headed for the nearest ruins site. I bet Fascus was too. Why are you leaving the girl behind? That caused Ben's stomach to nod up again. Because if she's with us, we'll go through our resources faster, like our food, and we might not get to where we need to go. Our mission is more important than her life. Is the mission more important than your life, too? Ben thought about it for fifty meters of travel. Yes. Then tell me your mission, so that if you falter, I can abandon you and complete it. Ben turned and round-kicked the astromech in its dome. Shaker squawked and fell over. But the bindings Ben had used to lash the big backpack in place did not loosen. Shut up, you, you walking hot plate! If you didn't have a few useful systems to go along with that malfunctioning droid brain of yours, I'd leave you too. Shaker didn't offer a response. It didn't try to right itself. Ben forced himself to calm down. He'd wait until he was sure he didn't need the astromech anymore. Then he'd crush it in a vice or throw it out an upper story viewport. No, that made no sense. It was valuable property. He could sell it for passage to another planet, if he could find someone willing to take him. With a sigh, he righted the astromech, then continued walking. An hour later, as they crossed a lightly forested ridgeline, Ben's data pad beeped. But Shaker hadn't made any noise, indicating he was trying to communicate. Ben stopped and opened his data pad. Images of his parents swam into focus on its diminutive screen. They were both smiling. Then, Mara said, in case you hadn't noticed, you're fourteen. Congratulations on another birthday, Luke said. So whatever torture your teachers, including me, had in store for you today, forget it. Report to me for some birthday credits, and the rest of the day is yours to enjoy. Their images faded to blackness. Shaker came up behind Ben and waited with a droid's patience. Oddly, Ben felt as though there were nothing inside him, as if he had suddenly become a Ben-shaped balloon filled with gas. Gas could not think, and neither could he, for a long moment. They had to have recorded this shortly before he started this mission. Hi, Mom, he said. Hi, Dad. For my fourteenth birthday, I killed a little girl. He sat down, his lower back resting against the astromech. He leaned forward, wrapping his arms around his knees. And he began to cry. Kiara stabbed at the ground with the knife. It was an eating utensil, not a vibroblade, and when it hit the ground it made a ringing noise. Sometimes it scraped away a little of the ice-hard soil. Sometimes it didn't. After more than an hour of digging, punctuated by fits of sobbing, she had dug a hole a little larger than her hand. But she'd keep digging. Her father was dead and she had to put him in the ground so the animals wouldn't come and eat him. 
Through the snowfall she could see that there were booted feet in front of her. She looked up into the face of Ben Skywalker. The waddling astromech was entering the clearing from the far edge. Ben didn't say anything for a few moments. Then he took a look around. I think, he said, we need to wrap him in one of the blankets, then pile rocks on top of him. That will keep the animals away. They won't eat him? They won't eat him. I'll wrap him up and find the rocks. You put the other blanket around you and go sit with Shaker. Kiara did as she was told. Her tears didn't stop flowing, but now she knew her father would be safe under the rocks. Chapter 16 Coruscant The weeks after the military disaster at Corellia did not argue for a quick resolution to the conflict. Fondor, a world well known for its orbital shipyards, a world whose economy had been chafing under Galactic Alliance military production restrictions, announced its resignation from the Alliance and signed articles of friendship with Corellia and her allies. It was just one more world, increasing the size of the Confederation, no longer being referred to as the Corellian Confederation at the indignant insistence of Bathawi and Kaminor, from three systems to four. But of those four systems, two, Corellia and Fondor, possessed ship construction yards that were critical to Alliance military development. Fondor's loss lit up the Holonews' services. Soon after, Bespin, with its crucial production facilities for Tybana gas, and Adumar, with its munitions industry, also joined the Confederation. And other worlds were wavering. The worlds of hut space made no secret of their preference for the Confederation, or of their willingness to remain staunch, warm friends of the Alliance, so long as they received special trade and aid privileges that would pour wealth into their accounts. Several planets of the Imperial Remnant, long uncomfortable with being part of the Alliance, suggested that they favored the Confederation but the Moth Council continued to abide by its treaties with the Alliance. Grand Admiral Pelion, recently retired and returned to the world of Bastion, participating in the ongoing process of rebuilding and repopulating the Imperial Throne World, spoke openly and often of the Empire's need to remain associated with the Alliance. During these weeks, there were only sporadic clashes between the Alliance and the Confederation, Admiral Limpen's task force at Corellia made frequent raids against the Corellian shipyards, the still intact center point station, and industrial facilities on the other worlds allied with Corellia, though these were largely inconclusive. The Confederation forces in the Bathawi system succeeded with minimal effort in driving Alliance observation vehicles into retreat. Neither side pressed an assault. The Confederation worlds sat back, tightened their defenses, sent diplomats with offers of friendship to scores of systems, and cranked up their ship production to epic levels. The Alliance brought military forces back from distant stations and patrols, gathered information, and enhanced security. Mostly, the war was fought in the news feeds, with analysts predicting where the next major action would be fought, who would start it, and how it would end. Admiral Matrick Klauskin, recently vanished from a hospital on Coruscant, turned up on his homeworld of Kaminor. His handlers transmitted to Coruscant the resignation of his commission with the Galactic Alliance military. At a dinner on Kaminor, he was recognized as a hero of his planet and was ceremoniously retired. He was not observed to speak much during the celebration, and close observers described him as unresponsive and glassy-eyed. Galactic Alliance Military Headquarters, Senior Officer's Briefing Room The so-called Chasen document, said General Tycho Selchu, is authentic. 
a tall, elegantly handsome man with blonde hair frosting to white, he radiated confidence and competence. Admiral Neothel was not concerned with what the human military analyst radiated. Her eyes vibrated with her agitation. It can't be, General. We had no plans to invade Kaminor. Yes, we did, Tycho assured her. Thirty years ago. That settled Neothel a bit, piquing her curiosity. The statement obviously had the same effect on the other senior officers present. Neothel heard muttering from up and down the long table. Please continue, she said, cutting off the side conversations. Back when the Rebel Alliance was mounting its campaign for the liberation of crucial planetary systems of the Empire, Tycho said, General Garm Bel Iblis drew up a number of plans for individual systems. The Chasen document, recently obtained for us by intelligence, is a revision of Bel Iblis's Operation Blue Plug. Blue Plug was never launched because Commodore voluntarily ousted its imperial governor a few months after Coruscant fell to us. Were the details of Operation Blue Plug ever made public? Neothel asked. Tycho shook his head. No. They've been classified top secret for decades. Classified and forgotten, owing to their irrelevance. I wasn't aware of them. But when I began doing my analysis of the Chasen document, I was struck by how thoroughly it resembled General Bell Iblis's preferred logistical patterns. At first I thought it must have been drawn up by a student of the General's. But then it occurred to me that the plan made no provisions for the use of the most modern classes of ships, and that made me suspicious. So I went looking through the records. I see. And do we have any indication of how the original plan fell into the hands of someone who might revise it and pass it off to the Kaminorians? Yes. A touch of dismay was visible through Tycho's controlled manner. Our security has been compromised. An analysis of the databanks where that file was stored indicated that the only times it had been accessed in recent years was when automated backup programming refreshed it and compared it with static stored copies. Military programmers could find no other signs of intrusion. So I requested assistance from intelligence, which revealed the method used. Murmurs from other active duty officers cut him off. Tycho glanced impassively around the table. Neothel knew the general was in disfavor with his colleagues for bringing in an outsider. She, too, regretted that General Selchu had exposed a security flaw to outsiders, but she also applauded the fact that he'd solved the problem. By intelligence, in this case, Neothel said, you mean your wife? Yes. Tycho's wife, Winter, was a long-time operative. She'd been a field agent back when the New Republic had been an ideal rather than a reality. She had helped rear the Alliance's most popular son, Jason Solo. Solo was one of the officers at the table, and he listened dispassionately, not reacting when Winter was mentioned. Tycho continued, Winter discovered that the backup code had been replaced. It was still doing its job, but it was additionally sending those files to an off-site location. Once we knew what to look for, we found similar programs backing up other banks of data. This programming was self-replicating, and could have spread itself through our entire military network. But we caught it in time. It had accessed only older files and some ordnance inventories. And your actions? We scrubbed the malignant code and turned over pertinent details to military intelligence, Galactic Alliance intelligence, and the Galactic Alliance Guard. We could have used their intrusion for disinformation purposes, but this would have been a massive undertaking, 
the enemy would presumably have noticed if their code had stopped spreading through our network, so maintaining the secret would have called for building an entire second network, full of a combination of false data and non-critical genuine data, and updating it at the same rate the real network is updated. Neothel nodded. Such an operation was possible to execute, but it would have been a tremendous drain on resources. Do we know how our systems were violated? In part, Tycho said. Verifiable records suggest that the initial code slicing took place during a routine data inquiry using a GAG passcode. That did get Jason's attention. Ridiculous, he said. Tycho regarded him steadily. But verifiable. No one with access at a high enough level to make significant requests of the military network is a security risk. Jason kept his voice hard. In addition to all the security measures we employ, I'm a Jedi. It would be next to impossible for one of my senior officers to deceive me that way. Next to impossible, Tycho said, isn't impossible. Give me the passcode, Jason snapped. Reciting from memory, Tycho said, 379HOL44 underscore B. Nine two one. Jason whipped out his data pad and accessed a file. He scrolled through it for a few moments. Then his expression went from merely angry to angry and confused. Unassigned, he said. Toward the bottom of the unassigned list. I suggest, Neothel said, that you run checks on the other unassigned codes, to be sure they haven't been used as well. Jason snapped the datapad shut. I'll do that. And report your findings. Yes, Admiral. Clearly furious, Jason turned away and avoided eye contact. Is there anything else? Neothel asked. Yes. The speaker was a dark-skinned, dark-haired woman, dressed in somber civilian dress, rather than in uniform. She was Belindi Kalenda, the Galactic Alliance's director of intelligence since the end of the Yuzhan Vong War. I have one item pertaining to the military. Information has reached me, suggesting that the Confederation is experiencing growing pains— an increased difficulty, as more planets join, with coordinating their respective military forces. Neothel cocked her head at the director. The only surprising part about that is that they haven't selected a supreme commander already. Not the only surprising part. Admiral, what I'm hearing is that the Bothans have demanded that the supreme commander be elected at a face-to-face -face meeting of representatives from each world in the Confederation. Tycho whistled. Jason nodded, and other officers began whispering among themselves. Neothel said, That sounds very much like the Bothans. Face-to-face. -face. Rather than communicating across the hollow net, they can influence the outcome. Even more than that, Kalenda said. It appears that the Confederation is using this as a recruiting ploy, telling worlds that are still on the fence, join now, and you'll have a chance to send delegates to the election meeting. Your candidate might be our supreme commander. Interesting. Neothel mulled that over. How accurate is this information? It's an absolute that the Huts have received a join-now communication referring to the election, and that the Bothans are in a mad scramble to select the candidate agreeable to the greatest number of relevant politicians. We have to be there, 
Jason said. Neofel nodded. Colonel Solo is correct. The delegations will include some of the Confederation's best military leaders and brightest minds. Not to mention politicians who are very knowledgeable about their world's plans. If we can eliminate the attendees, we reduce the Confederation's planning abilities by a noticeable degree. If we can capture them, we stand to obtain a tremendous amount of critical knowledge. Director Kalenda, please bring a maximum effort to bear on obtaining that information. Don't hesitate to call on us for resources. Understood, Admiral. Coruscant, Jedi Temple Training Hall I think you're taking the whole Sword of the Jedi thing too seriously, Zek said. In response, Jaina darted in, raising her lightsaber in a horizontal hold. She began a high, sweeping slash, visualizing her attack as she did so. But hers was a feint, and contrary to her visualization, she dipped the tip of the blade well beneath Zek's blocking maneuver and tagged him along his right ribs. The weapon made a zap noise. A practice saber, it gave Zek an electrical jolt instead of a new burn scar to match the one he'd earned not so long ago. He stepped back, rubbing where the blade had touched him. Hey, you cheated. Jaina nodded. I relied on the fact that you anticipate me all the time, because you rely too often on anticipating me. Maybe so. And I'm not taking the Sword of the Jedi designation too seriously. How can I, when I don't even know what it means? Not even Uncle Luke really knows what it means. He's never been entirely sure why he said it. Maybe it was the Force speaking through him. Zack readied his practice saber again. Maybe it means you're the new chosen one. Jaina shuddered, then went on guard again. I hope not. It took my grandfather decades, multiple amputations, and a lot of tragedy to achieve his destiny. She advanced and threw a probing downward slash that turned into a skittering thrust across the top of Zek's blocking blade. But Zek used his greater reach and height to his advantage, flicking Jaina's point upward so the thrust ended several centimeters to the right of his face. He tried a lateral sweep, but Jaina stood her ground and brought her blade down, catching Zek's attack near her hilt. Besides, Jaina continued, her conversational tone suggesting that there was not a lightsaber duel in progress, there's no emperor for me to hurl down a well. There's Lumia. The voice came from several meters away. Jaina and Zek drew away from each other and looked toward the speaker. Jag Fell sat cross-legged on a practice mat, dressed in his usual black city garb. Jaina realized she hadn't seen or felt him enter. I wish he wouldn't spy on us, Zek said. His voice was a murmur not loud enough to carry to Jack. Jaina deactivated her practice saber. The blade, an electrically charged piece of Duracell, did not retract. What about Lumia? Jag shrugged. The Chosen One destroyed the leader of the Seth. Lumia's Seth, correct? Zek deactivated his own blade. She's what's left of the Seth, I doubt that it will take someone who fills a once-in-a-generation prophetic role, if that's what the sword is, to eliminate her. I'll admit I don't have enough knowledge of the Jedi even to speculate in an informed manner. Good for you. Jag grinned as though Zek's words were humor rather than insolence. Then he continued. But I look at it this way. A sword is a weapon. A weapon of the Jedi would be used by the will of or against the enemy of the Jedi. 
The enemy of the Jedi are the Sith, and other anti-Jedi, whatever they choose to call themselves. The sword of the Jedi would therefore be someone who is wielded against the Sith. So is that simple, simplistic, or just wrong? I vote for simplistic. Zek returned his attention to Jaina. Another round? Jaina shook her head. I want to hear this. I've never really gotten the perspective of someone outside the Order. And Jag always has an interesting perspective. Zack sighed, long-suffering, and reached out a hand. Jaina passed her practice saber to him. Zek dutifully headed toward the rack where practice weapons were stored. Jag offered Jaina an apologetic look. I'm not sure I have a perspective other than what I just said, but I can speculate. Please. She moved up to sit on the mat in front of him, duplicating his cross-legged posture. I'm no more suited to analyze the Force than I am to composing ultrasonic music, since I can't experience either. I just know the little bits I've heard, and that's been added to quite a lot since I've come here. But if the Force was speaking through the Grand Master when he pronounced you the Sword of the Jedi, and if this sword is anything like the Chosen One, then there's some sort of imbalance that needs to be addressed. And that would seem to point to Lumia. Jaina nodded. Maybe our task force needs to be pursuing her instead of Ali Marar. Or in addition to since the two of them were clearly cooperating against the Skywalkers at Roku Depot. Zek returned to stand over the two of them. I don't think the three of us are a match for Lumia. She fought the Grand Master to a standstill. She's Master Level. We're two Jedi Knights and one Force-blind space jockey. Jaina frowned up at him. Zek, that was uncalled for. I'm just explaining correctly and logically that Fell is not an asset when it comes to matters of the Force. Zek, stop it! Implacably, Zek continued. And this sort of analysis is something that Fell knows quite a lot about. He turned his attention to Jag. Didn't you once tell Jaina I wasn't a good enough pilot to join her squadron? Wasn't that cool, level-headed analysis? Jaina winced. That event had taken place during the Yuzhan Vong War, on Borlias, and Jaina had let herself be convinced of Jag's point, even though she'd known better. Jag's expression did not change, but he took a long time to formulate a reply. No, he admitted. That wasn't analysis. That was me being a jealous lover trying to keep you out of the way. Zek looked startled. Obviously, candor was not what he had expected. Jag gestured up toward Zek. And that's something you know all about. A lover's jealousy. Otherwise, you wouldn't hover like a brooding hawk bat whenever I walk up to ask Jaina the time. Jaina felt herself redden. Jag. You always know the time. You're just making excuses to talk to her. Boys, you're making me angry. Jag began beeping. Rather, some electronic device on his person did, and the beeps were a complicated swirl of musical tones, like an astromech trying to recite poetry, a more elaborate signal than any of the ones either Jedi had heard from any piece of Jag's equipment. Looking startled, Jag pulled his data pad from a pocket. High priority flash traffic. He opened the device, read a few lines, and then began reading aloud. From the central computer of the errant venture. Jedi Temple Holocam recognition and analysis code assigns 94% probability of match to target Alim Arar for attached sequence. The argument forgotten. Zek sat beside Jaina. Put it on the big display. 
Zek oriented the data pad toward the display that dominated the wall opposite the hall's entryway. He pressed a button, and a moment later the screen glowed into life, playing a holocam recording. It appeared to be from a ceiling-mounted security holocam. It showed a crowd of people, most of them uniformed Alliance military personnel, rushing toward a door. In the midst of them was a well-bundled humanoid female, definitely blue-skinned, possibly Twi'lek, but her face was not large enough on the image for Jaina to recognize. Then Jag's code went active. A wireframe representation of a female Twi'lek body was superimposed over the target. As it conformed to her posture, smaller lines stretched from body parts, foot, shoulder, head, and words and percentile numbers flashed by too fast to read. The wireframe adapted itself further, shortening one foot by half its length, causing the left shoulder to droop in a fashion suggesting permanent physiological damage. That sequence ended, and another began. It seemed to follow shortly after the first. The holocam view showed a ship's broad passageway. Uniformed personnel poured into it from a larger chamber. Their movement was restricted by their numbers. The blue female was toward the center of the mass of them, jumping up and down. This holocam view zoomed in and held a still frame. The woman's features were very much like Alima's. The Alima of the Dark Nest. Jag brought up a third file. But it was not the holocam sequence. It was a log of instances of holocam recording glitches recorded aboard Air Adventure. In the areas where the deck plans were not classified, at any rate... The log cited thousands of instances, and a schematic plotted them on those deck plans, showing definite patterns of progression along corridors, through air ducts, through casinos and shopping centers. Clearly, Alima Rar was on errant venture, or at least had been when the raw data from this report was compiled, no more than a few days earlier, and errant venture was now in the Coruscant system having been granted the right to ply its trade here after having fled Corellia. Jag stood so fast he could have been yanked to his feet by invisible springs. Hunts on! Expressionless, he ran toward the training hall's exit. Coruscant Space, Errant Venture Walking, half-staggering, because the great gambling ship's artificial gravity generators seemed to be phasing on and off, right and left, and had been doing so since she'd downed her sixth whiskey of the evening, Captain Urin Levint turned a corner into the narrow passageway where her cabin was located. The thought of returning to her cabin drew a sigh from her. There was an even odds chance that Alima would be there, skulking, ready to discuss her day's worth of spying failures, ready to offer another set of threats. Upset by the ritual, Levint would take hours to fall to sleep, nor could she have any company over while the mangled blue Twi'lek was present. Still, it was Alima's Jedi powers that gave Levint the edge at the bedding tables. Whenever Alima watched from a shadowy place and communicated with Levint with little telekinetic prods, giving Levint a much improved sense of how good the other player's hands were, Levint won big. She won enough to maintain a cabin aboard this pricey flying hotel, enough to buy cargo that would make her next smuggling run a very profitable one, enough to surround herself with the trappings of a life well misspent. She just wished that Alima weren't one of those trappings. But now... As she weaved her way to her door, a shadow seemed to flow off the opposite wall of the passageway and stand over her. Levint reached for her holdout blaster, and was bringing it in line to fire or at least threaten when the stranger snatched it from her hand. He didn't aim it back at her. He just held it, barrel down. Levint peered at him, alarmed and suspicious, for the seconds it took to bring his face into focus— then she recognized him and laughed. Colonel Solo, 
she said. Here to kill me? He shook his head and handed her the blaster. No, I need you. Well, I'm not at my best right now, but I'm up for it if you are. An expression of distaste crossed his face. Not what I meant. I didn't think so. I was just checking. She replaced the blaster in its hideaway holster, on her third try, then drew her data pad from its pocket and used it to open the cabin door. Beyond was a small chamber, minimal furniture, and no Alima, unless she was under the bed or up in the ceiling somewhere. Levent led her visitor in and immediately sat on the chamber's one chair, leaving Jason to decide whether to take the bed or stand. He elected to stand. I have need of your services. I don't think so. She started to shake her head, but as the motion caused the cabin to sway violently, thought better of it and stopped. I distinctly remember you saying I'd never prolong a business relationship with someone who sells the Falline. Sells out her fellows, Jason corrected. He looked annoyed. Circumstances change. And ethics with them. Congratulations. That makes you a smuggler. He was quiet a moment, as if settling his emotions, then continued. It's your services as a smuggler I need. Most people connected with the smuggling culture are either staying clear of the war or siding with the Confederation. And with good reason. You want to put us out of business. No. I want you all to take up a legitimate business. And if you help me, I'll help you do just that. Keep talking. There's going to be a gathering of Confederation warships in a few days. From different systems. Their leaders will meet. They'll elect a joint leader and then they'll launch against a common target. I need to be at the meeting site to find out who's there. Who's a conspirator? Just ambush the fleet and sort them out when they're dead. He waved her suggestion away. What will it cost me for you to get me there? I won't do it. You can't be trusted. You sabotage hyperdrives. A flash of anger crossed his face. Your hyperdrive did fail. Of course it did. And I spent several long, long hours thinking I was going to die alone in space. Considering that was on top of having my ship stolen by you, it wasn't a good day. Really, it wasn't. I ruined two good men because you lied to me the last time we talked. Levent shrugged. They weren't good men. They were saboteurs. Incompetent ones, too, since I eventually fixed the drive they sabotaged. They were scum. Like me, remember? You shouldn't rely on scum. Nice boy like you. Jason closed his eyes and seemed to be counting. Finally, he opened them. Whatever price we agree to, I'll deliver fully, in advance, to you or your agent of choice, irretrievably. All right. Levent didn't have to think for long. I want the Breathe My Jets back. I can't do that within our time frame. It's been overhauled, recommissioned, put into service as a GA transport. 
It would take weeks or months to detach it from service, bring it here, and work the ownership records. He thought about it for a moment. How about a gallo-free yards medium transport, twelve years old, seized from Corellia, freshly reconditioned and repaired at the Coruscant Yards, but not yet assigned? I can claim it for GAG and divert it to you. Ownership free and clear. I agree. Assuming it's fully fueled, armed, provisioned, and not sabotaged. Understood. What else? I'm going to need to lay some credits around to buy the information you need. Fifteen, twenty thousand. Done. And I want you to get a message to your parents for me. What? You can do that, can't you? What message? I want them to send me a way, any way, to reach them, at my leisure, just for one transmission. Do you know them? No. Then why— None of your business. I'll swear to that. It doesn't involve you. It won't do you any harm. She looked steadily at him. He considered, then said, All right. I'll find a way. She smiled at him. That's it. I expected you to ask for a lot more than that. Because of injured feelings. The trick to negotiations, she said, which you'd know if your father had raised you right, is never to ask for so much that the other party would prefer to kill you than to go through with the deal. Jason considered that, looking at her for a long moment. Then he simply said, Thank you, and left. Still smiling, Levint stretched out on the bed. Now she had to figure out just what she'd accomplished. If Alima were here, then that last bit of negotiation was going to get the Solos killed, and Levint freed, unless Alima decided to kill her too which Levent fully expected the crazy Twi'lek to do. But if Alima hadn't heard this conversation, those negotiations would probably get Alima killed, which was the outcome Levent preferred. Hey, crazy girl, she said. Are you here? There was no answer. Levent relaxed. Her eyes closed, and within two minutes, she was snoring. Chapter 17 Zeost Every morning Ben awoke with the memory of the voices in his ears. Some part of his mind tried to listen to them, to puzzle out what they were saying. The rest of him worked harder to avoid comprehending. He knew deep down that if he listened long enough to understand— He'd want to do what they told him, and that what they told him would be very, very wrong. So sleep was not restful for Ben, even on the nights when his fire burned through all the darkness hours, and Kiara huddled against him, sad but trusting. During those nights he often awoke to a sense of worry, or a beep from Shaker, to see eyes gleaming from the other side of the fire. Nocturnal predators, Jason would have called them, and Ben could feel them in the force. They were big, powerful presences there, suffused with energy, and wrongness. He could feel that they were as twisted as the blighted trees of this place. So far they hadn't attacked, but Ben made sure that Kiara was never more than a step or two from him, except when either of them needed to perform some private business in the trees. Then he made sure Shaker stayed near the girl. 
the droid's presence seemed not to violate her sense of privacy. There was another presence, too. The day after Ben found Kiara, at about noon, they had stopped for a quick meal of canned rations. Ben sat consuming some grease-packed meat product and eating quickly so that he wouldn't taste the stuff. Wary of the wild beasts he still had not seen, he had his physical and force awareness stretched to their limits, and abruptly he was certain that someone was looking at him. He stood, looking around, and grabbed his lightsaber. But nothing approached, and after a few moments the sensation faded. The next day, again at planetary noon, it happened once more. This time, as they reached the remains of what must have once been a road. Now trees protruded through it, but there were long stretches where it remained flat and level, and Shaker could make much better time. The astromech had just assumed its tripodal wheeled configuration for greater speed when Ben felt the eyes upon him again. Once more... After less than a minute, the sensation faded. The next day at noon he was waiting for the sensation, and it did not fail him. In the few seconds he had, he sought the viewer through the force. And he was successful. Whoever was staring at him was doing so from straight up. Ben peered up through the canopy of leafless branches, but there was nothing for him to see, just the sun gleaming dimly through a layer of clouds. He said, Shaker, passive sensors only. Look straight up. The astromech chirped an affirmative. Again, the sensation faded. Ben pulled out his data pad. Did you see anything? I detect a faint ion trail. The ion trail the kind that a TIE fighter would leave? Correct. So the person who had blown up both the YT-2400 and the Y-Wing was shadowing them. But why? And just as importantly, how? Ben spent part of the afternoon disassembling and checking every piece of equipment he had taken from Faskus's camp, especially the electronics. He found no mystery transmitters in or on them. There was Faskus's data pad, of course, and it, like Ben's, was a short-range transmitter. To determine whether it was transmitting to their shadow, Ben would have to catch it in the act. Its programming could cause it to transmit a single recognition pulse at great intervals, and Ben would have to have Shaker listen on all comp frequencies all the time to detect it. But instead... He could simply remove the battery from the device, restoring it on those occasions he needed to consult its files. That he did. Then, no more informed than before, he led the way onward, through the snow and the twisted trees. Star System MZX-32905, near Bimiel the hologram of the scrawny, bronze-hued Bothan flickered and jittered. Lumia pretended not to notice. She'd chosen Dure and crew in part because their ship had a holocom, but it clearly wasn't a very good one. Right on time, she said, forcing a note of commendation into her voice. What do you have to report? Faskus is dead, Dior said. The boy and the astromech appear to be heading toward one of the old settlements. And there's a complication. Go ahead. It looks as though Faskus took his little girl along. She's still alive. The boy has taken her with him. Lumia sat back and considered. That was unfortunate. The orders she had meticulously structured with Jason didn't specify what Ben should do in such a case. And while rescuing a little girl might initially give him a warm feeling of satisfaction, continuing to protect her 
had to be a considerable drain on his attention and energies. Taking her along was not survival thinking, not mission success thinking, not Sith thinking. And the boy must know it. He was just too much like his father. And that meant he'd never be good Sith material. Kill them, she said. Consider it done. I'll consider it done when you report that it's done. Anything else? No, my lady. Lumia made a subtle gesture with her fingers, which would be beneath the view Dior had of her, and the hologram disappeared. She winced just a bit, though her servitor droids would not be able to see it beneath her facial scarf. She'd just ordered the death of Luke Skywalker's son. One more reason for him to kill her if he found out about it. Ah, well, perhaps he never would. Even if he did, this was all about Jason. And now Jason would not be saddled with an apprentice with a fuzzy, sentimental mind. Zeost the next day, at mid-morning, they found the first location marked Ruins on Fascus's map. It was a mass of collapsed stone. Dressed stone blocks that had once formed the wall of a small citadel before some tremendous force had pushed them over. Ben found weathering on all exposed surfaces of the stones, but no sign of blaster scoring, melting, or other recognizable indicators of violence— and he found no way into the mass. Neither his eyes nor his force senses suggested a place he might enter to find intact chambers, nor did Shaker's sensors. We'll rest and eat here, he said. Shaker, set up to detect ion trails and communications, please. The droid acknowledged with a musical chirp, and fewer than ten minutes later, just as Ben was finishing a chilled can of Nerf steak stew, Shaker beeped again, a complex series of notes. Ben pulled out his data pad and read, You just sent a comm signal. Ben scowled. I did? Of less than one hundredth of a second's duration. Was there a return signal? No. Ben glanced at the time in the corner of the datapad screen. There were two listings there, one local and one Coruscant, and the local time was exactly one standard hour short of noon. Could his own datapad be betraying him? Or some other item of his gear? Quickly, he unpacked everything from both backpacks, segregating the items into two stacks. Everything he had examined before and everything he hadn't. He attacked the second pile, minutely scrutinizing each item. He could probably find out the next day if his data pad were the tracking device. Assuming that the communications were taking place at the same time each day, he'd set his data pad aside just before noon, and he and Shaker would move several meters away. If the data pad sent a signal, Shaker could determine that it was that device and not something else on Ben's person. He methodically checked all the other items, too, to the point of shaking out his belt pouch over the pile of goods to make sure it was empty. It wasn't. Nothing more fell out, but the bottom of the pouch sagged oddly in his hand. The pouch seemed to weigh more than it should, if only fractionally. He turned the pouch inside out, and found the tracking device. It looked like a small steel marble, albeit one with spindly spider legs that were threaded into the cloth of the pouch, holding it securely in place. One leg stretched to a length of six or seven centimeters. Ben stared at it, perplexed. When had this been planted on him? Or, more to the point, since it looked like a mobile unit, when had it crawled into his pouch? It could have been at any point between the Jedi Temple 
and his arrival at Fascus's camp. His mother's words about spies accomplishing their tasks without ever being noticed came back to Ben, and he smiled. Good job, spy, he said. Then he felt the eyes in the sky again. He checked his datapad. High noon, exactly. Except this time, the sensation of being watched did not fade after a few seconds. It intensified, and Ben could feel something with it. Emotions of wicked amusement. A desire to commit mayhem. He glanced up. There was a tiny dot up in the sky in the center of the cloud cover blocking the worst of the sun's rays from reaching the ground. Shaker, he said. Get under cover. Kiara, who had been disinterestedly finishing her can of spice loaf sausages, looked up. She hadn't said much in the last few days, and didn't say anything now. But she hopped up as Ben reached her. That was when the first streaks of laser fire scorched the ground. Green bolts strafed the sand of stones a few meters to Ben's right. Kiara shrilled a scream. Ben caught her up and leapt forward, toward the near line of trees, sixty or more meters away. The TIE fighter screamed past and began to loop around for another strafing run. Ben saw it as a blur. It was black, with some details, such as the ribs separating the panels on the solar wing arrays, in gleaming bronze. He stopped. If he continued toward the trees, he'd be caught out in the open for the next pass. He reversed direction and ran toward the mound of stones. It offered the only protection close enough to reach. He leapt behind a partially intact stand of rocks and peeked over. The TIE fighter was low, barely fifty meters above ground, and coming straight at them. Shaker, waddling back toward the flat roadway, was an easy target, but the starfighter pilot ignored the droid. Ben ducked down again as the tie fired. The stones immediately to his right rocked and fell backward, landing next to him, propelled by the tremendous energy of the fighter's turbo lasers. Black smoke, accompanied by a sharp smell, curled up from the points of impact. He glanced down at Kiara. She was huddled against the ground against the stone surface she lay on, rather, and her face was turned upward, her eyes full of fear. For a moment, Ben was somewhere else, in a hundred other places with shivering refugees, as squadrons, fleets of TIE fighters roaring past overhead. So that was the Empire, he thought distantly. Jason had shown him that there were some things to admire about the old Empire including the unwavering fashion with which it had imposed order. But now he could feel what that order was like from the other side. He shook his head to clear the images away and looked up. He found the TIE fighter coming around for another pass. He reached for Fascus's blaster pistol. It was still out there on the snow, where he'd dropped it when examining his possessions. He bit off a curse and reached for it. Though he'd never summoned his lightsaber or any other object to himself from that distance, the blaster flew to his hand, and he took aim with it. Then he shook his head. A blaster pistol against an armored starfighter? He had exactly no chance to harm his opponent. He needed bigger weapons. He needed the Force. He was a Jedi, after all, even if only an apprentice, and the Force was his great weapon, his great armor. He looked around for a missile, then realized he was surrounded by them. He closed his eyes and concentrated as he had the other day, when freeing Shaker from the Y-Wing. He heard Kiara's gasp as the stone that had just fallen over rose a few centimeters into the air. The TIE fighter came on. Ben couldn't so much sense it as he could sense the pilot at the heart of its ball-shaped cockpit. He felt the stone. He felt the pilot. And he tried to send one to the other. Sluggishly, the stone rose into the path of the TIE fighter. Ben heard the scream of the lasers firing again 
and opened his eyes in time to see one green bolt hitting the wall far to his left, the other hitting the floating stone dead center, shattering it into a thousand shards. The TIE fighter veered, but could not get entirely clear of the cloud of debris. Ben heard the high-pitched clunks and pings as the left solar array wing hit the shards. The TIE fighter suddenly gained a lot of altitude, circled once, and then climbed again until it was out of sight. Ben looked down at Kiara again. We're fine for now, he said. The bad man went away. She nodded, half believing. No, really. He paused, trying to think of what to say to convince her. Then he leaned down and embraced her, felt her shaking. It's all right. It's all right. Her reply was muffled. Will he come back? Yes, he will. But next time, I'll be ready for him. Why does he want to shoot me? Shoot you? Ben drew back to look at her. He doesn't want to shoot you. He wants to shoot me. She shook her head, solemn. No. He shot the black tooth while I was inside. That's how Daddy got hurt. Daddy said they wanted to shoot him, but now they want to shoot me. They want me to be dead. No, they don't. You wanted it. Her tone wasn't even accusing. Just hurt. No, I didn't. I just... Ben paused to try to sort his words out. I'm on an important mission, and I thought that leaving you, even leaving you to die, would make things work out better. You changed your mind? I did. I was wrong. Suddenly Ben felt dizzy. He sat down on the stone beside Kiara. What's wrong? she asked. He couldn't tell her, though he had a sense of it. He'd done just what Jason had been doing, deciding that one thing was more important than another, one goal more important than one life, and he'd been too ready to sacrifice one, not willing enough to try to protect both. He'd been wrong. Perhaps, sometimes, Jason had been wrong, too. Ben shook his head. No. Jason was more than twice Ben's age. He was older, wiser, more powerful. He wouldn't make that kind of mistake. Ever. Unless he was human. Shaker's trilled query jarred Ben from his thoughts. We're all right, he called out. Be with you in a minute. Zeost Orbit Boneyard Rendezvous Dürer looked at the helmeted face in the display and couldn't keep from laughing. He did what? The person he addressed, a man anonymous in the uniform of a TIE fighter pilot, though this uniform was bronze rather than black, sounded abashed. He threw a rock at me. And now you're running back to us. It's not like that, Captain. He used Jedi magic to hurl a quarter-ton slab of stone at me. If I hadn't hit the stone with my lasers, he'd have brought me down. Ah, oh, well, that is different. Orders, sir? Dürer's voice turned hard, and like any Bothan who intended to sound angry, his tone became very fearsome indeed. Keldan! You should have gone back immediately and finished him, without wavering, without asking. Now you won't get the chance or the bonus for the kill. Your orders are to report back immediately. Me Rutter will go down tomorrow at the regular time and finish the job. The pilot sounded appropriately chastised and resentful. Yes, sir. 
We don't reward foul-ups here, Keldan. Boneyard out. Gindine System. Tendrondo Refueling and Repair Station. Cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. Han finished the pre-flight checkup. Lando's repair workers appeared to have done a great job. All systems checked out as functioning optimally. Except, of course, for the occasional fluctuations in the communications among the vehicle's droid brains, which were so idiosyncratic, and which interfaced in what was partly a self-taught, self-programmed fashion, that the efficiency of their intercommunications varied anywhere from eerily high to catastrophically low, like Jedi triplets who could go from an undefeatable battle array to a squabbling trio in seconds. He flexed his left shoulder experimentally. It felt good. He was healed. Everything was fixed. But nothing was tested. He forced a crooked smile for Leia, who was once more in the co-pilot seat. Ready to go, sweetheart? She finished strapping in. Ready. Lando? From behind him, in the navigator's seat, came Lando's voice. Oh, I suppose. It just won't be the same, not being able to order you around. Leia, remind me to get the navigator's seat rigged with an ejector option. You didn't ask me. C-3PO's voice sounded just a touch petulant. The protocol droid stood in the entryway to the cockpit. That's because I'm looking forward to hitting the thrusters and hearing you roll around for a while. Han brought the Falcon up on repulsors and sent her gliding forward to the exit from the repair hangar. Which is going to happen in about five seconds. Oh, oh dear, perhaps I should find a seat. Two seconds. They passed through the atmosphere containment field at the end of the hangar, and emerged into gleaming starfield. Han heeled over, putting the stars to starboard and the night side of Gindine to port, and, despite his words, began a slow, smooth acceleration into a sample high orbit. The engines sounded sweeter than they had in quite a while. He grinned, experimentally increasing the thrust, accelerating the transport faster, and sending her up into an ever higher orbit. Not bad, Lando. One of the virtues of being rich. You can afford to hire the best. Gindine's sun came into view, no longer eclipsed by the planet, and the cockpit viewports polarized dramatically, making vision useless. Sensors showed the main cluster of the planet's orbital shipyards, far less numerous than those of Kuat or Corellia, but well respected, at a lower orbit. They were passing directly above those shipyards when the enemy task force appeared. The Falcon's threat sensors howled as a tremendous mass appeared directly in her flight path. Han hauled back on the yoke, a hard maneuver that pressed him and his crew deep into their seats, and cringed as he heard something scrape on the Falcon's underside. Shields. We grazed her shields, Leia muttered. Their new course wasn't much better. The Falcon flashed through a squadron of starfighters, at right angles to their course, too fast for Han to have anything but a vague impression of them. Shields up! Han shouted. What the bricks is going on? Leia remained cool. Sensors say it's a Bothan assault cruiser and six squadrons of Hellrunners. And the squadron Han had flown through was turning in the Falcon's wake. The capital ship gunners, doubtless caught unawares by the proximity of the Falcon when they arrived, now began firing turbolaser batteries. Han sent the Falcon into a dizzying spiral of evasive maneuvering. Sweetheart, Lando, I hate to ask, Leia unbuckled. Yes, we'll go shoot down the bad furry people for you. Then she and Lando were gone. The first shots from the pursuing Howl Runners battered at his rear shields, and Han growled. He'd had a beautifully restored, intact Millennium Falcon in his hands for ten minutes 
before someone was trying to shoot her to pieces again. Three PL, he shouted. Get up here. Operate the sensors and comm board. Yes, Captain Solo. The protocol droid, rocking wildly back and forth as Han's maneuvers nearly took him from his feet, managed to slide into the seat Leia had vacated. Very prudently, he strapped himself in. If I may ask, sir, don't. Han rolled ninety degrees to starboard and arced around to a course straight out from the planet. Laser fire from the pursuers bracketed the Falcon, missing by meters. But now he could hear the Falcon's own turbo lasers firing. What's happening, sir? Bothans have sent a task force to destroy or capture the shipyards here, Han said. They must have jumped straight at Gindine and let the planet's gravity well yank them out of hyperspace. That's why they appeared so close. Your pursuers are ten in number. No, nine. Someone appears to have scored a hit, and one of them is heading in a different direction. Distantly, Han could hear Lando's shout of, Nice shooting! He grinned. That was his lady, always blowing up people who intended to cause him grief. And, C-3PO added, you're getting a message. From the Bothan ship, demanding surrender. Well, no, actually. It's from a Captain Urin Levint. Han grimaced. Jason had, through circuitous means, via Winter Selchu, via Iela Antilles, all because he no longer had any direct communication access to his parents, recently sent word that this Levint wanted to get in touch. Han had heard of her, a crusty old smuggler from the corporate sector, but had never met her. Tell her I can't talk now. Oh, it's not live. It's recorded. I'm saving it both to the Falcon's computer and to my own memory. I believe in redundancy. You don't say. Something belatedly occurred to Han. Communicate with the personnel on the repair station and tell them to get out, to jump in the closest escape pod and get down to the planet's surface. Oh, I already did that, sir. Master Lando communicated those instructions to me through ship's intercom. By the way, you are down to seven pursuers. If I calculate it correctly, that's one damaged, two destroyed. Han sent the Falcon into another series of jinking, juking moves. The hammering his rear shields was taking lessened, but he could see the protocol droid's head whipping back and forth on his metal neck. Sir... Master Lando requests a little more stability. Does he? Well, that's what I interpret from the rather florid language he's employing. Six pursuers. Two damaged, two destroyed. I... I say, the rest are breaking off. Han glanced over at the sensor screen. C-3PO was right. The remaining half-squadron of Howl Runners was disengaging turning back toward the planet. We're not their mission, he said. But we ran when they appeared, and like necks, they chased us. Until their commander figured out we were a waste of time. He leveled off. Leia, come plot me a course. Let's get out of this system. Leia's voice was artificially sweet. Shall I bring you a bottle of ale, too? Maybe your slippers? Han grimaced. Didn't mean it like that. While they were in hyperspace, Han reviewed the message Levint had sent him. Then he put it on one of the large displays for everyone to see. It seemed to have been recorded by the cheapest variety of pocket holocam. The image of the woman's leathery face, when stretched to fill the large display, was heavily pixelated. Greetings, she said. I'm sending you this message to do you a big favor and hope you'll do me one in return. Smuggler economics, Leia whispered. I'm on the errant venture under my own name. There's someone else here, too. A Twi'lek by the name of Alima Rar. Han glanced at Leia. Her face set into hard lines. I think she has plans for you, 
and I don't think they're nice ones. So I'm sending you this message. I'm betting that she'll kill me, too, when I'm of no more use to her. So I'm hoping you'll do her first. She says she's a Jedi. Otherwise, I'd try myself. But in my experience, it doesn't pay to try to knock off a Jedi. And I have a favor to ask. There are rumors that there's an important meeting planned of Confederation bigwigs. For personal reasons, I really need to get somebody there. I don't know what your affiliations are, and I don't care. But I don't plan to do anything to disrupt the meeting. You're one of the best connected people in the galaxy. If you could let me know the where and when, I'd appreciate it. Please erase this message once you've reviewed it. A bunch of people would kill me if they knew I'd sent it. The message ended, fading to black. Huh, Han said. He glanced at Leia. What do you think? Hard to tell with a low-resolution message, Leia said. I'd need to speak to her in person to get a real sense of whether she's telling the truth. But her story makes sense. That would explain the presence I felt aboard Errant Venture. After our last talk with Luke, I've been wondering if it might have been Alima. Or Lumia. Han nodded. Let's go back to the Errant Venture. Lando sounded hurt. You're not asking my opinion? Han sighed. Lando, should we go back to the galaxy's largest mobile gambling and shopping enterprise? What kind of stupid question is that? Chapter 18 Zeost Ben dreamed of red eyes springing across the fire he had built, and the dream was so powerful, so immediate, that he woke up out of it in mid-kick. His foot connected with something muscular. His blow deflected it in the air, but Ben took enough of the force of the impact that he was rolled backward, away from his blanket. Shaker was tweedling sounds of alarm. Ben could see the droid's lights dim glows where the fire was dying. Nothing else. There was darkness all around. He grabbed his lightsaber from his belt and activated it, casting a soft blue glow on his surroundings. Kiara was still wrapped up in her blankets, just now coming awake, her eyes wide. Two meters beyond, between her and the nearest tree, a shape struggled back to its feet and whipped around to face Ben. It was extremely broad in the chest, with four stubby legs that ended in three-toed feet. Its neck was protected by a bony plate or ridge that circled it like a collar, and its head was dominated by a long jaw filled with triangular pointed teeth. It looked a lot like hollows Ben had seen of necks, but there were no cybernetic enhancements to be seen and this example was covered in short gray fur. The fur did not make it look like a plush toy. It crouched and roared at Ben, a roar that echoed from several directions, outside the light cast by the lightsaber. When it roared, Kiara turned involuntarily to look. The creature glanced over, and instead of jumping for Ben, lunged at her. Ben jolted forward, but his reflexes were dulled by sleep and exhaustion. He could not reach her in time. Shaker's protruding arc welder arm touched the next side. There was a flash of light, and the beast howled. It twisted, biting Shaker, taking the droid's extended arm off with a snap of its jaws. And then Ben reached it. With a hard, downward stroke of his lightsaber, he cut through the neck's armor and into its neck. He only sliced halfway through, but that was enough to sever the spine. The beast collapsed, leaving others out there in the dark, close. He could hear them moving, hear their little growls and yips. They were communicating. Ben's initial flush of anger began to fade, and he started to think. 
he reached out through the force, looking for his enemies. He found them, six in all, circling. He sensed that they were waiting for a moment's inattentiveness on his part, waiting for the lightsaber to go out. They understood that it could only bite them when they were close to him. He offered them the Jason Solo, You've Underestimated Me grin. Left-handed, he drew Fascus's blaster. Aiming through the force, he fired. There was a howl of pain out in the darkness, and he could both hear and detect through the force the wounded neck bounding away. He chose another target, not bothering even to look in that direction, and fired a second time. The result was the same, one animal wounded and fleeing. The rest turned and faded away into the surrounding forest. Comparative silence fell on the camp. The only thing to be heard was the buzz of Ben's lightsaber. Now the cold began to eat into him again, and he shivered. Are they gone? Kiara asked. Ben holstered the blaster, drew his glow rod from his pouch, and switched it on and the lightsaber off at the same moment. Yeah, but we're going to spend the rest of the night up in the tree, to be sure. He looked at Shaker. The droid had withdrawn its arm stump and shut the cover plate over it. The rest of the arc welder arm lay on the snow. Sorry about that, little guy, Ben said. You did good. Shaker gave him a pleased-sounding trill. Minutes later, once he and Kiara were nestled together up in the tree, high enough, he hoped, that these necks could not reach them, Ben had time to think again. He wouldn't have been so oblivious to the next arrival, but he had been deep in sleep. He was getting more tired every day, and not sleeping as lightly as he used to as lightly as a Jedi or an Alliance guard needed to. And he'd been dreaming. In the dream, the voices that pressed close all around had finally learned his name. Ben. 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 They had chanted, and it was so much harder to ignore his own name. He couldn't, in fact and once they knew he was listening to them, they learned to say other things. Protect, girl, they whispered. Protect, girl. That seemed so strange, that in this place famous among the Jedi for evil deeds, the ghostly voices would offer such a positive message. Was it because they cared? or because they knew he would listen to a message like that. On that thought, he fell asleep again, and the voices returned. Ben! Ben! Coruscant System, Errant Venture This time there was a kind of electricity to the conversation as if everyone involved knew they were steps closer to their goal. The interesting thing, Wedge noted, was that there were so many goals, but everyone was making progress. So Lando and I have been cashing in old favors, Han was saying, sometimes very old. And it turns out Captain Levent is right. There's a major confederation gathering being put together. And it's not just to elect their warlord. News trickling out of that whole mess suggests their assembling a fleet at the election spot. And from there, the new warlord will lead some sort of fleet action. But no one knows where or against what. Shipyards! Wedge and Jag said the word at the same time, and looked at each other. Kuat! Coruscant! Wedge began. Sluis Van, Thyphira, any number of places. But shipyards, Jag said. Zek frowned. How do you know? Wedge had noticed that Zek frowned just about every time Jag spoke, and Jag frowned just about every time Zek spoke. 
The pattern of the last several days' worth of Confederation attacks and raids, Wedge said. Mostly against orbital shipbuilding facilities. Their clear strategy is to diminish the Alliance's production and repair of warships. That way, despite the fact that the Confederation has fewer worlds than the Alliance by orders of magnitude, they'll come closer to parity in shipbuilding resources. Which sounds, Jag interrupted, as though they have a pretty clear military plan in place. I wonder why they need a supreme military commander if they're already cooperating so well. That cooperation won't last without a commander they all agree on, Leia said. Now back to Alima? Wedge smiled. Sorry. Jaina turned her tabletop display so everyone could see it. On it was the triangular plan of one entire Star Destroyer's deck level. We've added the last several days' worth of errant venture security recordings to our sample, and Booster authorized the ship's computers to give their analysis top priority, and gave us a more complete set of deck plans to compare them with. We can confirm a pattern of Alima's movements. She began tapping the screen, and each time she did so, a different level was displayed. Here, for example, casinos and shopping— Thin traces, widely spread. She was searching, and not finding anything. She tapped again. A few casinos where she spent a lot of time. I don't think she's a gambler or attempting to build a new social life. Levint shows up a lot in the holocam views during Alima's presence, so it's likely she's keeping tabs on her partner. Another tap, and plans for small passenger staterooms came up. There was a bright spot in one area, suggesting frequent travel by Alima, and movement trails leading off from it in all directions. Levint's compartment, Jaina said. No surprise there. But here's one. She switched the view to a diagram of ship's areas far away from the luxuries that the passengers enjoyed. Just prior to the bothan Kaminorian breaking of the Corellian blockade, she began venturing into the crew portions of the ship. Mirax, silent until now, sprang up and moved to stand directly in front of the monitor. Bridge, technical centers, my father's quarters, my quarters! She's been in my room? In his best Corsac investigator voice, Corin asked, Have you noticed anything suggesting that someone has been sampling your cosmetics? Trying on your clothes? Mirax shot her husband an unamused look. Other than you? Ow! Corin raised his hands. I give up. It's not funny, Corin. Mirax moved away from the display. She resumed her seat, clearly rattled. Jaina caught Leia's eye. Mom... You may have saved Booster's life by coming back when you did. When Alima stopped being able to sense you, she probably thought about getting to you through Dad, through the loose network of smugglers, and Booster's an obvious target. Well, let's make sure she doesn't get another crack at Booster, Leia said, or at any of us. We're going to hunt her down and eliminate her as a problem. The easy way if she'll cooperate, or the hard way if she won't. And that means Jedi. Han gave her an incredulous look. I'm not going to stay while you— She shot him a look suggesting that this wasn't a matter for debate. I think you'd better. Alima's a Jedi who thinks like an assassin. How much training have you done against a combination like that? I don't need training. I have reflexes, he blustered. Wedge touched his arm. Actually, you and I can do them a lot more good by monitoring everything on the security holocams. We can anticipate traps and ambushes, warn them about Confederates Alima has that we don't know about. Well... Then Han heard what Jag was saying to Jaina. Need about five minutes to get some equipment for my X-Wing. Hey, Han said. 
If I'm not going, he's not going. Jag turned his attention to Han. His reply was calm, reasonable of tone. I've been preparing for this for years, and it's my mission. Jag's right, Dad. Jaina moved up to Han, then leaned over and kissed his forehead. Please. Han uttered a little growl, then slumped, defeated. Alima was thrilled. Only half an hour ago, she had detected the Force Presence. The one that said Leia was probably aboard again. You were right, she told Levint. She donned her black hooded cloak and felt around with her one functioning hand to be sure that all her weapons and tools were readily available. I usually am, Levint said. She got up from the bed, moved to the compartment's tiny closet, and selected a dress jacket that was all piratical purple synth silk and big gold-toned buttons. I think I'll get some gambling in while you're out killing people. Hey, the deal is still the deal, right? You set eyes on either of the Solos, and I've met the terms of our contract. Of course, Alima assured her. The truth was more complex than that, naturally. If Alima set eyes on Han but failed to kill him, she might choose to kill Levint to ensure that the captain would not be captured by the Solos. Levint knew too much about Alima's movements. But if Han died, what Levint knew would not be as critical. So she might let the captain live under those circumstances. Surely Levint understood that. Zeost Ben, save girl. Ben, protect girl. I have to get her off world, Ben murmured in his sleep. I need a ship. Ship. Ben, ship. Learn, ship. Ben, learn, ship. I already know how to pilot a ship, Ben protested. He struggled against the hold sleep had on him. But something reminded him he mustn't move right now. If he moved, he would... What? Fall down. Learn, ship. The voice was unusually emphatic, and in Ben's mind a picture appeared the image of a ball-shaped craft. It was odd and organic, with a rough red surface texture. In the center of the sphere facing him was a transparent hatch or canopy. Red spars stretched upward and downward from the craft. They seemed articulated, insectile. But this vehicle was no living thing, not like a Yuzhan Vong craft. Ben sensed it was machinery, but machinery that was aware of him, waiting for him. He woke up with sunlight, broken up by the branches above, streaming into his face, and he knew where the red ship was. Or rather, he knew the direction to take to find it. If it was real. The TIE fighter did not find them at noon. That was because Ben snipped the long leg of the tracking device in his pouch, assuming that it was the unit's antenna. He must have been right. Starting an hour and a half beforehand, and waiting until some time past noon, he, Kiara, and Shaker rested in a small ravine, a place where infrared traces would be harder to detect from any angle but straight up. He distantly felt the eye in the sky, but it did not come near him. If he ever needed to, he could reattach the antenna. That was one good result of the day. Other events were not so promising. Their food was beginning to run short. They had two cans of preserved rations, which would last as long as they chose to stretch them. Ben could happily have eaten both cans himself at a single sitting. Water was in good supply, 
All they had to do was pack snow into Fascus's canteen and wear it against their bodies to melt, which was chilly and uncomfortable but simple. Occasionally they wandered across a frozen stream. At those times, Ben used his lightsaber to cut through the ice and give them access to the water. He wondered, though, about the snow and the water on this world. He'd now seen a few bird-like creatures. Their wings were webbed rather than feathered, and they were often distorted, with one leg bigger than the other, or possessing a misshapen beak. Was there something in the water causing high levels of mutation? For his sake and Kiara's, he hoped not. Worst of all, he was sure that the necks were following them. They stayed out of sight, but he could sense them pacing him and Kiara to the right and left, following their trail. He and Kiara were meat to the necks, he knew. He didn't much like being considered meat. He hoped he'd have enough strength to do something about it when the time came. Coruscant System Errant Venture In one of the ship's great lobbies, where lights were bright and visitors mingled well away from the expensive attractions of casinos and shops, but not far from the expensive attractions of several surrounding bars, Alima spent a few minutes in a data kiosk, downloading the last several lists of new arrivals. Of course, not everyone who came to Errant Venture consented to be listed, but many did, so that an automated search code would detect their names and announce their arrival to friends. She had scanned through several hundred names, recognizing none, when she felt a flicker in the force. Then it was more than a flicker. It was a light, a signal. She looked toward its source. Entering the grand lobby was a human man, unusually tall, light-skinned, his long black hair tied back in a ponytail. He wore dressy civilian clothes, black slacks and boots, a dark blue tunic with yellow striping angled across the chest, a black vest and belt. Alima knew him at once. He had once been a joiner, had once belonged to a killick nest. He was Zek. But his actions confused her. He moved slowly through the lobby, smiling and nodding at everyone he passed, speaking briefly to several, especially young females. As he passed, a few of them turned in his wake, moving to keep him in sight. Alima thought she understood, but it made no more sense than before. Zek was radiating vitality and power through the Force, in a fashion that would be appealing to just about everyone but the most Force-blind, and if there were any Force sensitives in the crowd, they might be drawn especially strongly to him. She gaped. He was using his Jedi abilities to attract females. It scarcely seemed possible. He had always been quiet and reserved, not to mention pathetically infatuated with Jaina Solo. Alima wondered what had caused the change. She also wondered whether she should kill him. He had nothing to do with her current plans, but it was inevitable that when Alima killed Han, Jaina would vow vengeance, or at least seek it, pretending it was just a dispassionate desire for justice. And if Jaina came hunting, Zek would come with her. If Alima eliminated him now, that was one less thing for her to worry about. She, too drifted toward Zek. She came to a stop twenty meters from him, fingering her blowgun and still undecided. Zek and two new female friends had paused to watch a fire-breathing Deveronian juggler perform his act for the patrons in the lobby when she became aware of another presence, this one much closer. She turned her head to see a thick-chested man with a trim graying beard and startling green eyes. He stood two meters from her, staring at her, smiling. He wore Jedi robes. Horn, she said. I'll say this once, Corin said. 
Give up now. She raised her blowgun and fired. Horn plucked the dart from the air. He opened a data pad, dropped the dart onto the screen, and snapped the device closed. That gave Alima time to ignite her lightsaber. Corin drew and followed suit, his silver blade contrasting sharply with her blue-black blade. Alima became aware of applause. Corin, too, glanced around, not moving his head. Patrons of the errant venture were drawing back from their standoff, but not very far. Many were clapping. Some were putting down bets. Alima saw Corin silently offer a curse at their stupidity. And now Zek was moving toward the two of them, his lightsaber hilt in hand. This was a trap, and Alima cursed her own stupidity. And then she disarmed herself. She hurled her lightsaber high into the air, giving it a touch through the force, to direct its flight, to keep the blade ignited. Corin and Zek followed its progress in the second it took to reach the ceiling and sheer through the struts holding a huge elaborate chandelier in place. It dropped toward the crowd beneath, its glows starting to fade, to plunge the lobby into comparative darkness. Alima turned and ran as fast as her crippled foot and damaged body could manage. She let her lightsaber turn itself off, but continued to pull at it, and a moment later its hilt slapped into her outstretched hand. She felt a massive surge in the force behind her, Zek reaching for the chandelier, checking its fall. She glanced over her shoulder, expecting to see Corin coming after her, but she was alone. He must have remained behind, yanking people to safety from beneath the falling fixture. She smiled. Her enemies weren't functioning as a team. Had they been, Corin would have attacked her while Zek caught the light fixture. She had a chance after all. Transparisteel shards from the damaged chandelier rained down on the crowd, and shrieks of surprise and pain joined the noisy confusion behind her. The last of the light died. Now the lobby was lit only by glows from the surrounding bars. Alima reached the exit and whipped around the corner pausing for a moment to retrieve her blowgun from under her left arm and reload it. The broad corridor where she found herself was well lit, and the panic from inside the lobby had not yet infected the streams of pedestrian traffic here, so she was quick to notice the figure in the distance ahead of her, running toward her with unusual speed and purpose. It was Leia. Leia Solo, looking straight at her. Alima could feel a flash of anger from her through the force. It was echoed by a similar flash from behind, down the hallway in the other direction. Alima grimaced. This wasn't right. Han should be here. Alima would kill Han, Leia would suffer, Alima would escape. But now, with two Jedi behind her, and one in either escape direction, Alima would have to be instantly lethally efficient if she was to get away. Getting away was the most important thing at this moment. She would have to abandon justice in favor of practicality. She would have to kill Leia. Alima raised her blowgun to her lips. Leia raised one hand. Alima felt the blowgun twitch, and the dart within it shot backward, straight into her mouth. Alima froze there for one long, terrible moment. But she wasn't dead. The poisoned tip had not come down on her tongue. With infinite care, Alima turned her head to one side and spat the dart out. Then, as cold fear clawed at her heart, she ran. There were too many of them to deal with, and the suddenness of the trap they'd sprung unnerved her, she had to get to a safe place, to recover her bearings. Fifty meters ahead of her, striding forward with confidence, radiating anger, came Jaina Solo. Alima cried out, a wordless noise of frustration. She turned leftward, toward a bank of turbo lifts, 
and the door into one opened. She ran through, and it closed behind her. A family of three duros looked at her, their heads tilted at the same angle of curiosity. The child had a Kowakian monkey lizard on its shoulder, and the appalling little creature pointed at Alima and cackled. "'Deck, please?' the lift's automated voice asked. "'Down!' Alima hissed. But nothing happened. A second passed, and the sense of menace surrounding Alima increased. She knew what was happening. Her enemies were all around her, had seized control of the errant venture, could use even doors and turbo lifts to harry and delay her. She reactivated her lightsaber and plunged it into the floor. The Duros drew back, suddenly afraid. She took only moments to cut a hole in the floor, then dropped through it into the turbo lift shaft. Minutes later, she was in a cargo hold, hurtling between tall, lashed-together stacks of plasteel containers, continuing to move as fast as she could, certain that the pursuing Jedi were just an instant behind her. They had to be using the ship's holocam system. Alima didn't understand. She thought that her techniques would defeat it. The enemy must have new techniques. A door in the bulkhead ahead of her hissed open, and a man stepped through. He wore a full-coverage garment of glistening blue material and a helmet, narrower and closer than a pilot's. Its faceplate was transparent, and through it she recognized the features of Jagged Fell. He extended an empty hand. Alima! Surrender! I guarantee— She raised her blowgun and shot him. He pitched forward. No. He knelt forward. He was drawing his holstered blaster before she'd realized he wasn't dead, wasn't dying. Armor. He had to be wearing armor. He raised his blaster and shot her. The blast struck her in the left shoulder, spinning her around, throwing her to the ground. Pain lanced through her. Pain and a realization that he'd broken her clavicle, that he'd further mutilated her. She rolled to one side as he shot again. The blast missed her. She lashed out at him through the force, sweeping him aside, hurling him deep into a mass of cargo crates. The wall of crates, held together by tough webbing, folded in on itself as if devouring Jag. She got up and ran, staggering worse than ever through the doorway by which Jag had entered. She's entering the bow hangar bay for long-term vehicle storage, Wedge said. Han, sitting at another viewing station, nodded. He switched from the view of the storage bay to one of the hangar bay. They could both see Alima running, looking between vehicles as if seeking one in which she could escape. She's not messing with the holocams anymore, he said. I bet it costs too much energy or concentration. Wedge focused on his own view which showed the folded wall of crates into which Jag had disappeared. Jag, do you read me? His response was a series of words Wedge didn't understand, but they sounded like they were designed to peel rust off Durasteel. Sounds like Chiss, Han said. He activated his comlink again. Target is now entering the hangar bay for stateroom patrons. Leia was the first of the pursuers to reach the hangar bay used by the errant venture customers who had rented compartments for more than a day. The main doors in the floor were open, and a shabby YV-666 light freighter was sinking through them into space. Alima Rar was in the cockpit. Leia exchanged looks, promising mayhem or death with her for a second, and then the transport was out of sight. Han... Why didn't you seal those doors? Han's voice was anguished. I tried. I couldn't. The GA military has a program override that prevents errant venture or other facilities from locking in military spacecraft. If there's one lousy T-16 skyhopper aboard that belongs to the armed forces, those doors stay open. Leia could hear Wedge's voice in the background. 
How did she slice the access codes to a transport so fast? She stole my ship! Levint clamped her head between her hands as if trying to prevent an explosion. She spun around as if seeking some corner of her small stateroom where she could find refuge from the truth. My ship! Han glanced at Leia and shrugged. Actually, she's taking it better than I expected. Leia awkwardly patted the captain's shoulder. I know you must have loved your ship. Levint was abruptly still. Actually, I hated her. But she was still worth something. She shrugged. Oh, well. I have another one coming. Speaking of what you have coming... Han produced a data card and held it before her. She reached for it, but he kept it out of her grasp. And now she eyed him suspiciously. What is it? The location of the Confederation meeting you told me about, Han said. Place and time. Levint's eyes gleamed. So give it over. I met the terms of our contract. Leia shook her head. "'smiling with just a little bit of malice. "'That was no contract. "'You made requests, remember? "'True. "'Levint didn't look too disappointed. "'But you obtained and brought the information, "'so it must be on the table.' "'It is,' Han said. "'But among other things, "'we want to know what it's for.' It cost me a lot of favors to get. Oh. Levint considered, and looked between them. I'm going to give it to a man. For a ship, and to clear me out of his life. Out of his consideration. Is he likely to turn it over to the Galactic Alliance government? Leia asked. Levint nodded instantly. I'd put the likelihood at about one hundred percent. Leia said, I don't think we can... But Han handed Levint the card. Leia finished smoothly. Protest too much after all the help you gave us? She shot Han a bewildered look. Are we done here? I think so. Han gave Levint a professional, pleasant smile and led Leia to the door. Try to stay out of trouble. Soon. Soon, Levint said. Nice meeting you at last. Out in the corridor, Leia said, All right, I'm completely confused. As much as you've supported the Corellian cause, why have I suddenly turned traitor? Han finished. Sweetheart, I didn't have as much trouble as I should have in getting that information. Which means one of two things. Either security's not what it should be for that meeting, meaning the Galactic Alliance will have it soon anyway, meaning all I've done is to give her a couple of days' head start in getting the information to them, or there's a lot of disinformation out there meaning that everybody who gets deep enough is getting a different wrong answer. If it's the first one, then Levint gets her reward from her government contact. No loss to me or to Corellia. If it's the second one, Levint and her government contact will wander into a trap. Probably a Dur Gedjin trap set for us. Leia nodded. You know... If you could apply that smuggler's brain to real politics, you'd be my equal. Meaning I wouldn't be able to just draw my blaster and fire at the politicians? What kind of a deal is that? Chapter 19 Zeost This set of ruins was no heap of rubble, which was good since Ben wasn't sure he could reach the next place on the map. He had been three days without food. Kiara won. 
Shaker was down to draining energy from the various batteries Ben had brought from Fascus's camp. Of them he retained only a partial charge in the primary blaster pistol. The data pads didn't count. Their batteries didn't contain enough energy to permit an R2 unit to walk four steps. But this set of ruins... It clustered high on a mountain ridge, built just below a cliffside hundreds of meters tall. The cliff looked like a portion of the mountain had been sliced away by a giant lightsaber millions of years in the past, leaving the stone to weather until some species decided to build a citadel here. Not some species. The original Sith species. The citadel was made of black and mottled gray stone, and looked large enough to house a thousand people. But no one lived there now, Ben thought. Not that he could be sure. He detected little flickers of life through the Force. But those impressions were always washed away by the flow of dark side energy that emanated from the place. Like the planet itself, the Citadel was suffused in such energy. But more so. Still, the voices were pleased that he was here. He heard them even when he was awake now. And when he dreamed... They taught him how to fly the eye-shaped craft they had shown him. Desire, focused the right way, would cause the craft to lift off, to fly. Anger would direct its weaponry, weapons he didn't understand and could not quite visualize. And he could reach out through it, make contact with his ships, direct them on their missions of Ben! Ben! He was tired of the voices, and didn't know why they even bothered to speak his name, since they had his attention all the time now. Then he realized it wasn't the voices. It was Kiara. He looked down at her and frowned. What? She took an involuntary step away. You're that way again. What way? Scary. He considered his answer. I have to be this way sometimes. It's how I'm learning. He imagined Jason saying it to him, back when he was just learning the ways of the Force, back when the Force had frightened him. Wait a minute. How can she tell? And what is she feeling? He tried to clear his thoughts, something that he hadn't really been able to do well since he had gotten hungry and stayed that way. Because she walked behind him, she had to be sensing something in the change of his body language. Either that, or she was sensing something through the Force. Perhaps she was Force-sensitive. And if that was the case, then she was probably being spooked by manifestations of the dark side. In him. Again he shoved away notions of dark side and light side. It was all in what one did with the power. And yet, since he'd been here, he'd been surrounded by an insinuating malevolence that didn't come from anything alive. It was energy that had been shaped and left here by hundreds of generations of Sith and followers. And if the energy had definite shape, even when not being generated by the living, was that not the dark side? He took a deep breath and tried to push the voices away, to cleanse his thoughts. Gradually he did so, and felt a lightening of spirit. Silence came to his ears, broken only by the occasional rustle of wind through the dead branches behind them, by Kiara's breathing, by the tiny whine of servos within Shaker. Finally, he looked at Kiara again. Better? She nodded, pleased. Better. Coruscant, Senate Building, Admiral Neothel's office. Neothel answered the beep with a gravelly command. Come in! Jason Solo entered, dressed in his immaculate black guard uniform and a flowing black cloak. He gave her a crisp salute. Admiral. Neothel returned it. Sit. Hurry! I have a meeting in thirty minutes. Jason sat. Galatter. 
I don't understand. Probably because I hurried. Gilatter 8 is where the Confederation meeting is going to take place. The election of your counterpart, their supreme military commander, and the launch point of their next fleet action. Neothel sat up straighter. Intelligence has been working on this all this time. And you come up with an answer first? I have sources distinct from intelligences. Such as your parents? Neothel didn't miss the slight frown that crossed Jason's features. My parents had nothing to do with obtaining this information. It's from another smuggling resource I've been cultivating for months. Interesting. Especially in light of the fact that intelligence has offered independent verification of the information about the election being followed by a raid. A shipyard raid. Jason nodded. That's what my source says, too. Promising. When? Two weeks. Actually, thirteen standard days, nearly exactly. Neothel made an exasperated noise. It will take that long at least to put together a coordinated response. We are going to rush into our counterplan and get good people killed as a consequence. If I may. Jason drew a data card from a pocket and set it on the desk before Neothel. I've taken the liberty of putting together a proposal. For a response you would probably consider uncoordinated, but it would get forces there fast and possibly undetected, and I doubt our equally uncoordinated enemy will anticipate it. Neothel gave him a dubious look and inserted the card in her desk slot. Jason's plan was simple and unconventional. Galater was an undistinguished mid-rim star not far from Ancian. Not one of its worlds was habitable for most of the galaxy's sapient species. The planet Galater 8 was a gas giant, a world whose surface was a beautiful, glowing swirl of mottled reds, oranges, and yellows. At one point in the distant past, it had been a favorite vacation spot for the Old Republic, circled by a ring of resort satellites, from which patrons could marvel at its natural beauty. But tastes changed, and the brief era in which planetary artistic appreciation could serve as the be-all and end-all of a wealthy family's vacation ended, and with it the years of usefulness of the Galater system. The last resort satellite had gone out of business a century and a half ago, and Jason's estimation was that the resort would probably be the site of the meeting to come. Step one of his plan was to send Jedi-piloted Stealth X snub fighters into the system, giving the Alliance military information about the Confederation forces already there, particularly sensor platforms. Step two involved bringing in forces selected from fleets and task forces already in that area of the galaxy, choosing them carefully to keep any one unit from losing too much strength and defeating the ability of spies and analysts to determine where those reassigned craft were going. Step three had the Jedi observers directing Alliance forces into the system, avoiding sensor observation or scouting patrols, and setting them up within the atmosphere of Gilader 8. The glowing, radiant atmosphere was so thin at its upper reaches, barely denser than empty space in a standard solar system, that vehicles and vessels of all varieties could be stationed there. Such a world tended to emit higher levels of electromagnetic radiation, making communication between vehicles more difficult, but also making detection more difficult. Step three would continue until the mission commander concluded that it was no longer possible to sneak forces into the atmosphere of Galater 8. And even then, larger capital ships could muster at a point outside the system and be ready to jump in. In step four the Stealth X observers would signal when the meeting had begun, and all the Alliance forces would move in against the Confederation forces. Neothel and her analysts evaluated Jason's plan 
and, over the span of a day, considered and discarded several others. Eventually, they settled on Jason's. It would have to be modified and detailed, but it would serve as a template. At their next meeting, Neothel informed Jason of her decision, and said, I will lead this mission myself. He nodded, apparently pleased. I also want to be there. With the Anakin Solo? Yes. Good. Consider it authorized. My opinion doesn't count much with my uncle these days, Jason admitted. To get Jedi involvement, you probably ought not to mention my role in this. I'll have Jedi involvement. All it takes is issuing an order. Jason smiled. I meant to get wholehearted Jedi involvement. Yes, of course. As he emerged from the Senate building, Jason felt a familiar presence. He did not react visibly, as the tall woman wrapped in anonymous garments, her lower face shrouded by a scarf, fell into step beside him. How are you? he asked. Well, Lumia answered, fully healed. Interested in going on an expedition? I sensed that you were moving into a troubled period, into much danger. That's why I came. I'll take that as a yes. Jason changed the subject. Any news of Ben? No. His monitors have temporarily lost track of him. A note of worry entered her voice. He may not have survived. I think I would have felt it if he had died. Perhaps not. Where he is? Jason didn't ask. I have faith in him. Clearly so, she said. Zeost. The last kilometer of the climb up to the citadel was comparatively easy. The roadway, made of dressed black stone slabs that were cracked here and there, but otherwise seemed little worn by the passage of time, wheels, or feet, allowed Shaker comparatively quick passage. But the little droid began to slow again, two hundred meters from the tumble of rock that apparently marked the citadel's main entrance, and came to a complete stop a hundred meters from it. Ben felt like stopping, too. He shook from cold and hunger. He returned slowly to Shaker's side, noting that the droid's lights were still functioning. He pulled out his data pad. What's wrong, little guy? I lack sufficient power to move farther. Ben thought about sighing, but didn't want to expend the energy. Shaker was running on a charge absorbed from the last blaster's power pack. If Ben wanted to give the droid more time, he'd have to sacrifice the power pack from his lightsaber. How long can you stay awake on the charge you have if you don't move? Perhaps twelve hours. All right. Shut down now. I'll wake you up when I've found a power source. The droid gave an obliging beep sequence, and its lights went off. Ben turned back toward Kiara swaying from sudden dizziness. And the gray-furred neck leapt at him. The rampway leading to the citadel was raised, and the creature must have been paralleling their path from just past the drop-off. Ben's reflexes, dulled by lack of food and sleep, would have let him down, would have allowed him to become the next next meal, but he wasn't standing in the open. He pushed away from Shaker staggering back into Kiara and tripping over her. And the neck missed. It landed gracefully and turned. Ben rose on shaky legs and ignited his lightsaber. The neck regarded him, head down, obviously considering whether to attack, then charged away, disappearing over the far lip of the walkway. They're going to eat us, Kiara said. 
Ben switched off his lightsaber. No, they're not. I'm not scared anymore. It was clear to him that she was. But he knew she had said it to reassure him that it wouldn't be so bad. That he wouldn't be failing her. If one swallows you, I'll jump down his throat and we'll cut our way out together. He promised her. What if it chews? This time he did sigh. You're too logical. It took them the better part of four hours to climb to the top of the rubble heap that blocked the main entrance into the citadel. From the top, Ben could see the trench-like gap between portions of outer wall that had not fallen and the high, more intact inner wall of the citadel itself. He could see gray-blue skies and white-capped forests stretching to the horizon. It was all so beautiful that he wanted to stay forever. And it occurred to him that if he killed and ate the little girl, he'd recover his strength swiftly. Maybe he'd even cook her first. But she was looking at him when the thought came, and the way she slowly drew away from him reminded him that the thought was not his own. He forced it away and gave her a little smile, a genuine Ben smile. The stone doors beyond the rock pile were down, and it took far less time to descend into the outermost great chamber of the citadel. The only lights available to him were little streaks of sunlight entering by windows near the ceiling. They let him see that there were no furnishings left in this chamber, not even moldy, tattered remnants. It had been stripped of goods long ago. All that remained were entryways into black hallways and curved stone staircases going up or down. He desperately wanted to descend. He knew the eyeball-shaped ship was somewhere below, hidden, waiting for him, calling to him. But he had no strength, and he knew that if he were to become the ship's master, he would have to conquer it. We'll camp here, he told Kiara. She looked around dubiously, but said nothing. Ben slept, and dreamed that in the darkest hour of the night something detached itself from the ceiling far above. It looked like three giant balls, the center one slightly larger and attached to the other two by pivots. A cluster of five legs emerged from each end ball and they worked together to allow the thing to walk slowly down the wall. In his dream, he said, Go away. No. This is my home now. Your kind is gone. I shall eat you. I'll kill you. It paused halfway down the wall. Give me the little piece of meat. I will leave you alone. I'll kill you. It began its descent again. Outside, Ben said, there are necks, hunting me. I couldn't bring myself to eat the first one. Now I wish I had. But you can. Go outside and hunt the necks. They'll be close. The thing stopped again and waited a full minute. Then it changed course, moving toward the top of the rock pile. Rocks tumbled down the pile as it squeezed through the opening. In his dream, Ben thought he heard Nex howling. Eat, girl! Grow strong! The voices faded as Ben awoke. Hurriedly, he glanced around. Kiara, looking pale, her features sharpening from strain and starvation, was still asleep next to him. The ceiling was better illuminated. Around its edges there were many odd shapes, curved balconies, broken statuary, other forms he couldn't identify. He wondered if any of them might become the thing he had seen in his dream. He prodded Kiara awake. Come on, we have work to do. Are we going to wake Shaker up? 
I hope so. As his last act of preparation, Ben reconnected the tracer's severed antenna leg to its main body, then hung the pouch loop around the dummy he'd constructed. It wasn't much of a dummy, just a carefully built pile of stone with red blankets draped around it. But perhaps it would do. It was situated at a spot where the outer walls still stood, and the base of the inner wall was littered with stones that had fallen from the high reaches. The pouch hung from its neck. Kiara following, Ben retreated past the shriveled, frozen neck body they had discovered upon emerging that morning. They found a spot concealed between two courses of dressed stone, and they waited. Ben was as alert as his starvation-induced lack of focus would allow him to be. Time passed. In the stillness, Ben began to hear the voices again. Eat, girl. Grow strong. You used to want me to protect her. Ben had thought his words inaudible, but Kiara spoke up. Who are you talking to? No one. Eat, girl. Why were the voices different now? That was a puzzle, and Jason had always said that puzzles should always be solved because then they became information that could be used. He tried to look at the voice's suggestion rationally. It made sense on a purely logical level. If he killed, cooked, and ate Kiara, he would have several days' worth of food. His mind tried to veer away from that line of thought. Cannibalism had almost always been discussed in his presence in cautionary tales of stranded crash survivors and people driven mad, but he forced himself to consider the matter. Eat, girl. Grow strong. If he did kill and eat her, he'd never be caught, never be punished. Even if he confessed to Jason, his mentor would analyze the data and determine that it was the correct survival choice. In fact, just about every logical argument Ben could come up with suggested that eating Kiara was the most appropriate action. The plan Ben had just set into motion might not work. It might take days to complete. He could be dead before then. Every logical argument. Ben frowned. But not all arguments had to be logical. Kiara was a little girl, and one who had just lost her father her daddy. Never mind that her daddy seemed to have been a small-time criminal, and the odds, supported by files of data Ben had seen on the guard computers, were that Kiara would grow up to be a small-time criminal, or another type of drain on society. She might grow up to invent a medicine better than Bacta, or to write songs, or act in holodramas that made things better for people. Or she might have children who did these things, or teach children to do these things. But not if she died now. He wasn't even sure he liked her. They hadn't had energy enough to talk very often on their long walk. But he felt bad for her. He felt protective of her. He felt. And it seemed to him that neither thinking nor feeling needed to be the boss of the other. In a Jedi, they should be mixed. Partners. He wondered if that was the case with guards as well. None of that answered the question of why the voices had started by suggesting that he protect Kiara, and now insisted that he eat her. But the answer, a possible answer anyway, came to him. They had told him to protect her because that's what he had decided to do. And he hadn't known how. In suggesting that they could get Ben and Kiara off this planet alive, they had made Ben listen to them. He had begun to understand them, and then had begun to think the way they thought. And now they could suggest different things. They could suggest what they'd wanted all along. He felt a burst of anger, but clamped down on it. 
He didn't have the energy to be angry right now. He noticed that the voices had grown quiet. And in that quietness, Ben told Kiara the story of a young Force-sensitive slave boy who won a pod race on Tatooine and earned his freedom. Did they feed him when he won? Kiara asked. All he could eat. And even more, Ben assured her. Not long afterward, Ben sensed the eye in the sky. He looked up into the clouds and pulled his all-weather cloak even tighter around them. Is he there? Yes, he is. This pilot was not subtle. He sent the TIE fighter into a screaming dive that ended up with the vehicle a mere twenty meters above the ground. Then he had to slow and circle, because Ben's dummy was not visible from the open spaces around the citadel. He had to climb and then drop into the gap between outer and inner wall. And then he lined his lasers up on Ben's dummy. Now, through the force, Ben exerted himself against the stones at the top of the inner wall, all along the course of wall above the starfighter. It was hard going. He felt so tired, and it was almost impossible to focus. But an understanding that this might be the difference between life and death, from cold or starvation or mummification, drove him, and he saw the stones high above begin to rock and then fall free. The TIE fighter fired, and Ben's dummy fell over, the blankets catching on fire. The TIE fighter glided forward slowly on repulsors. Ben knew why. The bolt from a laser cannon hitting a human being wouldn't necessarily destroy his body completely, but it would turn so much of the body to steam that the victim would seem to explode. It wouldn't simply fall over. The pilot had to be curious about what had just happened. The TIE fighter was a mere five meters from the burning dummy when the first stone, no larger than a human head, hit its hull. To his credit, the pilot reacted instantly, veering away and climbing, straight into the thickest portion of falling stone. The rocks had fallen more than a hundred meters. Some weighed a quarter ton or more. All had sharp right-angled edges, and some of them hit edge first. The TIE fighter spun wildly out of control, hit the citadel's inner wall, and bounced off again. The twin ion engines were still firing, but the starfighter was spinning so fast that they nearly added to the energy of its spiral. It landed beyond the outer wall, its hull collapsing on impact, and continued to roll, shearing off its solar array wings as it did. It rolled half a kilometer before coming to a stop against a natural rock abutment. Ben rose and immediately felt lightheaded but drew on the force to strengthen and stabilize himself. He helped Kiara up. We have to hurry, he said. More fighters may be coming. Ben told Kiara to climb a tree while he examined the wreckage. When he saw what was left of the pilot, a pale-skinned chief in a bronze uniform, he was glad he had. It didn't take him long to pry open the hatch into the starfighter's small cargo bay, its contents had broken free of the cloth webbing that had restrained them, but were otherwise intact. Two days' worth of rations for a grown man, a medical kit, power packs, a long-range comlink, a self-inflating raft, water purification tablets. He took it all, and scavenged other goods from the chief's body. Then, as fast as they could manage, he and Kiara ran from the site of the crash and back toward the dubious safety of the citadel. It didn't occur to Ben to be sorry about the being whose life he had just taken. Coruscant Errant Venture Ali Marar just calmed me. Leia stared incredulously into her display, but Levent seemed earnest enough. What did she want? 
You two, of course. And what did you tell her? I said you were going to be at Galater 8 in a few days. The way I figure it, she'll go there and get herself blown to pieces. A shame about the YV-666, I guess. Well, you didn't lie, Leia said. That's exactly where we're going to be. We are, said Han. You are? On the display, Levint's jaw skewed to one side. An exaggerated expression of dismay. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Not to worry, Leia said. I didn't decide until just now. It's not enough to be told that someone like Alima Rar has been blown to bits. I really need to see it myself. Or even pull the trigger, Han muttered. Galater System Resort Station Orbiting Galater 8 From the distance of several hundred kilometers, Luke watched the activity at the station. He employed passive sensors only, including a holocam utilizing high-grade visual amplification hardware, and knew that Mara, floating less than a hundred meters away in her own stealth X, was doing the same. Half a dozen vehicles were docked at the station. The crews inside were presumably effecting repairs and making the antiquated station ready for the ceremony that would soon take place. Luke, Mara, and their fellow pilots, including Corin, Kip, Jaina, and Zek, plus Jag, finally getting some shift time in Jaina's stealth X, had scouted out the system pretty thoroughly. There were indeed droid sensor satellites along the standard approaches into the system, but none situated elsewhere and there were routes to which the sensor array was blind from outside the system to the far side of Galater 8. The Jedi had already led several ships from the Ninth Fleet to orbits within the outer atmosphere of Galater 8. Another vessel they had guided into place was Admiral Neothel's temporary flagship, the aged but still mighty Mon Calamari cruiser Galactic Voyager. Luke shook his head over that choice. Was Neothel simply making use of an available resource? Or, recalling that the Voyager had once been the flagship of Admiral Akbar, was she trading on the revered strategist's name to promote herself? Luke didn't know. But thinking about that was much better than wondering about Ben. Zeost. Ben and Kiara rested the remainder of the day and from the top of the rock pile just inside the citadel entrance, they watched the shuttle. It descended from the clouds less than fifteen minutes after Ben, Kiara, and the revitalized Shaker reached the entrance. It was an old shuttle, with fold-up wings and a bronze paint job, and it did not land. It circled the crash site endlessly, then took off for the skies once more. Ben was curious about that. Were the crew members afraid to touch down on Zeost? That actually made sense. Hungry as they were, Ben insisted that they eat no more than half the rations they had scavenged from the TIE Fighter. The rest they could eat over the next three or four days. Perhaps by then they'd be able to find more food, or find their way off-planet. They slept well that night, with Shaker keeping its sensors alert for nocturnal movement. But there was none. In the morning, glow rods attached to new power packs, they went searching. It didn't take long. All Ben had to do was open himself up to the voices. They led him down several levels, to where the corridor floors were coated in ancient muck, to a long side shaft that carried them well away from the citadel proper. It led them to an unlit circular chamber. Its walls were decorated with eighteen niches, each large enough to hold a life-sized statue of an average human, but all empty. It's gone, Kiara said. Ben shook his head. The images in his head were clear. The ship was here. Come out, he said. He heard laughter. Kiara seemed to sense it too. 
she drew back to stand next to Shaker and stared all around, looking for the source. Ben frowned. His instincts, and what the voices had whispered to him when he only half understood their words, told him that emotion was the key. Nor would kind, soft, welcoming emotion do. He deepened his voice, put some anger into it. Come out! Had he tried it the day before, when he'd been at his weakest from lack of food, he doubtless would have failed. But now there was a rumble in the ground, and a crack appeared in the half-dried muck of the floor, a crack as straight as a laser beam bisecting the room. Shaker, whose legs straddled the crack, gave a tweedle of alarm and quickly moved to one side. Kiara joined him. The gap widened more quickly at the room's center than toward the edges. There it became circular, and up from it, inadequately illuminated by Ben's glow rod, came a segmented metal arm several meters long, and then the top portions of a vehicle's spherical main body. Its circular central viewport, lit from behind and glowing an unhealthy yellow, seemed to be an eye regarding them. The sphere was some ten meters in diameter, half of it protruding above floor level. A gap of three meters separated the edge of the floor from the nearest portion of vehicle hall. Ben swayed, both from weakness and relief. The vehicle was here. It was real. And if the presence he felt within it, a malevolent set of emotions detectable through the force, was any indication— it was functional, even after centuries in the ground. Open, he commanded. After a moment, a vertical line appeared beneath the viewport and lowered as a hatch, its near end just reaching the edge of the floor. Ben bounded across and up into the vehicle. But if he'd anticipated finding a control couch, a pilot's yoke, hyperspace and weapons controls— he was disappointed. The interior, which could have occupied only a fraction of the vehicle's volume, was a single disc-shaped chamber, four meters across and two and a half high. The corridor channel leading to the ramp was the only exit. The walls looked like orange pumice, glowing as though they were thin sheets over molten lava, and the vehicle's interior was very warm. When he got to the center of the disc-shaped chamber— Ben turned around and around, looking for the controls, but he found nothing. And now even the voices were gone. In their place was a powerful expectation, a sense of waiting. Ben closed his eyes and tried to get a sense of this place, this vehicle. And he did. For a moment he saw a red-skinned woman in robes of volcanic hues kneeling, her golden pole arm on the floor beside her. That was it, then. The pilot had to communicate with the vehicle through the Force. Quickly he knelt where the woman in his vision had been. Command! The voice, male, rich in expectant malice, spoke directly into his mind. Ben looked down the ramp and beckoned for Kiara and Shaker. Time to go! The little girl shook her head. The astromech tweedled at her. Kiara, we have to leave. I don't want to go in that thing, she wailed. It's going to eat me. Ben shot her a reassuring grin. And if it does? She took a moment to answer. You'll jump down its throat, and we'll cut our way out together. That's right. Still reluctant, she came forward, tentatively took her first step onto the ramp, and ran up into the room. She flopped down to sit beside him. A moment later, Shaker rolled into place on his other side and locked its wheels. Close, Ben commanded, and the ramp lifted. Now was the part he wasn't sure of. Launch, he said. For long moments, nothing happened. 
and Ben wondered how many words he would have to go through before he found the correct command. But apparently intent was enough. Intent and visualizing what he wanted to happen. The light outside the vehicle brightened. Suddenly, blinding white, it reached all the way to the niches in the walls. Ben looked up, seeing only the ceiling above him. Then he closed his eyes again and attempted to see as the vehicle saw. And he did. The ceiling above the vehicle had drawn aside in two pieces, and sunlight shone down into the chamber. The vehicle began to tremble like a wild animal preparing to spring. Get ready, Ben said. I think it's going to— The vessel accelerated straight upward, its movement pressing Ben and Kiara down onto the floor. Chapter 20 Galater System Approaching Galater 8 Orbit The greatest reward came from the greatest risks, Jason had said, and Lumia had agreed with him. So long as you accurately assess the reward and the risks, she'd added. And then she had volunteered to accompany him on this expedition to infiltrate the Confederation election ceremony. Setting it up had been easy enough. It had been Galactic Alliance Intelligence that had discovered there would be representatives of the Hapes Consortium Heritage Council, the conspiracy that had collaborated with Corellia to kill Tenel Ka at the meeting, and Admiral Neothel had been the first to propose that authenticated independence groups, even from worlds most devoted to the Galactic Alliance, might find admission. It hadn't been too much work for Jason to persuade Neothel that he be the Galactic Alliance agent assigned to attend the meeting. His status as the Jedi with the closest ties to the military ensured him that right. Manipulating things so that Lumia could accompany him had been trickier. But she admitted to maintaining a number of fully detailed false identities that would withstand scrutiny from either side's intelligence division. And one of them, that of smuggler Silphinia L., had a registered world of birth that would fit the profile GA intelligence needed. So Jason had arranged for documents for himself and Silphinia from the Ession government. And now, his features heavily disguised under dark spray-on skin color and a beard, he carried an identicard showing him to be a member of Ession's most violent revolutionary party. Working through Captain Levint and her mysterious contacts, he had been able to wrangle an admission to the ceremony. But not a vote. That was fine. He wasn't there to vote. He was there to note faces, identify traitors— and distract everyone present, perhaps by killing them all, when the battle began. And Lumia was beside him, acting as backup in case of trouble. Her scarred features concealed under her expertly applied makeup, she now had dark skin and hair like his. Jason guided the ugly disc-shaped shuttle of Corellian make into the approach vector the stern voice on the comm board had assigned to him, Quite a force, he said. Through the viewport and on the main sensor display, he could see Bothan assault cruisers, Corellian cruisers and frigates, an Imperial-class star destroyer, numerous other capital ships, and shuttles. There was a lot of shuttle traffic to the station, which resembled a dome-shaped manual fruit juicer resting on a plate, but a kilometer across. And it's ready for action. Lumia said. Can you feel it in the force? The readiness of the crews and officers? They want blood. That suggests they'll be going after the closest of the likely targets. Coruscant herself. Though Kuat's not that much farther. The shuttle shook as if fired upon. Hey. He'd had no advance warning through the force of an imminent attack. Tractor beam, he said. Their security people obviously like to be in complete control, Lumia answered. In minutes, the shuttle was drawn to an external docking station, 
and Lumia was proved correct. When the station side hatch opened, personnel in Corsac uniforms boarded, with their commander stating, Give your vehicle access codes to Sergeant Meeser. He'll take your craft to the designated retrieval zone. Her voice low and amused, Lumia asked, Will he expect a tip? The officer blinked. Regulations of the meeting prohibit any vehicle from remaining within ten kilometers of the station, he answered. Then he realized he hadn't addressed her question. No tip is necessary. He couldn't accept one if you offered it. Pity. She swept out through the open hatch. Jason gave his code to the temporary pilot, then followed Lumia. He found her being greeted by a white-furred Bothan of decidedly friendlier disposition than the Corsac agents. Sylphinia L., she said, as she allowed the Bothan to squeeze her hand. Ession Freedom Front, and my nephew, Najak L. The Bothan blinked, clearly never having heard of either the Front or the L family. Delighted, he answered. He reluctantly shook Jason's hand in turn. Brave to Dolish, one of your hosts. When does the voting begin? Jason asked. We haven't received a schedule of events. Very funny. The Bothan waved to the far door out of the antiseptically white and clean room they had entered. This was once a decontamination chamber. It is, sadly, almost immune to decoration. But beyond that door, you'll find far more congenial surroundings. Food, drink, good company. Like-minded company. I could use some of that, Jason said, and heard Lumia stifle a laugh. From this shallow depth within the atmosphere of Galater 8, the crews of the Alliance Force had a decent view of the distant space station and the stars beyond. The atmosphere made the stars twinkle just a little, and made their view slightly hazy. That was all. Type beam transmission from Stealth 1, Neophil's aide told her on the bridge of the Galactic Voyager. A hut light cruiser arriving. But that's the only capital ship in the last half hour. The rate of major arrivals has dropped nearly to zero. Neothel, sitting in her multiply articulated swivel command chair, grimaced. The odds were now just the wrong side of even, which would be problematic in a straight-up fight. Fortunately, the Alliance had the advantage of surprise. Very well, she said her words merely acknowledging that she'd heard her aide's report. Any major players still missing? No, ma'am. Neofel raised her voice so that it could be heard across the entire bridge. Issue the order to the fleet. All ahead, slow. The outlying vessels are not to jump until they receive a direct command. Jason and Lumia separated once inside, the better to acquire information across a broader area. The main chamber of the resort, the dome above recently cleaned to provide an unobstructed view of Galater 8, was laid out with long tables full of food and drink. Delegates wandered from one to the next, or from one small standing group to the next. There was no urgency or animosity to be seen among them. That was curious. As critical as the election of a Supreme War Commander should be, Jason had anticipated more anxiety and more notoriety among the attendees. So far, he hadn't recognized a single face. Jason accepted a drink from a server, a tall, fair-haired woman in a white gown that looked like it dated to the late Old Republic, but was probably just an in-vogue dress on some backwater world. So, where's the coordinator? he asked, making the question sound innocuous. 
I don't know, sir. Any idea when opening arguments are supposed to begin? The server reached up to tug at her earlobe. Just a nervous gesture. Except Jason could feel the lie in the casual nature of her movement. I don't know that either. Perhaps they've broadcast the schedule to everyone's data pad? What did you just do? Jason asked. The woman's nervousness increased by a factor of ten or more. I answered your quest. No. He leaned in close, intimidating. When you touched your ear, tell me, or I'll be forced to kill you. She looked right and left, as if seeking an avenue of escape, or an observer. Please, she said. We're supposed to. If anyone asks questions... You sent a signal. Yes. Jason wheeled and walked quickly back toward the door by which they'd entered the big chamber. Through the force, he reached out to Lumia. A warning. Gentle beings! The voice was so loud, broadcast from on high, that Jason was compelled to look. Toward the center of the great chamber, a hologram was forming. Six meters high, it showed a male human in a white admiral's uniform, the cut and styling more suited to the Palpatine-era empire than to modern military forces. The man was trim, with high cheekbones and fair hair cut into a military style. A scar, livid even in the hologram, started on his upper left lip and crossed straight down to the lower lip. To Jason, he looked rather a lot like General Tycho Selchu, but lacked that officer's warmth. If you'll turn your attention to the sky, the Admiral continued, you'll witness the forces of the Galactic Alliance emerging from the planet's atmosphere. This will be visible as a series of bright flashes as they begin to hit our mind grid. Closer to us, I'd like to introduce you to a distinguished visitor. A spotlight from high above blared right into Jason's eyes. He twisted away, knowing he was framed by its glow, and turned to glare at the hologram. The hologram continued, If our specialists are worth what we're paying them— you may raise a glass to Colonel Jason Solo, Galactic Alliance Guard. Some of you Corellians may have lost relatives and friends to this man's many recent activities. Jason heard a murmur of anger from some in the crowd, but most reacted only with curiosity. A few moved away from him a few steps— Others sipped their drinks, unconcerned. We haven't been introduced, Jason said, projecting his voice. The giant hologram nodded. General Tur Fenner, Supreme Commander of the Confederation Military, at your service. I thought that today would be the day that office was elected. Fenner shook his head as if saddened by Jason's credulity. A deception I thought would be useful in drawing your forces in. And your presence here is another benefit, an unexpected one. I know you're going to attempt to fight your way out. But I must ask, please don't kill the delegates. They're only actors. Behind Jason came the sound of running feet. The security agents. They, he was sure, were real. Yes, he'd fight his way out. But he had something to do first. He gestured upward, toward Galater 8, and put his whole heart into two thoughts. It's a trap. 
minds. It's a trap, Luke shouted into his comlink. He's visualizing minds. I say again, minds. Acknowledged, Stealth One, came the voice of the Voyager's comm officer. Be advised, with that transmission, your position is compromised. No kidding. Stealth One out. Luke switched his comm board over to squadron frequency. What now? Mara asked. We go in, Luke said. He could hear the reluctance in his own voice. And rescue Jason. Over the X-Wing's intercom, R2-D2, directly behind Luke, offered a melancholy trill. Every officer on the Galactic Voyager Bridge waited for the order to come. The order to take a new heading to circumnavigate the mine grid ahead of them. That's not what they got. Continue all ahead slow, Neofel ordered. All forward gun positions of all lead vessels open up in a sweep pattern directly forward. Second-tier capital ships and starfighters still in formation drop in behind the capital ships. The order is given for Anakin Solo and all outlying vessels to jump. There was the briefest delay, and then the bridge crew turned to its new tasks. Galactic Voyager's commander, a Quarren named Squin, edged toward Neofel. His face tentacles were motionless with forced calm, but a question burned in his eyes. Neofel answered it. She had to speak more loudly as Voyager's weapons batteries began firing. If we hadn't gotten Solo's warning, Captain, what would have happened? We would have advanced into the minefield. Until? Until our forward ships began hitting the mines. And then? Understanding dawned in the Quarren's expression. We would have set a new course, a lateral course, into more mines that have been maneuvered into place while we were waiting here. Neofel nodded. Mines we couldn't detect because of the thicker atmosphere around and below us. Mines that would continue to close on us. This way we are going to be hammered but with the fewest number of hammers they currently have to swing against us. Understood. Captain Squin edged away again. It's a trap, Leia said, though Jason's force-based warning had not been intended for her, she could not have missed it. Not a panicky emotion from her own son. She leaned forward in the co-pilot's seat of the Falcon but the only thing visible from the Galater system was its yellow star straight ahead, distant and tiny. Han? Did you hear me? I did. Han's face was, for once, a mask of indecision. We have to go in and get him, she said. The words hurt. Her anger at Jason's actions had not abated. She didn't trust him. But he was her son. She had to save him. We're waiting for news about Alima, Han said. But there was pain in his voice, too. His protest sounded weak. Go, Han. Yeah. He hit the thrusters. The Falcon was already oriented straight toward Galater 8. All they had to do was engage the hyperdrive. Lando rose from the navigator seat behind them. Not that I'm part of this conversation, but I suspect I should operate one of the laser turrets, right? Receiving no answer, he sighed and headed back to the turret access tubes, his cloak swirling behind him. The Turfener hologram had appeared so close to Alima that she was initially partly within his right leg. She edged away, disappearing into the crowd. 
Getting to this meeting had been easier for her than for any other infiltrator, she thought. After all, memories of her presence faded from the minds of those she encountered mere minutes after she departed. That, and her Jedi skills, made it child's play for her to bypass guards, eavesdrop on conversations, and never stain the memories of those whose resources they used. Unless she wanted them to remember, like Captain Levint. Now she hoped she would not be noticed as she made her way from the main hall. She didn't think she would be. Jason Sola was doing too good a job of attracting everyone's attention. He stood alone, a semicircle of security guards from several different forces blocking his path, and as she watched, they opened fire. He leapt above the torrent of blaster shots, igniting his lightsaber as he rose, and came down behind his enemies. He spun, and two of them were suddenly headless. The rest fell back from him firing as they turned. All Alima had to do was flee from this disaster, join the throngs of actors now moving in panicky retreat toward the shuttle access chambers. Then she felt her quarry. Leia was nearby, sending reassurance through the Force. To Jason. It had to be to Jason. That message certainly wasn't meant for her. But now she couldn't leave. She had to wait to see if Han was with Leia. Veering from her escape path, she made her way to a wall and merged with the shadows there. Zeost Here, too, the Rodian jabbered at Dürer aboard the Boneyard Rendezvous, this time clearly surprised. Launch condition! Dürer brought up the sensor display. It showed an incoming spacecraft, its point of origin just a few hundred meters from where the chief, Avit, had died. He found a way off, he said. Smart kid. By the way, battle stations. Everything was so alien. Through the vehicle's skin, Ben could see the ground and stars. He could even recognize some of the stars— and he could see a blocky, awkward-looking freighter change its orbit to approach the point toward which he was rising. His heart sank. He couldn't possibly win an engagement in a vehicle he barely knew how to fly, one with either no weapon systems or systems older than most modern planetary governments. What are my weapons? he asked. They appeared in his mind's eye. The arm at the vehicle's bottom could curl around into a landing base, or could stay extended and direct a laser attack. The arm atop the vehicle could line up on opponents and fire metal balls at them. Cannon! He all but spat the word out. Physical cannon! To his surprise, the vehicle responded with indignation to his words. His mental view zoomed in on the top-mounted weapon. He watched as a metal ball the size of his head rolled, propelled by magnetics, from a hopper into the base of the articulated arm. And then it was gone, emerging from the far end of the arm as a blur, with no sound of propellants accompanying the action. He peered more closely, and the sequence ran again, more slowly in his mind. The ball was there, and the same magnetism that had rolled it into place accelerated it along the arm, building up speed with every centimeter it traveled until it left the end of the weapon. Magnetic Accelerator Ben had heard of such a thing. A verpine weapon, he thought, though that was a much smaller device. He'd never heard of one being built on a starfighter scale. And maybe his enemies hadn't either. His mental query told him he had less than a minute until he was close enough for those enemies to fire reliably upon him. A minute to practice. Dodge, he said, and the vehicle began a forward and back, left and right shimmy that nearly hurled Ben from his kneeling position. Kiara slid around on the floor, 
rough as it was, until she grabbed one of Shaker's legs to stabilize herself. It was frustrating not to have direct control of the vehicle, but also exhilarating just to issue orders and have them carried out. Ready top weapon, he said. As if it were part of his body, he could feel a metal ball maneuvered into place at the base of the weapon. He could also sense a growing impatience within the vehicle. It occurred to him, whether the thought originated with him or his craft, that he didn't need to say things out loud. The freighter opened fire. Ben could see flashes of light around him. Then pain crackled across his shoulders as one of those shots connected with the vehicle's upper hull. The shock of it almost caused him to lose concentration. But anger was his friend. Anger helped him keep his focus. Fire top weapon. The ball left the weapon, hurtling toward the freighter, and grazed its shields and hull, ricocheting harmlessly away. Too late, Ben realized that the ball was still an extension of the vehicle, an extension of himself. Even now, he could steer it a little, deflect its course. But he instinctively knew that turning it around and sending it back against the freighter would take too much of his energy. Ben's vehicle flashed past the freighter, and it turned to follow. It began turning well before they were past, in fact, keeping its bow and starboard side toward the Zeost vehicle. And Ben thought he saw something twisting and changing on the freighter's port side. He sensed his vehicle's desire to fire with its bottom weapon, to splash laser fire across the enemy. But Ben was focused more on what he'd seen. Turn around he thought. Dive toward Zeost. Come around the other side of the freighter. His vehicle inverted with the speed and turning radius of a modern starfighter and angled down to come up on the freighter's port side. The enemy commander sensed his intent, tried to turn to keep his bow and starboard side facing him, but the Zeost craft's speed and maneuverability were too great. When the angle was right, he could see that a large panel on the port side was locked open, with another TIE fighter there, ready to launch. Anger roared up inside Ben. Anger remembered from being strafed. Anger at what the other TIE had done to Kiara and her life, and a second ball left his top weapon before he realized he had launched it. The freighter was rolling now trying to bring its bottom hull into line to take or deflect the shot. But Ben applied himself through the force and saw the ball change its arc, rising to avoid the freighter's bottom, all but ignoring the shields, hurtling straight into the open hold, angling toward the stern. The ball emerged through the starboard side, carrying with it a debris cloud that had once been atmosphere and thruster components, the freighter's course and speed were unchecked. In punching through it, the ball had imparted little of its own kinetic energy to the target and seemed at first to have done no damage of consequence. But then the freighter rolled and began an immediate descent toward the atmosphere. Now Ben let his craft open fire with the laser. Red beams jittered their way across the freighter's top hull, putting just enough energy through the shields to scorch the paint and sever a comm antenna. Ben shook his head, ordering his craft to cease fire, and oriented himself toward space. He relaxed, sitting instead of kneeling. What happened? Kiara asked. We won. Now all he had to do was find his way home. Use a spacecraft that had no navigational computer, might not have a hyperdrive, to reach the nearest civilized star system. Probably Almania again. Coruscant was too much to hope for. In his mind's eye, Coruscant grew large, and he could simultaneously see it as a distant gleam in the sea of stars. Can you take us there? He knew the vehicle could. Before we grow old and die? The vehicle didn't have a precise understanding of human time, 
but Ben could feel that the trip would take hours or days, not lifetimes. So he sent the command. Gilader System Resort Satellite In the shadow where she was hiding, Alina saw two figures force their way in through the streams of actors trying to escape. They were Luke Skywalker and Mara Jade Skywalker, dressed in black jumpsuits with X-Wing pilots' accoutrements. And Alima nearly passed out from happiness. Luke was here, and would see Mara die. Leia was still coming. The universe was about to experience some much-needed balance. She stopped bouncing up and down long enough to find her comlink. She spoke into it. Activate and execute approach two. On the Duracrud, now floating with all the other arrival craft steered to the holding area by resort security personnel, the nav computer would be loading and implementing a set of simple maneuvers. The Duracrud would move to a position directly above the resort's dome, a few kilometers away, and then begin accelerating. What are you doing, dancer? The voice was cold, amused, familiar, and it froze Alima's guts. She tore her attention away from the fight, where Jason was coping with an ever-growing number of security agents, and looked to the right. The dark-skinned woman who had addressed her did not look familiar, except for her build and her green eyes. Lumia, she said, I asked you a question. Alima gave her a one-shouldered shrug. We are here to kill Mara Jade Skywalker, who is here, and Han Solo, who is coming. And you? I was about to dive in and help Jason. Do not do that. Alima shook her head vehemently. If you rescue him, Luke and Mara will leave, and Leia and Han will not come. They must be here. Lumia considered. Then let's jump in together. Our being here will keep the Skywalkers and Solos from leaving. Don't you think? We do. Lumia reached down and tore a long gap in her gown freeing her legs to maneuver. She unwrapped the decorative scarf she wore as a belt, revealing the light whip beneath it, and rewrapped the scarf around her lower face and scalp, giving her the aspect of Lumia so familiar to Alima and others. Then she drew her light whip. Ready? Alima brought her lightsaber up. We are... She was happier than she had been in a long, long time. Luke and Mara made their approach a merciful one. They landed in the midst of the thickest group of security officers. Luke's lightsaber flashed in a circle, severing five or six blaster barrels, and Mara gestured with the force to sweep aside half a dozen agents. Luke deflected a blaster shot from an opportunistic Corsac woman, Let's go, Jason. Your ride's waiting. Jason struck, cutting a Bothan shooter in two. I don't need your help. Then he looked past Luke, and his expression hardened still more. Oh, no. Luke glanced back that way. Han and Leia were entering the main hall at a dead run. And your other ride is here. Then he heard Mara's warning hiss, more through the force than with his ears, and when he turned back again, Lumia stood before him. As Han and Leia approached, the nature of the battle before them changed in an instant. Abruptly, Luke was drawing and igniting his second lightsaber, the half-length Shoto, and using his primary lightsaber to deflect a weapon that looked oddly like Lumia's light whip. Han squinted. The wielder was Lumia, though her skin was dark. He raised his blaster and fired. 
but Lumia must have been aware of him. She simply twisted aside, and the bolt caromed off the floor, then passed through the chest of the six-meter hologram of an admiral that dominated the center of the room. Mara, nearly surrounded by security agents, was batting their blaster fire back at them with her own lightsaber. Leia angled away from her, toward Luke, and then let out a surprised cry as a low table slid into her path, too suddenly for her to vault or sidestep. She tripped, but came up on her feet and lit her lightsaber. She stopped abruptly and stared to the left. Han followed her gaze, to see Alima Rar emerging from wall-side shadows, an odd smile on her lips, her lit lightsaber in her hand. Mine, Leia said, and leapt forward. Han ignored her. He fired at the Twi'lek, but Alima casually caught the bolt with her lightsaber, then began spinning her blade in a defensive pattern as Leia reached her. I guess this settles the question of whether you're dead or not, Luke said. He caught another crack of the light whip on his long blade, darted in close, slashed at Lumia with the Shoto. But with an exertion through the force, she lifted a severed human head into the path of the blow, and Luke's attack sent the head spinning through the air. It landed on a table stacked with food. Of course, Lumia said. I thought you knew. I am dead. I have been for decades. Then lie down and let us throw dirt on top of you. With a similar telekinetic exertion, Luke whipped the tablecloth from beneath all the platters and hurled it at Lumia. It swept upon her from behind, but she cracked her whip backward, cutting the tablecloth in two, then continued the maneuver into a forward stroke. Luke deflected separate light whip tendrils with his two blades. You really do hate me, don't you? Lumia asked. You've given me plenty of reasons to, but no, I don't reciprocate your hate. Luke leapt over another sweep of tendrils, coming down atop a chair and leaping free of it as Lumia's follow-up attack disintegrated it. He landed lightly, poised. I don't hate. She lowered her whip. I'm sorry you think that of me. I haven't hated for... a very long time. Yes, I've tried to kill you, but that was professional, not personal. Luke held up his own weapon long enough to deflect a stray blaster bolt, a security agent attack that merely strayed too near him, then lowered the lightsaber, matching Lumia's action. You don't hate. Somehow I don't believe that. We belong to rival schools, Luke. That's all. Shall I prove it? Sure. Lumia deactivated her light whip and wrapped it around her waist. She gestured, palms up. Kill me now, if you want. He took a step forward. I don't want. But you're a never-ending threat to me and my family. Then take your shot. But first, for old time's sake, take my hand. She extended her right hand, palms still upward. A gesture of peace. Luke gave her an exasperated look. I can't believe you'd stoop to such a childish tactic. No tactic, Luke. Listen to my voice. Listen to my feelings. I'm not offering you poisoned fingers or force lightning. Just a touch. Her voice became more sad. If I'd wanted to hurt you tonight... I would have killed your nephew instead of letting him flee. Flee? 
careful to keep Lumia in his peripheral vision, Luke scanned the chamber. Most of the actors had disappeared. Mara was dealing with an ever-decreasing number of security agents. Leia was backing Alima up across the main hall, with Han following, taking pot shots to provide support to his wife. The giant hologram was gone. And so was Jason. He left us. And I could have attacked you just now. Luke returned his attention to Lumia. He felt no danger through the Force. None at all. From her there was only peaceful intent. He extinguished his lightsabers and hung them from his belt, then reached out with his left hand, his flesh hand. His fingers grazed hers, and then her hand closed on his. And nothing happened. Sweetheart? Busy. Leia swung an almost ceaseless flurry of blows at Alima. But the Twi'lek Jedi continued backing away, fighting a defensive action, never trying to attack. It was unlike her. Jason's run off. Han's words created a tight knot in Leia's chest. She had risked her life and Han his to save their son, and Jason had just left them behind. But she couldn't dwell on that. Alima was still a dangerous foe. Leia had to win here. Sweetheart? Now what? Incoming. Leia backflipped away from her enemy, and in mid-rotation saw that the view of Galadar 8 was partially blocked. The same ship she'd seen Alima disappear in only days before was headed straight for them. As she landed, she saw that Alima had switched off her lightsaber and was donning a close-fitting flexible helmet with a transparent faceplate. An emergency decompression helmet. Alima smiled at her. Luke felt the danger coming, but it was not coming from Lumia. He turned away and looked up just in time to see the YV-666 contact the top of the dome. The dome, ancient Transpera steel, did not shatter. It caved in, crumpling like a thin-walled metal can. The great mass of the ship hurtled to crash into the floor of the main hall, and a ripple like a tidal wave coursed through the floor. Luke leapt toward the exit. Mara was ahead of him. He saw the ripple effect from the impact bounce bodies up off the flooring, and the cargo ship, its speed hardly checked, continued plowing into the floor, punching a ragged hole through the axis of the space station. Beyond it, he thought he saw the relit tendrils of Lumia's whip lashing. Against what? An enemy? A wall? To provide her with an escape path? Suddenly the whip was obscured by an expanding cloud of debris kicked up by the YV-666's impact. The station's atmosphere, with two huge holes to choose from, began fleeing into space, tugging at Luke as it went. Of those fleeing toward the exit, Leia was in the rear, Han just ahead of her. The ripple shock from the floor impact behind them took Han off his feet. Nimble and determined, he was up again before Leia even reached him. Up, but moving slowly. Increasingly, to Leia's eyes, Han's feet seemed not to want to find purchase as he ran. Nor did hers. It wasn't from the atmosphere escaping. The station's artificial gravity had to have experienced a complete failure. As her ears popped and pain grew in her head and eyes, Leia knew that there was no way they could reach the exit. No way they both could reach it. She reached out through the force and shoved Han's back, propelling him forward through the door Luke and Mara had just reached. Leia took three more steps, but now, though her legs kept thrashing, she could make no headway at all. Her feet lifted clear of the floor, 
She had no forward momentum, no way to reach safety. She closed her eyes, determined to be peaceful in her last moments. Something wrapped around her ankle. She looked down. Attached to her leg was a line with a tiny hook and grapnel. Luke's piece of stupid, preposterous farm boy equipment, which he'd carried off and on since before she'd met him. He was at the far end of the line, braced against the door, hauling with all his strength. And as Leia watched, Han joined him. In moments, they had dragged her through the door and into the shuttle access bay, where they'd arrived minutes before. Han sealed the door. Dimly, in the reduced atmospheric pressure, she could hear a warning siren wailing. Leia lay on the floor, panting. Thanks, she said. What's family for? Luke asked. Hey, can Mara and I get a lift around to the other side of this station? Our stealth exes are over there. Galatter System In the shuttle he'd seized, Jason hurtled toward the Anakin Solo, broadcasting his identity as he went, demanding updates on the battle. He could see how it was progressing. The Confederation ships had been ready for the Alliance Task Force, but they hadn't been ready for the Alliance vessels to muscle their way through the mine grid, throwing off time estimates and ruining carefully planned flanking maneuvers. What had resulted was a slugging match, and to his eyes, things were even. He needed more than his eyes. Even when he got data from the Anakin Solo, it was only as good as the ship's instruments could provide, as good as harried, overburdened officers could analyze. He saw a Bothan assault cruiser lose power to its port side batteries. Instantaneous response on the part of the Alliance starfighter squadrons could have exploited the situation, which could have resulted in the cruiser's destruction. It didn't happen. He saw starfighter squadrons circling, looking for an enemy, wasting precious minutes until the galactic voyager could direct them to a worthwhile target. He saw an Alliance frigate yield the field because its commander obviously felt the vessel was crippled, unaware that its Corellian corvette counterpart was even more badly damaged. He cursed and pounded on the arms of his pilot's seat. Finally, he found an opportunity to board Anakin Solo. Not long after, Lumia reached him on his private comlink channel, reporting that she too had seized a vehicle, someone's private transport, little more than an airspeeder fitted with improved engines and an atmospheric containment hull, and needed landing authorization for the Anakin Solo. Grudgingly, for he knew she would talk to him, and he didn't wish to talk to anyone, he provided her the code she needed. In the final analysis, the Battle of Galater Eight was a draw, with both sides retiring the field after suffering moderate losses. The Confederation trumpeted it as a clear victory for Tur Fenner, its cool-headed new Supreme Commander. The Alliance noted the fact that, even with superior odds and the advantage of a treacherous ambush, the Confederation had accomplished nothing. En route to Coruscant, Galactic Voyager Luke lay on the small sofa in the cramped quarters he and Mara had been assigned, looking at the ceiling. It was a neutral light blue, featureless but for glow-rod banks around the edges, and the peaceful color helped soothe his thoughts. They needed soothing. You're very quiet, Mara said. She occupied the chamber's one chair. Still nothing new about Ben. Luke offered a slight frown. And Jason's actions worry me. Running out on Han and Leia, you mean? He nodded. They should. I think he's getting even worse. Mara returned her attention to her data pad. Ben's continued absence and Jason's actions did weigh heavily on Luke. But lying to Mara added to the burden he felt. 
and he hoped she would not detect those lies through their force bond. Luke didn't consider Jason's actions to represent cowardice, but Jason clearly considered the danger his parents experienced to be of less importance than his need to get to the major scene of the G.A. Confederation battle. And that was a cold-hearted choice for Jason to have made. But it was not what weighed on Luke's mind right now. Luke also had to ponder the meaning of Lumia's words to him, the gentleness with which she'd reached out to him. She hadn't been hostile or vengeful. His instincts about people, his skill with sifting truth from lies through use of the Force, told him so. Then he felt something new. He sat up, and Mara gave him a close look. What? He smiled for the first time since they'd left the Galater system. I can feel Ben, he said. Anakin Solo Jason sat in his private office. The glow rods were dimmed, and the only illumination came from the corkscrewing streaks of hyperspace light outside his viewport. Whisper quiet, the hidden panel in the corner of his office retracted and opened. Lumia entered, her face devoid of makeup, but wrapped against prying eyes. I can feel your anger all the way to my quarters, she said. Are you admonishing or approving? I approve of the anger, of course. It strengthens you, and you need strength. But if I can feel it... There are no other Jedi aboard Anakin Solo. Prove it, and while you're at it... Prove that there are no nascent Jedi, no Force sensitives of any sort. Jason sighed. He did not relinquish his anger, but he did concentrate on diminishing his own presence in the Force. Good. Lumia approached and seated herself opposite him. Jason, this was not a disaster. I was made to look like an idiot. I planned the mission. I bought into the trap. As did everyone, including Admiral Neothel, the mission commander. When the full report of the battle reaches the Holonews, it will be cast as a dramatic Galactic Alliance success. The forces of good beating back a treacherous ambush all with negligible losses, and you will probably find your popularity has grown. As for blame behind the closed doors of government, your information was independently verified, wasn't it? Yes. All right, then. I was made to feel like an idiot. Ah. There I cannot reassure you. He shot her a glare, but said nothing. Would you like to avoid this in the future? To be matchless, undefeatable in strategic engagements? No one is undefeatable. Perhaps not. But the commander who knows exactly where all the battlefield's forces are who does not need to depend solely on limited censors and fallible analysts, will be defeated much less often. You're talking about battle meditation. You've mentioned it before. No. Battle meditation is something many very accomplished Force users, Jedi and Sith, can do. Consider battle meditation to be the learner. The technique I'm talking about is the master. It is the capacity to sense, to coordinate, just by the power of the mind and the will. This is the ability 
that comes with the assumption of the title of Master of the Sith. He continued to stare at her. You aren't the master, so you can't teach it to me. I'm not, but I can. A blind woman who was once sighted can still experience colors in her memory. I learned everything there was to learn about this power. I can just never wield it. Lumia stared down at her limbs. Her expression did not suggest that she felt betrayed by them, by their robotic nature, only that they were a bit disappointing. Jason considered it. Am I ready? In all other ways, yes. But you have to make the sacrifice of love, and then you must take your Sith name to reforge yourself. Who must I sacrifice? The question put a chill through him. If she were to say, the one you love most, he would be unable to do it. He would never sacrifice Alana. He would never sacrifice Tenel Ka. One you love... One who will leave a void in your heart. Anyone? Anyone. Jason stared off into the distance. Then it will be my father. Or mother. Or both. Or perhaps not. Jason stared at her, curious. Do you have a sudden affection for them I should know about? Lumia laughed. No. I have forgiven Leia for what she has done to me. And Han was never that much of a nuisance. But it may be that you can't sacrifice your parents. Why? You must sacrifice one you love. Are you certain you still love them? Search your feelings. Jason thought, and then reluctantly abandoned thinking to open himself to his emotions. He let images of Han and Leia float in his mind's eye. He saw them as they had been when he was a toddler, as a teenager, as a man. He saw them in the ever-changing light of his own experiences, as he came to realize that they could not be ordinary parents, as he discovered that they were willing to abandon him and his siblings to surrogate parents for weeks or months at a time, as he learned that they had to. He felt again the wash of pain that all those separations had caused, that all those reunions had never healed. All he could feel was pain and anger. Pain they had caused, anger he bore against them. But had the anger replaced the love, or did anger simply mask it? As hard as he sought an answer, he could not find one. Lumia whispered in his ear. You don't know, because you have trained yourself to feel too little, to analyze too much. That is not the Sith way. You must do both. Jason shook his head. Emotion weakens you. Yet anger, an emotion, gives you strength. Emotion doesn't weaken you, Jason. It scares you. You specifically. He stared at her, suddenly furious. Nothing scares me. 
he could not see her face beneath her scarf, but he knew that she was smiling. Liar, she said. Before he could formulate an answer, she rose and returned to the secret passage. I was wrong, she said. You're not quite ready. You don't know yourself as well as you must. Find yourself, Jason. Then make your sacrifice and take your Sith name. I'll be waiting. She departed, and the door slid closed behind her. Jason stared after her, feeling ill. Ill that he had a weakness, that Lumia had detected it, that he was confused. And now he could not even begin the process of choosing his sacrifice until he knew where his heart lay, until he knew whether he loved his parents. In one way, though, both answers to that question were similar. If he loved them, he should sacrifice one and kill the other to prevent retaliation. If he did not love them, he should consider eliminating them and the potential trouble they represented. Either way, both he and the galaxy would be better off without them. Goodbye, Mom, he said. Goodbye, Dad. End of Star Wars Legacy of the Force, Exile, Book 4, by Aaron Alston.